Rise of a Merchant Prince, Serpent War Saga, Volume 2, by Raymond E. Feist. Copyright 1995 by Raymond E. Feist. Read by Roy Avers. This book contains 406 pages. Book 2, Ruse Tale. Well, how so ever got, in England makes lords of mechanics gentlemen of rakes. Antiquity and birth are needless here. Tis impudence and money makes appear. Daniel Defoe, The True-Born Englishman, Part 1. Prologue. Demonia. The soul screamed. The demon turned, and as its gaping maw was set in a permanent grin, the only hint of its increased delight was a slight widening of its eyes, black orbs resembling those of a shark, flat and lifeless. It studied the jar it held for a moment, its only possession. This soul was especially active, and the demon had been fortunate to find it and keep it. Placing the jar under its chin, the demon closed its eyes and felt the energy flow into it from the jar. The creature's emotional makeup knew nothing that could be called happiness, only lessened states of fear or anger. But the surge of feeling within was as close to happiness as the creature could know. Each time the soul within the jar struggled, the energy created filled the little demon's mind with new ideas. As if suddenly concerned its toy would be taken from it by one of its more powerful brethren, the demon glanced around. The hall was one of many in the grand palace of Sibul, capital of the now-destroyed Sa'awar race. Then the demon remembered. Destroyed, save those who had fled through a magic gate. It felt its anger return, and then the emotion quickly fled. As a minor demon, it was not intelligent, only cunning. And it didn't fully understand why the escape of a small part of this nearly obliterated race was important. But it was, for the demon lords were even now gathered upon the plains to the east of the city of Sibul, inspecting the site of the now closed rift through which the Sa'awar survivors had fled. The lords of the fifth circle had attempted once to open the portal, managing to keep it open long enough to slip a tiny demon through before it collapsed upon itself, sealing the rift between the two realms and stranding the tiny demon on the other side of the rift. There was much consultation among the greater demons on reopening that rift and gaining entrance to this new realm. The demon wandered the halls, oblivious to the ravages around it. Tapestries that had taken a generation to weave were torn from the walls and trodden upon, soiled by dirt and blood. The demon cracked a sour rib bone underfoot and absently kicked it aside. At last it came to its secret room the one it had claimed as its own while the host of the Fifth Circle resided on this cold planet. Leaving the demon realm was a terrible experience, thought the young demon. This had been the demon's first journey to this realm, and it wasn't sure it cared much for the pain of transition. The feasting had been glorious. Never had it known such a wealth of food, even though it was limited to scraps from the feasting pits thrown out by the mightiest of the host as they fed. But scraps or not, the demon had devoured much and had grown, and that was creating problems for itself. It sat down, attempting to find a comfortable position as its body changed. The feasting had continued for nearly a year, and many of the lesser demons had grown. This particular demon had grown faster than most, though it still hadn't matured enough to have developed significant intelligence or a sexual identity. Looking down at the plaything, the demon laughed, a silent gaping of jaws and sucking of wind. The mortal eye could not behold the thing within the jar. The demon, who didn't have a name yet, had been most fortunate to snare this particular soul. A great demon captain, almost a lord, had fallen to mighty magic even as the great Dugor had crushed and eaten the leader of the Sa'awara. One of the Sa'awar magic users, a powerful one, had destroyed the demon captain, but at the cost of his own life. The little demon might not be intelligent, but it was quick, and without hesitation it had seized the fleeing soul force of the dead magic user. 
The demon inspected the device again, the soul jar, and poked at it. The magic soul within rewarded it by thrashing, if something without a body could be said to thrash. The demon shifted its weight. It knew it was getting more powerful, but the nearly non-stop feeding was at an end. The last of the Sahar were dead and devoured, and now the demon host was depending on lesser animals for food, animals with negligent soul force. There were some client races who would breed children, some of which would go to the feasting pit, but that meant slow growth in this realm. Its body would continue to mature, but not significantly until the next realm had been entered. Cold, the demon thought, as it glanced around the large room, ignorant of its original use, a bedroom for one of the Sa'awar leader's many wives. The native realm was one of the wild energies and pulsing heat, where the demons of the fifth circle grew like wild things, devouring one another until strong enough to escape and serve the demon king and his lords and captains. This demon had but vague recollections of its own beginning, remembering only anger and fear, and an occasional moment of pleasure as it devoured something. The demon settled down on the floor. With a changing body, it couldn't seem to find a comfortable position. Its back itched, and with certainty it knew wings would grow there soon, tiny at first, then growing larger as it rose in power. The demon was clever enough to know it would have to fight to gain rank, so it had better rest. It had been lucky so far, as the critical periods in its growth had come during the war on this world, and most of the host were too occupied with devouring the inhabitants of this world to contest in their own ranks. Others were now fighting, and the losers would add strength to the winners as they were devoured. Any demon without enough rank was a fair target for another, save when a lord or captain demanded obedience. It was simply the way of this race, and each who fell was considered unworthy of a second thought. This demon considered that there must be a better way to gain more strength than an open challenge and outright attack. But it couldn't think of what it could be. Glancing around what had once been a regal and richly appointed dwelling, the demon closed its eyes, but not before glancing one last time at the soul jar. Feeding might cease a while, and with it physical growth, but it had learned during the war that physical growth, while impressive, wasn't as important as knowing things. The contents of the soul jar were a being rich in knowledge, and this little demon meant to have that knowledge. The demon placed the jar against its forehead and mentally prodded the soul, causing more thrashing, and the energy that resulted flowed into the demon. Powerful. Like a drug to a mortal, the sensation was among the most glorious known to demon kind. The demon felt something new in its experience. Satisfaction. Soon it would be smarter, know things, and then it would be able to use more than animal cunning to gain rank and a position of power. And when the demon lords finally discovered a way to open fully the gate that had been sealed behind the fleeing Sa'awa, then the demon host of the fifth circle would follow, and then there would be ample opportunity to feed upon the Sa'awa and upon whatever other intelligent, soul-bearing creatures lived upon the world of Mitkemia. One. Return. A ship swept into the harbor. Black and dangerous, it moved like a dark hunter bearing down on its prey. Three tall masts, majestic under full sail, propelled the warship into the harbor of a great city as other ships gave way. Although she looked like a great pirate vessel from the distant Sunset Islands, her foremast flew the royal ensign, and all who saw the ship knew that the king's brother was returning home. High aloft that ship, a young man worked quickly, reefing the mizzen topsail. Rue paused a moment as he tied the final reef point and looked across the harbor at the city of Crondor. The prince's city spread out along the docks, rose on hills to the south, and spread out of sight to the north. The panorama was impressive as the ship sped in from the sea. The young man, eighteen years of age at the next Midsummer's Festival, had thought on numerous occasions over the past year and more that he would never see the city again. Yet here he was finishing up his watch atop the mizzenmast of the Freeport Ranger. 
a ship under the command of Admiral Nicholas, brother to the king of the kingdom of the Isles and uncle to the prince of Crondor. Crondor was the second most important city in the kingdom of the Isles, the capital of the western realm and seat of power for the prince of Crondor, heir to the throne of the Isles. Rue could see the multitude of small buildings scattered across the hills surrounding the harbor, the vista dominated by the prince's palace, which sat atop a steep hill hard against the water. The majesty of the palace was in stark contrast to the rude buildings that lined the waterfront close by, warehouses and chandlers' shops, sail and rope makers, carpenters and sailors' inns. Second only to the poor quarter as a haven for thugs and thieves, the waterfront was thrown by the proximity of the palace into an even more seedy aspect. Yet Rue was pleased to see Crondor, for now he was a free man. He glanced one last time at his work, ensuring that the sail was properly reefed, and moved quickly along the foot rope with a sure balance learned while crossing treacherous seas for nearly two years. Rue considered the oddity of facing his third spring in a row without a winter. The topsy-turvy seasons of the land on the other side of the world had contrived to provide Rue and his boyhood friend Eric with such a situation, and Rue found the notion both amusing and oddly disquieting. He shinnied down a sheet, reaching the top of the mizzenmast ratlin. Rue didn't particularly like top work, but as one of the smaller and more nimble men in the crew, he was often told to go aloft and unfurl or reef the royals and gallants. He scampered down the ratlin and landed lightly on the deck. Eric von Darkmoor, Rue's only friend as a boy, finished his task of tying off a yard brace to a cleat, then hurried to the rail as they sped past other ships in the harbor. A full two heads taller and twice the bulk of his friend, Eric made with Rue as unlikely a pair as any two boys could have been. While Eric was stronger than any boy in their hometown of Ravensburg, Rue was among the smallest. While Eric would never be called handsome, he wore an open and friendly expression that others found likable. Rue had no illusions about his own appearance. He was homely by any standards, with a pinched face, eyes that were narrowed and darting around as if constantly looking for threats, and a nearly permanent expression that could only be called furtive. But on those rare occasions when he smiled, or laughed, a warmth was revealed that made him far from unattractive. It was that roguish humor and willingness to brave trouble that had attracted Eric to Rue when they were children. Eric pointed, and Rue nodded at those ships moving away from their own as the Freeport Ranger was given right of way to the royal docks below the palace. One of the older sailors laughed, and Rue turned to ask, What? French Nicky's going to irritate the harbor master again. Eric, his hair almost bleached white by the sun, looked at the sailor, who had blue eyes that stood out in stark contrast to his sunburned face. What do you mean? The sailor pointed. There's the harbor master's launch. Rue looked to where the man pointed. He's not slowing to pick up a pilot. The sailor laughed. The admiral is his teacher's student. Old Admiral Trask used to do the same thing, but he'd at least allow the pilot up on deck so he could personally irritate him by refusing to take a tow into the dock. Admiral Nicky's the king's brother, so he doesn't even bother with that formality. Rue and Eric glanced upward and saw that old sailors were standing by waiting to reef in the last sails on the admiral's command. Rue then looked to the poop deck and saw Nicholas, formerly Prince of Crondor and presently Admiral of the King's Fleet in the West, give the signal. Instantly, the old hands pulled up the heavy canvas and tied off. Within seconds, Rue and the others on the deck could feel the ship's speed begin to fall off as they neared the royal docks located below the royal palace of the prince. The ranger's motion continued to drop off, but to Rue it felt as if they were still moving into the docks too fast. The old sailor spoke as if reading his mind. We're pushing a lot of water into the quay, and that'll push back as we come alongside the docks, slowing us down to almost a full stop, though she'll make the cleats groan a bit. He made ready to throw a line to those waiting on the dock ahead. Land a hand! Rue and Eric each grabbed another line and waited for the command. When Nicholas shouted, Cast away! Rue threw to a man on the dockside, who caught the rope expertly and quickly made it fast to a large iron cleat. As the old sailor said, when the line went taut, the iron cleat seemed to groan as the wooden docks were flexed. But the bow wake returned from the stone quay, and the huge ship seemed to settle in with a single rocking motion, as if it sighed in relief that it was good to be home. Eric turned to Rue. Wonder what the harbor master will say to the admiral. Rue glanced aft as the admiral made his way to the main deck, 
and considered the question. The first time Rue had seen the man had been at Eric's and Rue's trial for the murder of Eric's half-brother, Stefan. The second time he had seen him had been when the survivors of the mercenary company to which Rue and Eric belonged had been rescued from a fishing smack outside the harbor of the city of Maharta. Having served under the admiral on the voyage homeward, Rue's opinion was, He'll probably say nothing, go home and get drunk. Eric laughed. He also knew that Nicholas was a man of calm authority, who could embarrass a subordinate to the point of tears with a stare, and no word spoken, a trait he shared with Callis, the captain of Rue and Eric's company, the Crimson Eagles. Of the original company, numbering in the hundreds, fewer than fifty men survived. The six who had fled with Callas and some stragglers who had found their way to the city of the Serpent River before the Freeport Ranger had departed for Crondor. Nicholas's other ship, Trenchard's Revenge, had remained in the harbor at the city of the Serpent River for an extra month in case more men from Callas's troop found their way there. Any who were not there when she weighed anchor would be considered to be dead. The gangplank was run out, and Rue and Eric watched as Nicholas and Callas were the first to disembark. On the dock waited Patrick, Prince of Crondor, his uncle Prince Erland, nephew and brother respectively to Nicholas, and other members of the royal court of Crondor. Eric said, Not much of a show, is it? Rue could only nod. A lot of men had died to bring back the information Nicholas carried to his nephew, the prince, and from what Rue knew, it was scant information at best. He turned his attention to the royal family. Nicholas, formerly Prince of Crondor until his nephew had come from the capital of the Kingdom of the Isles to assume the office, looked nothing like his brother. Erlin's hair was mostly gray, but there was enough red remaining to reveal its original hue. Nicholas, likewise going gray, was a man of dark hair and intense features. Patrick, the new Prince of Crondor, was somewhere between his two uncles in appearance, darker of skin than both, but his hair was a middle brown in color. He seemed to have something of Erlen's powerful build and Nicholas's intensity. No, said Rue. You're right. Not much by way of ceremony. Eric nodded. Well, then again, by now, they all know there's not much glory in any of this. The prince and his uncle are probably both anxious to hear what news Callus and Nicholas have. Rue sighed agreement. None of it good. It's all bloody business and it's going to get worse. A friendly slap to the back caused both Rue and Eric to turn. Robert de Longville stood behind the two young men, grinning in a way that up until recently made both men expect the worst. But this time they knew he was merely showing the more affable side of his nature. He kept his receding hair cropped close to his skull, and he needed a shave. Where to, lads? Rue jingled a purse of gold tucked into his tunic. I think a good glass of ale, the tender touch of a bad woman, and then I'll worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow. Eric shrugged. I've been thinking, and I want to take up your offer, Sergeant. Good, said de Longville, Sergeant of Calus's company. He had offered Eric a place in the army, but in a special command being formed by Callus, Prince Nicholas's mysterious and not quite human ally. Come by Lord James's office at midday tomorrow. I'll leave word at the palace gate you're to be admitted. Rue studied the men on the dock. Our prince is an impressive-looking man, Eric said. I know what you mean. He and his father both look the sort who have been in some serious places. The Longville said, Never let their rank fool you, lads. Erland and our king and their sons after them spent their time along the northern borders fighting goblins on the Brotherhood of the Dark Path. He used the common name for the Moradel the dark elves who lived on the far side of the mountains known as the Teeth of the World. I heard that the king got into some serious business down in Kesh once, a run-in with slavers or some such thing. Whatever it was, he came out of it with a good opinion of the common man, for a king. We haven't had a court-bred king since King Roderick, before old King Liam took the throne, and that was before I was born. These are tough men spent some time soldiering, and it'll take a few more generations before any in this family becomes soft. The captain will see to that. There was something in his voice that hinted at strong emotions. Rue glanced at the sergeant and tried to glean what it was, but the Longville's expression had returned to a broad grin. What are you thinking? asked Eric of Rue, his best friend since childhood. Rue said, Just how funny families can be. He pointed to the group on the dock listening carefully to Nicholas. Eric said, Notice our captain. 
Blue nodded. He knew Eric meant callous. The elf-like man stood off to one side with just enough distance between himself and the others to be apart, yet close enough to answer questions when asked. Robert de Longville said, He's been my friend for twenty years. He found me serving with Daniel Trovel, Lord Highcastle, and dragged me away from the border wars to go to the strangest places a man can imagine. I've been with him longer than any man in his company, eaten cold rations with him, slept beside him, watched men die in his arms, even had him carry me for two days after the fall of Hamsa. But I can't say I know the man. Eric asked, Is it true he's part elf? De Longville rubbed his chin. I can't say I know the truth of that. He told me his father came from Crydy originally. A kitchen boy, he claims. He doesn't talk about his past much. Mostly, he plans for the future and takes barracks rats like you two and turns them into soldiers. But it's worthwhile. I wasn't much more than a barracks rat myself when he found me. Worked up from that to my grand station today. He said the last with an even broader grin, as if he were nothing more than a common sergeant and that remarked a joke. But both Eric and Rue had been told he carried high court rank in addition to his military rank. So I never asked too many personal questions. He's very much what you might call a right-now sort of fellow. De Longville's voice lowered as if Callus might somehow overhear from down on the dock and his expression turned serious. He does have those pointy ears. Still, I never heard of any such being, half man, half elf. Yet he can do things no other man I know can do. He grinned again as he said, but he's saved all our hides more times than I can count, so who's to care what his line is? Your station at birth means nothing. A man can't change that. What's important is how you live. He slapped both young men on the shoulder. You were worthless dog meat when I found you, fit only for starving crows. But look at you now. Eric and Rue exchanged looks, then laughed. Both were wearing the same clothing they had worn when escaping the destruction of the city of Maharta, oft-patched, stained beyond cleaning, reducing both men to the appearance of common street thugs. Rue said, We're two men in need of some fresh clothing. Save Eric's boots, we look the part of rag pickers. Eric glanced down and said, And these need mending. The boots were all he had left from the Baron of Darkmoor's legacy, a grudging admission to Eric of his paternity, along with not denying Eric the right to call himself Von Darkmoor. The boots were riding boots, but Eric had walked enough to wear the heels down to nearly nothing, and the leather was weather-beaten and cracked. Shopi and Isalani from the Empire of Great Kesh came up on the deck from below, carrying his own travel bag. Behind him came Nacor, also an Isalani, and a man Shopi had decided was destined to be his master. He appeared old, but moved with a spry step and quickness that both Eric and Rue knew well. He had instructed them in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and Rue and Eric knew that the odd little man, as well as Chopi, was as dangerous unarmed as most men were with weapons. Rue was convinced he had never seen Nacor move as fast as possible and wasn't sure he would welcome such a demonstration. Rue was a gifted student of the open-handed school of fighting practiced in the Isalani provinces of Kesh, only surpassed by Chopi and Nacor in Callus's company, but he knew either man could easily defeat him with a quick killing blow. I am not going to have you trailing around behind me, boy, insisted the bandy-legged Nacor, yelling over his shoulder. I haven't been to a city in nearly twenty years that wasn't being burned to the ground or overrun by soldiers or otherwise unpleasant in some fashion, and I intend to enjoy myself a while. Then I'm going back to Sorcerer's Isle. Chopi, a head taller than Nacor, and in possession of a full head of dark hair, otherwise looked like a much younger version of the wiry little man. He said, Whatever you say, master. Don't call me master, insisted Nacor, putting his own travel bag over his shoulder. Moving to the rail, he said, Eric, Rue, where are you going? To get a drink, a whore, and new clothing, in that order, said Rue. Then I'm going home to see my mother and friends, said Eric. What about you? asked Rue. I'm going with you, Nacor said, hoisting his bag, until the going home part. Then I shall hire a boat to take me to Sorcerer's Isle. He looked straight down the gangway, ignoring the younger countryman a step behind. Eric glanced at Chopi and said, We've got to go below and get our kits. Then we'll join you on the dock. 
Rue was a step ahead of his friend as they hurried below, bade farewell to the sailors who had become friends, and found Jado Shotty, another of their company of desperate men, just finishing gathering up his few possessions. What are you going to do? asked Rue as he quickly grabbed his small kit. A drink, I'm thinking. Join us, said Eric. I think I will, as soon as I tell Mr. Robert de Longbarrel, the little swine, that I'm taking up his offer of becoming his corporal. Eric blinked. Corporal? He offered me the position. Before the two men could begin arguing, Rue said, From what he said, he's going to need more than one. The two large men exchanged glances, then both laughed. Chato's face settled into a grin, teeth dramatically white against his ebony skin, an expression so happy that it always made Rue smile in response. Like the other desperate men, Jado had been a killer and lifelong criminal, but in the brotherhood of Callus's company, he had found men for whom he was willing to die and who would die for him. Rue hated to admit it, as one who flattered himself for being completely selfish, but he loved the survivors of that company almost as much as he loved Eric. Rough men all, dangerous by any standards, they had passed through a bloody trial together, and each knew he could depend on the others. Rue thought about those lost on the journey. Bigo, the large, laughing thug with a strange streak of piety running through him. Jerome Handy, a giant of a man with a violent temper who could tell a tale like an actor and make shadow play on the wall that came alive. Billy Goodwin, an otherwise gentle youth with a violent temper who had been cut down in a pointless accident before ever understanding anything of life. And Luis de Savona the Rhodesian cutthroat whose wit was as sharp as his dagger, who knew both court intrigue and dark alley brawls, a man of temper and strange loyalties. Rue tied his bundle and turned to see both Eric and Jado watching him. What is it? You were lost there a moment, said Eric. I was thinking about Bigo and the others. Eric nodded. I understand. Maybe some of them will show up when Trenchard's revenge gets here ventured Chato. Rue said, that would be fine. Slinging his pack over his shoulder, he added, but Billy and Bigo won't. Eric nodded. He and Rue had watched Bigo die in Maharta, and Eric had seen Billy fall from his horse, cracking his head on a rock. The three men were silent as they climbed back on deck and hurried down the gangway to find Robert de Longville chatting with Nacor and Chopee. Hey now, you vile runt of a man! said Jado without ceremony to the man who, for nearly three years, had controlled his life. The Longville turned. Who are you talking to like that, you bailman scum? You, Bobby de Longville, Sergeant Sir, snapped back Jado, but Eric could easily see the mocking humor in both men's expressions. The panel had made him very aware of his companion's every mood, and he knew they were having fun with each other. And who are you calling scum? We men of the Vale are the best fighting men in the world, don't you know? And we are usually wiping our boots to clean them of something that resembles you. He sniffed loudly, bending forward as if to make sure the long bill was the source of the offending odor. Yes, very much like you. The long bill grabbed one of Jado's cheeks and pinched it as a mother does a child's, saying, You're so lovely, I should kiss you. Playfully slapping him on the face, he said, But not today. To the group, the Longville said, Where are you off to? Drinks, said Nacor with a grin. The Longville rolled his eyes heavenward. Well, don't kill anyone, he asked Jotto. You coming back? Jotto grinned. I don't know why, but yes. His own smile vanishing, the Longville said, You know exactly why. Instantly, all humor fled. Each man had seen exactly what the others had, and all knew that a terrible enemy gathered across the sea, and that no matter how much had been accomplished in recent months, the struggle had only just started. A decade or more might pass before the final confrontation with the armies gathered under the banner of the Emerald Queen, but eventually every man living in the kingdom would either stand and fight or die. After a moment's silence, de Longville waved them down the street. Get away with you. Don't have too much fun. As the men walked off, he called after, Eric, you and Jotto be back here tomorrow to get your papers. On the day after, you're deserters. And you know we hang deserters. That man, said Jotto, as they moved down the street in search of an inn, 
Always with them threats. He has an unnatural love of hanging, don't you know? Rue laughed, and the rest joined in, and the mood lightened as an inn seemed to appear by magic on the corner before them. Rue awoke, his head pounding and his mouth dry. The inside of his eyes felt as if someone had put sand behind the lids, and his breath smelled as if something had crawled into his mouth and died. He moved, and Eric let out a groan, so he moved the other way, only to find Jado groaning and pushing him away. With no other choice, he sat up and instantly wished he had remained asleep. He forced himself to keep whatever was in his stomach from coming up, and at last managed to focus his eyes. Oh, wonderful, he said, and instantly regretted talking. His own voice made his head hurt. They were in a cell, and unless Rue was mistaken, he knew exactly what cell. It was a long cell, open along one side to a hall, with floor-to-ceiling bars and a door with a heavy iron lock plate. Slightly above head height, opposite the bars, a long window, less than two feet in height, ran the length of the cell. He knew the cell was below ground level, as the window was only a foot or so above ground, giving a peculiar angle so those inside the cell could see the scaffold dominating the courtyard beyond. He was now in the death cell, beneath the Prince of Crondor's palace. He pushed Eric, and his friend groaned as if tortured. Rue shook him insistently, and at last Eric came awake. What? he said as he tried to focus his attention on his friend's face. Where are we? Back in the death cell. Eric looked instantly sober. He glanced around and saw Nacor curled up in the corner, snoring, while Cho P lay a short distance away. They shook the others awake and took stock. Several of them were splattered with dried blood, and they all nursed an assortment of bruises, scrapes, and cuts. What happened? croaked Rue, his voice sounding as if he'd eaten sand. Jado said, those Quiggin sailors, remember? Chopi and Nacor, who seemed of the company the least worse for wear, exchanged glances, and Nacor said, One of them tried to remove a young woman from your lap, Rue. Rue nodded, then wished he hadn't. I remember now. Chato said, I hit someone with a chair. Nacor said, Maybe we killed those Quiggins. Eric tried to stay on his feet by leaning against the wall, his knees shaking from his hangover, and said, It would be just the sort of black joke the gods make that, after all, we have been through. We end up back here waiting for the gallows again. Rue felt vaguely guilty, as he always did when he had drunk too much the night before. He was a slight man, so trying to keep up drink for drink with men the size of Jado and Eric was foolish, even though Eric didn't have much of a head for drink. If I killed someone, you'd think I'd remember, Rue observed. Well, what are we doing back here in the death cell, man? Asked Jado from where he sat in the corner, obviously disturbed at their circumstances. I didn't sail around the world and back again so Bobby DeLongville could finally hang me. As they were attempting to gather their wits, the door to the hall was yanked open, clanging into the hall hard enough to make every man visibly wince. DeLongville walked into view and shouted, On your feet, you swine! Without thought, everyone except Nacor leaped to his feet, and each man groaned an instant later. Jado Shotty turned his head and vomited into the chamber pot, then spat. The others stood on unsteady feet, Eric having to grip the bars of the cell to keep himself upright. With a grin, the Longville said, What a lovely bunch you are! Nacor asked, what are we doing back here, Sergeant? The Longville moved to the cell door and pulled it open, showing it hadn't been locked, and said, We couldn't think of anywhere else to put you conveniently. Did you know it took the better part of a full watch of the city guard and a squad of the palace guards to arrest you? He beamed like a proud father. Quite a brawl. And you had the good sense not to kill anyone. Though you did damage quite a few. With a wave, De Longville indicated they should follow him. Prince Patrick and his uncles felt it was better to keep you locked close by for the rest of the night, he said as he led them from the cell. Rue glanced around and remembered the last time he had seen these passages, as he was being led to the mock hanging that had set his feet upon a path he never could have imagined before leaving his birthplace. The first journey he had made along here was almost lost on him. So far had his mind retreated into terror then. 
Now he could barely focus because of the abuses of the night before. He and Eric had fled their lifelong home in Ravensburg after killing Eric's half-brother, Sehan, then Baron of Dartmoor. Had they stayed and faced trial, they might have convinced a judge it was self-defense, but their flight counted heavily against them, and they had been sentenced to die. They reached the steps that led up toward the yard where the gallows stood, but this time they passed them by. The Longville, the man who had held their lives in his hand from the moment they had fallen to the hard wooden floor of the gallows until they had departed ship the day before, said, You're a scruffy bunch, so I think we should clean you up a bit before your audience. Audience? asked Eric, still showing signs of damage from the night before. One of the strongest men Rue had ever known, uncontestedly the strongest boy in Ravensburg, Eric had pitched a guardsman through a window just before another broke a wine jar over his head. Rue couldn't tell if he had taken more damage from the blow or from the large amounts of wine he had been drinking before the fight started. Eric had never been much of a drinker. Some important men would like a word with you. It wouldn't do to have you in court looking as you do. Now, he said, pushing open a door, strip off. Hot tubs of soapy water waited, and the men did as they were bidden. Two years of following the Longville's orders without question had formed a habit too hard to break, and soon the five men were sitting in tubs, letting palace pages sponge them down. Pitchers of cold water were provided, and the men all drank their fill. Between the very hot bath and the large amounts of cold water he drank, Rue began to feel again that life might be worth living. When clean, they discovered their clothing had been removed. The Longville pointed to two black tunics with a familiar mark upon the breast. Eric picked one up and said, The Crimson Eagle. The Longville said, Nicholas thought it fitting and Callus didn't object. It's the banner of our new army, Eric. You and Zara are my first two corporals, so put those on. To the others, he said, There's some clean clothing over there. Nacor and Chopi both looked odd in the clean tunic and trousers, instead of the usual robes they affected, but Rue found his own appearance improved dramatically. The tunic might be a little large for his diminutive frame, but it was certainly the finest weave he had ever worn, and the trousers fit perfectly. He was still barefoot, but months at sea had toughened his feet to the point he didn't think twice about it. Eric retained his worn boots, but Jardo, like the others, went barefoot. After they dressed, the men followed the Longville into a familiar hall, here, the men of Callus's desperate company had stood trial before the Prince of Crondor, at the time Nicholas. The hall hadn't changed much, Rue thought, but he realized that his mind had been so numb from terror the last time he had been there, he had barely noticed his surroundings. Ancient banners hung from every ceiling beam, casting the hall into shadow as they cut the light from windows high in the vaulted ceiling. Torches burned in sconces along the wall to provide illumination, for despite the large windows in the far wall, the hall was immense enough the light did not reach far enough. Rue considered he would have the banners removed, were he the prince. Along the walls stood courtiers and pages, ready to do the royal bidding at a moment's notice, and a formally attired master of ceremony struck the floor with an iron-shod staff of office, announcing Robert de Longville, baron of the court and special agent of the prince. Rue shook his head slightly in amusement. For the Longville was the company sergeant, and to think of him as a court baron was too alien a task. Members of the court watched as the squad came to stand before the throne. Rue calculated, as best he could, the worth of the gold used to decorate the candle holders along the near wall, and decided the prince could better use his wealth by replacing them with brass, highly decorative but far less costly, freeing up wealth to invest in the proper enterprise. Then he wondered if he might be allowed to speak to the prince on just such a subject. Thinking of the prince turned Rue's attention to the man who had once pronounced the death sentence upon him. Nicholas, now his nephew's admiral of the Western Fleet, stood to one side of the throne beside his successor, Prince Patrick. To the other side stood Callus, and the man Rue knew to be James, Duke of Crondor, speaking to the man they had seen in the docks, Patrick's uncle, Prince Erland and sitting upon the throne was his twin. Rue suddenly flushed when he realized they were being presented to the king. Your Majesty, Highnesses, 
said de Longueville with a courtly bow. I have the honor to present five men who acquitted themselves with bravery and honor. Only five survived, asked King Boric. He and his brother were both large men, but there was an edge to the king, a toughness beyond his brother's own powerful appearance. Rue couldn't rightly judge the why of such things, but he instinctively considered the king a more dangerous opponent than Prince Erland. There are others, said de Longueville. Some will be presented this afternoon at court, soldiers from your various garrisons. But these are the only ones to survive from among the condemned. Nacor said, That we know of. De Longueville turned with a look of irritation on his face at the breach of protocol, but Boric only grinned. Nacor, is that you in that get-up? Returning the king's smile, Nacor moved forward. It's me, Majesty. I went to and came back. Greylock is with the other ship, and any others who survived and made their way to the city of the Serpent River will be with him. De Longville bit back anything he was going to say to Nacor. It was obvious that he and the king knew each other. Nacor nodded toward Erland, who also smiled at the sight of the little Isolani. To the four prisoners, the king said, You are all pardoned. Your crimes and your sentences are vacated. Glancing at Eric and Jado, he said, We see you've taken service. Eric merely nodded, while Jado stammered, Yes, Majesty. Looking at Shopi and Rue, the king said, You have not. Shopi bowed his head. I will follow my master, Majesty. Nacor said, Stop calling me master. He turned toward the king. The boy thinks me some sort of sage and insists upon traipsing around after me. Prince Erland said, I wonder why. It wouldn't be because he saw you pulling your mystic sage scam, would it, Nacor? On who's it the wandering priest, Dodge? asked the king. Nacor grinned as he rubbed his chin. Actually, I haven't tried those in a while. Then his expression darkened. And I never should have told you two about them when he rode back from Kesh. The king said, Well, take him along with you, then. You could probably do with an extra set of hands on the road. Nacor said, On the road? I'm returning to Sorcerer's Isle. The king said, Not for a while. We need you to go to Stardock on the Crown's behalf to speak with the leaders of the Academy. Nacor's expression darkened. You know I'm quits with Stardock, Boric, and you have a good idea why, I have no doubt. If the king objected to being addressed so informally, he didn't show it, as he said, We know, but you also have seen firsthand what we're up against, and you've been to Novendus twice. We need you to persuade the magicians at Stardock what stands against us. We will need their help. Find Pug. They'll listen to him, said Nacor. If we could find him, we would, said the king. He leaned back in the deep well of the throne and sighed. He's been leaving messages here and there, but we've not managed to get him to come speak with us in person. Try harder, answered Nacor. Boric smiled. You, friend, are the best we've got. So unless you want us to let every gambling hall in the kingdom get word about how you can handle cards and dice... You'll do this one little favor for an old friend. Nacor made a disgusted expression and waved his hand as if dismissing the king's remark. Bah! I liked you better when you were just a madman. He held his sour look for a moment while Boric and Erland exchanged amused glances. Turning his attention to Rue, the king said, And what of you, Rupert Avery? Can we not enlist your aid as well? The king's direct address caused Rue to forget momentarily how to speak. Then he swallowed hard and said, Sorry, Majesty. I promised myself if I lived long enough, I'd come back and get rich. That's what I propose to do. I'm going to be a man of commerce. And I can't do that in the army. The king nodded. Commerce. We suppose it's a better trade than many you could choose. He avoided any further remarks about Rue's past. Still, you've seen what few men outside our service have seen. We count upon your discretion, 
And if our meaning isn't clear, we expect your discretion. Rue smiled. I understand, Majesty. And I will promise this much when the time comes. I'll help in whatever way I can. If those snakes come here, I'll fight. Then with a twinkle and a smile, he added, Besides, the day may come when I can be of more use to you than just another sword. Perhaps, Rupert Avery, said King Borak, you certainly do not lack for ambition. He waved over Lord James and said, If it doesn't compromise our dignity, see if we can be of a little help in getting Mr. Avery's career underway. Perhaps a letter of introduction or some such. He then waved over a squire who carried five bags, which were distributed one to each of the men. Ah, uh, thank you. From your king. Rue hefted the bag and knew inside there was gold and even could estimate the worth from the weight. He quickly calculated he was already a year ahead of schedule in his plan to become wealthy. Then he noticed the others were bowing and moving away, so he quickly made an awkward bow to the king and hurried after the others. Outside the hall, DeLongville said, Well then, now you're free men again. To Dardell and Eric, he said, Stay out of trouble and be back here on the first day of next month. To Nacor and Chopi, he said, The king's messages will be ready tomorrow. See Duke James' secretary and he'll give you travel warrants and money. He turned to Rue and said, You're a rodent, Avery, but I've come to love that pinched-off little face of yours. If you change your mind, I can use another experienced soldier. Rue shook his head. Thanks, Sergeant. But I've got to find a merchant with a homely daughter and start making my fortune. To the assembled men, De Longville said, If you must enjoy the pleasures of the flesh before returning home, go to the sign of the white wing over near the merchant's gate. It's a brothel of high standards, so don't track mud inside. Tell the lady who meets you that I sent you. She may never forgive me, but she owes me a favor. See you don't cause a riot there, because I can't bail you out two nights running. Looking from face to face, he said, All things considered, you did well, lads. No one spoke until Eric said, Thank you, Sergeant. To Jado and Eric, DeLongo said, Stop by the night marshal's office on your way out and get your warrants. You're the prince's men, and from this day forward you answer only to Patrick, Callus, and me. Eric said, Where? Down this hall and turn right, second door on the left. Now, get out of here, said DeLongville, before I change my mind and have you arrested again for being such a bunch of ruffians. He sent Rue down the hall with a playful slap to the side of the head, then turned and set out on his own affairs. The five men walked down the hall, and Nacor said, I'm hungry. You're always hungry, man, said Jato with a laugh. My head is still reminding me that I was not wise last night. My stomach hasn't forgiven me either. Then he paused and added, But I might do with a bite to eat after all that. Eric laughed. I'm hungry too. Then let us find an inn, said Nacor. A quiet inn, Rue interjected. A quiet inn, continued Nacor, and eat. Then what, master? asked Shopi. Nacor grimaced, but said only, Then we go to the sign of the white wing boy. He shook his head. Pointing to Shopi, he said to the others, This one has much to learn. The sign of the white wing was nothing like what Rue expected. Then he considered he really hadn't known what to expect. He had trafficked with whores before, but that had been on the line of march, with camp followers who would tumble a man beside to his comrades and be off to the next as soon as he could count out her pay. But this was a different world. The five slightly inebriated men had had to ask several times to find their way. After a few failed attempts, they finally discovered a modest building near the edge of the merchant's quarter. The sign out front had been almost impossible to make out, being little more than a simple metal wing painted white, unlike the more boldly painted large ones marking more traditional trades. The door had been opened by a servant who admitted the five without a word, indicating they should wait in a tiny anteroom, without furnishing of any sort, only decorated by some nondescript tapestries that hung on the two side walls. Opposite the entrance stood another door, of simple painted wood. When it opened, a well-dressed, if somewhat matronly woman had stepped through, 
Yes, she had asked. The men glanced at one another, and it was Nacor who had at last answered, We were told to come here. By whom? she then asked, looking somewhat unconvinced. Robert de Longville, said Eric softly, as if afraid to raise his voice. Instantly, the woman's features had transformed themselves from dubious to joyful. Bobby de Longville, by the gods, if you're friends of Bobby's, you're welcome here. She then clapped her hands once, and the door she had slipped through opened wide, revealing a short entryway occupied by two large armed guards. As they stepped aside, Rue thought it clear they had been standing by to ensure the safety of the woman. I'm Jamila, your hostess. And here, she said, reaching another door, which she pulled wide, we enter the House of the White Wing. The five men gaped. Even Nacor, who had seen riches in the court of the Empress of Great Kesh, stood in stunned awe. The room wasn't that opulent, far from it. In fact, it was the lack of gaudy displays of wealth that made the setting so impressive. Everything about the room was subtle and tasteful, though Rue would have been hard put to say what made it seem so. Chairs and divans were placed around the room so that those inside would be within sight of one another, yet there was a clear sense of each area being apart from the others. This was made abundantly clear by the fact of a wealthy-looking man sprawling upon one divan, sipping wine from a goblet while two lovely young women attended him. One sat upon the floor, allowing him to caress her shoulders and neck, while the other hovered over him, offering him sweetmeats from a gilded tray. As if by magic, girls appeared through several curtains. All were modestly dressed, like the two attending the man already in the room, wearing loose-fitting gowns of light material. That they were covered from neck to ankle did nothing to hide the curves of their bodies as they moved to greet their guests. Each man found a pair of girls leading him toward one of the chairs or divans, allowing him to choose how he wished to relax, sitting or lying down. Before he knew it, Rue had been led to a divan and gently pushed down on it, had his feet raised and placed on the divan, had a goblet of wine handed to him. One of the girls began firmly kneading the muscles in his shoulders before he spoke. The woman called Jamila said, when you're ready, the girls can show you to your rooms. Jado, circling the waist of one of the young girls with one powerful arm, pulled her toward him, planted a loud kiss upon her cheek, and said, Men and gods, I've died and gone to paradise. This brought a round of laughter, and Rue settled back, letting the light touch of the girl's hands relax him in a way he'd not experienced in years. Two. Homecoming. Rue yawned. The body next to him stood under white sheets, and he realized where he was. He smiled, remembering the night before, and ran his hand under the sheet and across the back of the young woman next to him. He didn't think of her as a whore. The term was fit for the women who followed soldiers around camp, or who leaned over the balconies in the poor quarter of Trondor, shouting ribald suggestions and insults at the workers and sailors below. But these... Ladies, he decided, were unlike anything he had imagined as a boy. They were flirtatious, seemed well-educated, were impeccable in their manners, and, as Rue had discovered the night before, creative and enthusiastic. The young woman next to him had taught Rue more things about pleasing a woman and himself in one night than he had learned from every woman he had been with in his young life. And they smelled wonderful, like flowers and spices. He found himself becoming aroused, and with a grin, continued to caress the body next to him. The girl awoke, and if she had any problem with being awakened thus, she masked it with incredible skill. She actually seemed pleased to discover Rue lying next to her. Good morning, she said with a wide smile. Running her fingers along his stomach, she said, What a nice way to wake up. As he gathered the girl into his arms, Rue considered himself fortunate. He had no illusions about his looks. He was easily the homeliest boy from Ravensburg, but he had managed to bed two of the local girls in town before he and Eric had been forced to flee. He knew, given enough time, he could charm most anyone, though he rarely tried. But now he was alive, with gold in his belt, and a woman willing to make him feel handsome. It was the start of a wonderful day.
Later, he bid the girl goodbye, realizing that he couldn't remember if her name was Mary or Marie. He found Eric already dressed and waiting in the antechamber, speaking with a particularly pretty young blonde. Eric looked up. Ready to leave? Rue nodded. The others? We'll see them when we get back from Ravensburg, or at least I will. He rose and was still holding on to the girl's hand. There was something about his manner that struck Rue as odd. And as they left the brothel, he remarked, You've seen smitten with that pretty girl. Eric blushed. Nothing of the kind. She's... After a silent moment, Rue supplied. A whore? They said he was busy at that hour of the morning, and they were forced to wind their way through the press. Eric said, I guess. Something more like a lady, I think. Rue shrugged, the gesture lost on Eric. They get paid well, that's for certain. He was now considering the diminishment of his purse as he weighed the cost versus the reward. He decided he needed to husband his capital a bit more carefully. There were far less expensive whores to be found. Where to next? asked Rue. I need to talk to Sebastian Linder. Rue brightened. Barrett's Coffee House was one of the places he wished to visit, and having a social call to make upon one of the solicitors who plied their business there was an eminently acceptable reason. They headed to the area of the city known locally as the Merchant's Quarter, even though it held only a slightly higher percentage of businesses than elsewhere in the city. What marked the Merchant's Quarter was a high number of very costly homes, many erected behind or above the stores that generated their wealth, the highest concentration of influential men who were not nobility. The craftsmen had their guilds, the thieves' tools, the mockers, and the nobility had their rank from birth, but men who pursued their fortune through commerce and trade had only their wits, while a few of them had banded together to create trade associations from time to time. Most were independent businessmen without allies, but with many competitors. So those who survived and became successful had few peers with whom to share their pride of accomplishment few fellows with whom to boast of their good fortune and perspicacity. A few, like a merchant Rue had met named Helmut Grindel, kept their appearance modest, as if to call attention to themselves might bring ruin. But others chose to shout their success to the world by building huge townhouses, rivaling those owned by the nobility, throughout the city. And over the years, the nature of the merchant's quarter had changed. As more and more rich merchants purchased property in the area, the cost of land rose so high that now few businesses in the merchant's quarter were owned by those who lived there. The price of housing was too dear. There were a few modest storefront enterprises established by the fathers or grandfathers of those tending them now that continued to provide conventional goods and services to those in the area, a bakery on one street, a cobbler on another, but they were quickly being replaced by shops specializing in luxurious items for these very wealthy merchants, jewelers, tailors of the finest clothing, and traders in rare goods. And those who lived in the merchant's quarter were now almost exclusively these very wealthy businessmen, those with far-flung financial empires elsewhere in the province or in distant cities. In time, the last of the modest merchants would sell their property, as the offers to buy became too good to refuse, and relocate to more distant quarters in the Foulberg, that expanding portion of the city beyond the old wall. Barrett's Coffee House stood at the corner of a street now known as Arutha's Way, in honor of the late Prince of Crondor, father to the king, but still called by most locals Sandy Beach Walk, and Miller's Road, a route that had once led from the mill no longer extant to a farmer's gate long torn down. Barrett's was a tall building, three stories, with two open doors at the corner, one on each street. Standing in each corner was a waiter, a man with a white tunic, black trousers, black boots, and a blue and white striped apron. The three other street corners were occupied by a tavern, a ship's broker, and diagonally across the street from Barrett's, an abandoned home. It had once been splendid, perhaps one of the finest in Grandor. But misfortune had cost its owner dearly from all appearances. It had been neglected long before it was abandoned, and its past glory was now faded by peeling paint, boarded up windows, missing tiles from the roof, 
and dirt everywhere. Rue glanced at that building. Maybe someday I'll buy that house and fix it up. Eric smiled. I don't doubt it, Rue. Rue and Eric walked past the waiter standing at the door on Miller's Road and entered. The two outside doors opened on a simple receiving area, offering several well-upholstered chairs, but otherwise closed off from the main floor of the coffee house by a wooden railing. There was one opening in the railing, blocked by a man attired in a manner similar to the two waiters at the door. The main difference was that his apron was black. A tall man, he looked eye to eye at Eric, then down at Rue, as he said, Yes. Eric said, We've come to see Sebastian Lender. The man nodded. Follow me, please. He turned and walked onto the main floor of the coffee house. Rue and Eric followed and were led through a large area of small tables, several occupied by men drinking coffee, while waiters hurried from table to table. To the left, as they reached the center of the room, a broad flight of stairs led up to a balcony rather than a true second floor, leaving the center of the room open to the high vaulted ceiling. Looking up, Rue saw there was no third floor, but rather a double set of high windows above the second floor balcony. Barrett's was a very open, well-lit building as a result. They reached another waist-high railing, which cut off the rear third of the room, and there the waiter said, Please wait here. The waiter moved a small section of the rail that was on hinges and stepped through and toward a table at the far side of the house. Rue motioned upward, and Eric's eyes went to where he pointed. Above them, on the second floor landing, men sat at tables. Rue said, The brokers. How do you know? I've heard a thing or two, said Rue. Eric laughed and shook his head. Most likely he had heard it from Helmut Grindel, the trader they had traveled with for a while when coming to Crondor. Rue and Grindel had spoken of many things commercial, and while Eric had found some of the conversation diverting, as often as not it put him to sleep. A moment later, a dignified-looking man wearing an unadorned but expensive tunic with an overvest and cravat approached. He studied the two young men before him for a moment, then said, My word, young Von Darkmoor and Mr. Avery, if I'm not mistaken. Rue nodded as Eric said, Yes, Mr. Lender, we gained our pardon. Most unusual, said Lender. He motioned for the waiter to open the railing for him to step through. Only members are permitted behind this second railing. He indicated with a wave of his hand that Rue and Eric should sit at an empty table a few feet away. He motioned for the waiter and said, Three coffees. Looking at Rue and Eric, he asked, Have you broken fast today? When they answered in the negative, he said to the waiter, some rolls, jams, and honey, and a platter of cheese and sausage. As the waiter hurried off, Lender said, As you are pardoned, you obviously do not need my services as a solicitor, so perhaps you need them as a litigator. Eric said, Not really. I came to pay you your fee. Lender began to object, but Eric said, I know you refused to take gold before, but despite your having lost the pleading, we are here and alive, so I think you're entitled to your fee. He produced his money pouch and put it upon the table. It clinked with a heavy sound of gold coins. Lender said, You've prospered, young gentleman. It's a payment for services from the prince, said Rue. Shrugging, Lender opened the purse, counted out fifteen golden sovereigns, then closed the purse, pushing it back toward Eric. Is that enough? asked Eric. Had I won, I would have charged you fifty said Linder, as the coffee arrived. Rue had never cared for coffee, so he sipped at it, expecting to put aside the cup and ignore it. But, to his surprise, instead of the bitter brew he had tasted before, this was a rich, complex taste. This is good, he blurted. Eric laughed and tried his, then said, It is. Keshian, said Linder. Far superior to what is grown in the kingdom. More flavor, less bitterness. He waved his hand around the room. Barrett's is the first establishment in Crondor to specialize exclusively in fine coffees, and as a sign of his wisdom, the founder placed his first shop here in the heart of the merchant's quarter, rather than trying to sell to the nobility. Rue instantly came alert. Stories of success appealed to him. Why is that? he asked. 
because the nobility are difficult to approach. Expect extreme discounts and rarely pay in a timely fashion. Rue laughed. I heard that from the wine merchants at home, Lender continued. Mr. Barrett knew that the local businessmen often needed a place away from their homes or offices where they could discuss business over a meal without the distractions of an inn's taproom. Eric again nodded, having spent a fair part of his life in the tap room of the inn where he had worked as a child. So was born Barrett's Coffee House, which prospered from the first week it was opened. Originally a more modest enterprise, it has existed for nearly 75 years. In this location, for close to 60. What about the brokers and syndicates and you? asked Rue. Lender smiled as a tray of hot rolls, breakfast meats, cheeses and fruits, along with pots of jam, honey and butter, was brought to the table. Suddenly hungry, Rue took a roll and slathered butter and honey on it while Lender answered him. Some of those without offices of their own used to conduct business all day long and to keep Barrett happy would buy coffee, tea, and food in a steady stream. Seeing this a pleasant alternative to hours of empty tables between meals, Mr. Barrett ensured certain tables would remain reserved for those businessmen. They formed the first syndicates and brokerage alliances, and they needed representation. He put his hand upon his chest and bowed slightly. Hence, litigators and solicitors became habitués of the establishment. When things became crowded, the son of the founder moved to this inn, tore out the third floor, and created the exclusive members' area above. And things have continued that way since. He motioned at the second rail. Some members were forced to use this end of the ground floor. Hence the newer railing. Now one must purchase a location in the hall for one's syndicate or brokerage or risk not having a table at which to sit when arriving to conduct business. Glancing around, he added, You now are in the heart of one of the most important trading centers in the kingdom, certainly the most important in the Western realm, and rivaled only by those in Milanon, Kesh, and Quegg. How does one become a broker? asked Rue. First, you need money, answered the litigator, not in the least put off by the youngster seeking instruction. A great deal of money. This is why there are so many syndicates, because of the great cost of underwriting many of the projects that are conceived of here at Barrett's or brought to us from the outside. How does one start? asked Rue. I mean, I have some money, but I'm not sure if I want to invest it here or try my own hand. No partnership will admit an investor without good cause, said Lender. He sipped his coffee, then continued. Over the years, a complex set of rules has evolved. Noblemen often come to Barrett, seeking either to invest wealth or to borrow it, and as a result, the interests of those here who are commoners need to be closely protected. So, to join a syndicate, one needs a great deal of money, though not as much as to become an independent broker. And one also needs a sponsor. What's that? asked Rue. One who is already a member of Barrett's or who has close ties to one of the members who can vouch for you. If you have the capital, then you need the introduction. Can't you do that? asked Rue, obviously eager. No, said Linder with a slightly sad smile. For all my influence and position, here I am but a guest. My office has been here for nearly 25 years, but only because I work on behalf of nearly 30 different brokers and syndicates and I have never placed a copper piece of my own capital at risk through any offering. What's an offering? asked Eric. Linder put up his hand. There are more questions than time, young Van Darkmoor. He signaled to one of the ever-present waiters. In my property box, you'll find a long blue velvet bag. Please bring it here. To Eric and Rue, he said, I enjoy the break from the routine, but time doesn't permit a leisurely discourse on the business at Barrett's. Rue said, I plan on being a broker. Do you? said Lender, and his face lit up with delight. His expression wasn't mocking, but he seemed to find the pronouncement entertaining. What is this venture, then, that you spoke of? Rue leaned back. It's a plan I have that would take too long to speak of, I'm sorry to say. Lender laughed while Eric blushed at his friend's bold freshness. Well said, answered Lender. Besides, added Rue, I think discretion is an order. 
Often that is the case, agreed Lender as the waiter returned with a requested item. Lender took the velvet bag and opened it, removing a dagger. It was a deftly fashioned thing, with a sheath of ivory set with a small ruby and bound to the top and tip with gold. He handed it to Eric. It was the other part of your legacy from your father. Eric took the dagger and pulled the blade from the sheath. Impressive, he said. I may not be as well practiced with weapons at the forge as I am with horseshoes, but this is fine work. From Rhodes, I believe, said Lender. Best steel in the kingdom, agreed Eric. The blade was embossed with a von Darkmoor family crest, finely cut into the steel, and yet it was well balanced, both decorative and deadly. The hilt was carved bone, perhaps from the antler of an elk or moose, and capped with gold to match the sheath. Lender pushed back his chair. Young sirs, I must be back to my business, but please feel free to linger a while and refresh yourselves. If you ever have need of a solicitor or a litigator, you know where to find me. He waved vaguely at the place from which he had appeared and added, Goodbye, it was good seeing you well. Eric rose, as did Rue, and they bade their host farewell, then looked at each other. As old friends do, they shared a single thought between them, and Rue said, Home. They moved through the crowded common room of Barrett's, a place both strange and exciting to Rue, and exited. At the door, Eric turned to one of the waiters and asked, Where can a man buy a good horse? Cheaply, injected Rue. The waiter didn't hesitate. At the merchant's gate, he said, pointing along Arutha's way. You'll find several dealers. Most are thieves, but there's a man named Morgan there who can be trusted. Tell him Jason at Barrett sent you, and he'll treat you fairly. Rue studied the young man's face. Brown hair and light freckles marked him, and Rue said, I'll remember you if he doesn't. The young man frowned ever so slightly, but said only, He's honest, sir. What about new clothing? asked Eric. Jason said, The tailor at Newgate Road and Broad Street is a cousin of mine, sir. Tell him I sent you, and he'll see you right for a reasonable sum. Rue didn't look convinced, but Eric said thanks and led his friend away. They remained silent as they wended their way through the crowded city streets. It took them the better part of an hour to reach the tailors, and an hour to select clothing for travel that fit. Eric chose a riding cloak to cover his uniform tunic, and Rue purchased an inexpensive tunic and trousers, a cloak, and a slouch hat. Eric also found a cobbler who provided him with a pair of boots to wear while those left him by his father were mended. Rue had gotten used to going barefoot while aboard ship, but purchased a pair of boots for riding. Soon after they were at the merchant's gate and spent another hour haggling for a pair of horses, but the waiter had been truthful with them and Morgan was an honest trader. Eric picked out two sturdy geldings, a bay for himself and a gray for Rue. Leading the horses away with rope halters, they found a saddler a half block away and quickly had the horses tacked up and ready to ride. Rue settled into the saddle and said, I don't care how much I do it. I'll never get to like riding. Eric laughed. You've become a better than average horseman, Rue, despite your objections. And this time you can ride without much worry about having to fight while on that creature's back. Rue's expression darkened. Eric said, What? What's this much business? Eric laughed even louder. There are no guarantees in this life, my friend. So saying, he put heels to sides, and the horse moved out briskly toward the merchant's gate and the road eastward. On to Ravensburg, he shouted. Rue could only laugh at his friend's merriment, and he followed suit, discovering that his horse was inclined to argue with every command. Taking a firm hand, and knowing that the sooner the battle was fought, the sooner it was won, Rue slammed his heels hard against the horse's sides and drove him after Eric's mount. Quickly, they were outside the city wall, on their way home. Rain pelted them its insistent beat a physical assault. Night was rapidly approaching, and the only traffic on the road was local businessmen and farmers hurrying home. A resigned wagon driver barely looked over at Rue and Eric passing as he urged his slowly plodding horses to continue through the mud. The King's Highway might be the artery that carried the lifeblood of commerce from one border to the other, but when the rains came to the barony of Darkmoor, the blood didn't flow, it oozed.
Eric shouted, Lights! Rue looked out from under the sodden brim of his once handsome slouch hat. Wilhelmsburg? I think, said Eric. We'll be home by tomorrow afternoon. I don't suppose I could convince you to sleep in some stranger's barn, could I? said Rue, having spent more money on this journey than he had planned. No, answered Eric, without humor. I'm for a dry bed and a hot meal. That image overcame Rue's reluctance to spend another coin, and he followed his friend toward the lights of the town. They found a modest inn with a sign of a plowshare swinging in the wind and rode through the side gate to the stable. Eric shouted, and a lackey came out, bundled against the weather, to take the horses. He listened politely to Eric's instructions and nodded, and Eric assumed he would be wise to return after supper to see the boy cared for the animals as he ordered. They hurried into the tap room and, once inside, shook off the water from their cloaks. Evening, sirs, said a young girl, pleasant-looking, with brown hair and eyes. Will you be needing rooms for the night? Yes, said Rue, obviously displeased at the cost, but now that warmth was returning to his bones, glad they were not returning to the weather outside. Fit to be blowing up a rare storm tonight, said the innkeeper as he came and took their cloaks and hats. Will you be dining? He handed the cloaks and hats to the girl, who took them somewhere warm to hang and dry. Yes, said Eric. What wine have you? Fit for a lord, said the man with a smile. Any from Ravensburg? asked Eric as he made his way to an empty table. Save for a solitary man with a sword in the far corner and two merchants obviously taking their ease before the fireplace, the inn was deserted. The innkeeper followed them. We do, sir. It's the next town over, then one more, and on to Ravensburg. So we are in Wilhelmsburg, said Rue. Yes, answered the innkeeper. Are you familiar with the area? We're from Ravensburg, answered Eric. It's just been a while since we've been there, and in the darkness we weren't sure which town this was. Bring us some wine, please, asked Rue. Then supper. The meal was filling, if not memorable, and the wine better than expected. It clearly had a style and finish familiar to both Rue and Eric. It was the common wine of Ravensburg, but compared to what they had been drinking the last year and more, this seemed a bottle fit for the king's table. Both young men fell into a quiet mood, anticipating the homecoming the next day. For Rue, it was nothing much to do with his past. His immediate family was his father, Tom Avery, a drunken teamster whose only legacy to Rue had been beatings and teaching him to drive a team of horses. Rue was much more interested in seeking out some minor wine merchants he knew and arranging what he hoped would be the start of his rise to riches. For Eric, it was coming home to his mother and the shattered dream of his youth, a blacksmith's forge and a family. He had served old Tyndall, the smith, for years before Tyndall's death, then a year and more with Nathan, who had been the closest thing to a father he had known. But life took its own course, and nothing seemed to be as he had hoped it would when he was a child in Ravensburg. What are you thinking? asked Rue. You've been quiet a long time. You haven't exactly been bending my ear, replied Eric, a smile on his face. Just about home and what it was like before. He didn't have to say before what. Rue knew. Before a struggle with Eric's half-brother Stefan ended up with Rue's dagger driven into Stefan's chest as Eric held him. After that, they had fled Ravensburg and had not seen friend or family since. Rue said, I wonder if anyone told them we live. Eric laughed. If they didn't, our arrival tomorrow will be something of a surprise. The door opened, and the howl of the wind caused the two young men to turn. Four soldiers in the garb of the barony entered, cursing the night's foul weather. Handkeeper, shouted the corporal as he removed his sopping great cloak. Hot food and mulled wine! He glanced around the room, then his gaze returned to Ruin Eric. His eyes widened. Von Darkmoor, he blurted. The other three soldiers fanned out, not quite sure why their corporal had called out their baron's name, but clearly alerted to trouble by his tone. Eric and Rue stood, and the two merchants moved away from their chairs before the fireplace, hugging the wall. The only other person in the room, the swordsman, looked on with interest, but didn't move. The corporal had his sword out, and as Rue made to draw his own, Eric motioned for him to return it to its scabbard. We're not looking for trouble, corporal. 
The corporal said, We heard you'd been hung. I don't know how you and your scrawny friend escaped, but we'll soon put that right. Seize them, Rue said. Wait a minute. The men moved quickly, but Eric and Rue were both quicker, and the first two soldiers who laid hands upon them found themselves on the floor, their heads ringing from swift blows. The two merchants spied a pathway past the trouble and beat a hasty exit from the room, running outside into the rain without their hats or coats. The man at the table laughed. Well done, he shouted. The corporal leveled his sword and thrust, but Eric slipped aside and had him by the wrist before he could react. One of the strongest men Rue had ever seen, Eric also had been trained in barehanded combat, and his iron grip wrung the corporal's sword from his fingers as he gasped in pain. Rue simply thrust with his hand, palm out, fingers extended, and delivered a sharp blow with the heel of his hand upward to the chin of the other standing soldier, who went down in a stunned heap. Wait a minute, commanded Eric, in the voice he had developed as Robert de Longville's corporal on their return from Novendus. The other two soldiers, who were slowly standing, hesitated, and Eric shouted his command. Hold, damn you! He released the corporal's wrist while kicking aside his sword, so he couldn't reach for it easily, then showed that his hands were empty of weapons. I have a paper. He reached slowly inside his tunic, removed the document given him the day before by an officer in the office of the Knight Marshal of Crondor, and handed it to the corporal. The man took it and glanced it over. Got the seal of Crondor at the bottom, he grudgingly admitted, while still sitting on the floor. Then his eyes lowered as he said, Can't read. The swordsman stood and with a relaxed air moved to Eric's side. If I may help, Corporal, he said, extending his hand. The Corporal handed back the document, and the man read aloud. Know you by my hand and seal that Eric von Darkmoor is sworn to my service, and... His eyes glanced to the bottom of the document. It's a lot of mumbo-jumbo, Corporal. The short of it is you just tried to arrest one of Prince Nicholas's personal guards. A Corporal like yourself, it says. A fact? asked the corporal, his eyes widened. Yes, not only is the document signed by the Duke of Crondor's own knight marshal, the prince himself signed it. True, was the corporal's next remark as he slowly rose to his feet. True, answered the stranger. And from the way he took your sword from you, I think there's a reason he's in the prince's personal service. The corporal rubbed his wrist. Well, perhaps. His eyes narrowed. But we heard nothing about this. And last time Eric's name was mentioned, it was when we heard he was to be hung for killing the young baron. Eric sighed. The prince pardoned us. So you say, said the corporal. But I think me and the boys will hurry back to Darkmoor and see what Lord Manfred has to say about this. He picked up his sword and signaled to his men to depart. One of them shook his head in disgust at foregoing a hot meal, and the other threw Eric and Rue a black look as he helped the one Rue had stunned back to his feet. That man, still trying to focus his eyes, said, We're leaving. Did we eat? Is it morning? The other said, Shut up, Louis. A bit of that cutting rain will sort you out quick-like. The soldiers left the inn, and Eric turned to the stranger. Thanks. The man shrugged. If I hadn't read it, the innkeeper or someone else would. Eric said, I'm Eric von Darkmoor. The man took his hand. Duncan Avery. Rue's eyes widened. Cousin Duncan? The eyes of the man who had named himself Avery narrowed as he studied Rue. After a long moment, he said, Rupert? Suddenly they were laughing, and the man Rupert called cousin gave him a quick hug. I haven't seen you since you were a tadpole, youngster. He stepped back, and a wry smile graced his features. Eric glanced back and forth and couldn't see even the most remote resemblance. While Rue was short, wiry, and signally unattractive, Duncan Avery was tall, slender, with broad shoulders, and handsome. Moreover, he dressed like a dandy, save for his sword, which was well used and well cared for. He sported a slender mustache, but otherwise was clean-shaven, and his hair hung to his shoulders, where it was cut evenly and curled under. Pulling out a chair, Duncan signaled the serving girl to bring his plate and mug over and sat. Eric said, I didn't know you had a cousin, Rue. Rue's eyes narrowed. Of course you did. Eric waved away his previous comment. I mean, I know you have a number of them in Salador and elsewhere in the East, but you've never mentioned this gentleman before. 
Duncan thanked the girl and winked at her, causing her to retire with a giggle as he said, I'm crushed, Rupert. What does your friend mean? You've never spoken of me. Rue sat back, shaking his head. It's not like we were close, Duncan. I saw you, what, three times in my life? Duncan laughed. Something like that. Tried my hand at the Teamsters trade when I was a boy, he said to Eric. Got as far as riding with Rue's pa from Ravensburg to Malik's Cross, where I quit. Rue was no more than five then. His face turned somber. Only time I got to meet his ma. When was the last time we saw each other? Asked Rue. Duncan rubbed his chin. Can't say I remember, save there was that lovely girl of the fountain. Slender waist, ample hips and bosom. Accommodating attitude. Who was she? Gwen, supplied Rue. And that must have been four or five years ago. Rue pointed a fork at Duncan. You were her first. Then he grinned. Many of the local lads owe you some thanks. You imparted a certain enthusiasm in Gwen that we came to appreciate. Eric laughed. I'm not one of them, he said. Rue said, maybe the only boy in Ravensburg who didn't. How are you related? Eric asked Duncan. Duncan said, my father is cousin to Rue's father, Eric, and neither of those worthy gentlemen has much use for me. To Rue he said, how is your pa? Rue shrugged. Been a couple of years, really. We're on our way to Ravensburg now. Where are you headed? I'm for the East, seeking my fortune as usual. I tried my hand doing mercenary duty down in the Vale of Dreams, but the work's too dangerous. The women too dangerous. Both Eric and Rue laughed at that. And the money scarce. So I'm for the Eastern courts, where a man's wits stand him as well as a sword. Rue said, I might have some use for that wit. What's the plan? asked Duncan, suddenly interested. Nothing dodgy. Some honest business, but I think I can use someone who knows his way around polite company. Duncan shrugged. Well, I'll ride with you to Ravensburg, and we can talk along the way. Besides, you've got my curiosity piqued. Why? asked Eric. The way you two moved, it was a sight. When I last saw Rupert, he was a scrawny kid, barely able to keep himself upright while he pissed. But now he looked downright lethal when he knocked out that soldier. Where did you learn to handle yourselves that way? Rue and Eric exchanged glances. Neither needed to be reminded of the network of spies already established in the kingdom by the agents of the Emerald Queen. Distant cousin or not, Rue had no illusions about the man's honesty. Here and there, said Rue. That's some um, Isolani open-handed fighting around a cow's newborn, said Duncan. Where'd you see it before? asked Eric. As I said, I just returned from down in the Vale. You see a few Isolani there, as well as some other Keshian born who know the tricks. He leaned forward, and his voice lowered. I hear you can crack a man's skull with your hand if you know how to do it. Eric said, That's easy. Just make sure you've got a smith's hammer in the hand when you hit him. Duncan stared at Eric a moment, then burst into laughter. Good one, lad he said as he dug into his meal. I think I'm going to like you. They continued to chat as they ate, and after, Eric went to check on the horses. When he returned, the three men retired for the night to the common sleeping area upstairs so they might get an early start in the morning. The village seemed at once unchanged and smaller. Rue said, Nothing's different. They rode at a walk, having taken the bend at the road that put them within sight of Ravensburg. They had been passing familiar farms for the last hour, both vineyards and fields of oat, wheat, and corn. But in the distance, they now at last were in sight of the small buildings at the edge of the town. Eric remained silent, but Duncan said, Doesn't look any different to me, and it's been years. Riding past familiar landmarks, Rue thought that he was wrong. Everything had changed, or at least he had changed, and therefore how he saw things had changed. Reaching the inn of the pintail, Eric said, Few things in Ravensburg ever change, but we have, echoing Rue's thoughts of a few moments before. Duncan said, that's always true, I guess. Eric had taken a liking to the affable man, and Rue was pleased, for he liked his cousin as well, though he barely trusted him. He was an Avery, and Rue knew what that meant. There had been a distant uncle, John, who had made a terrible reputation for himself as a pirate, 
long before Rue had been born, and more than half those uncles and cousins who had died since Rue's birth had been hanged or killed during a robbery attempt. Still, there were a few Averys who had turned a hand toward honest labor, and Rue thought that gave him a chance of getting rich without having to resort to murder or robbery. As they dismounted, a boy ran from the stable and said, Care for your horses, gentlemen? Eric said, Who are you? Gunther, said the boy. I'm the smith's apprentice, sir. Eric tossed the reins to the boy. Is your master about? asked Eric. He's taking his midday meal in the kitchen, sir. Should I fetch him for you? Eric said, Never mind, I can find the way. The boy took the horses and led them away. Rue said, Your replacement? So it seems, said Eric, shaking his head. He can't be more than twelve or so. You were younger when you started helping Tyndall around the forge, reminded Rue. Rue followed Eric as he moved to the rear door, the one that led directly into the kitchen. Eric pushed open the door and stepped through. Frida, Eric's mother, sat at the kitchen table talking to Nathan the smith. She looked up as Eric came through the doorway. Her eyes widened and her color drained away. She half stood. Then her eyes rolled up into her head and she swooned, caught by the smith before she fell to the floor. Damn me, said Nathan. It's you. It really is. Eric hurried around the table and took his mother's hand. Get some water, he instructed Rue. Rue got a pitcher and filled it from the pump at the sink and brought a clean kitchen rag, which he wet and placed upon Eric's mother's brow. Eric looked across his mother's still form at the man with whom she had been eating and saw the smith regarding him with amazement in his eyes, which were brimming with tears. You're alive, he said. We didn't know. Eric swore. I'm an idiot. Rue took off his towel cloak and sat down, motioning to Duncan to do the same. Rosalind, he shouted. We need wine. Nathan shook his head. Rosalind's not here. I'll get us a bottle. As he stood, he said, There's a lot to be talked of, it seems. A moment later, he returned with Milo, the innkeeper, a step behind. The innkeeper said, My God! Eric! Rue, you're alive! Eric and Rue both exchanged a glance. Then Rue said, well, it was a secret, wasn't it? Nathan said, Are you hunted? Rue burst out laughing. No, Master Smith. We are free men by the king's own hand, and prosperous ones as well. He jingled his purse significantly. Nathan pulled the cork of the wine bottle he carried and poured a round of drinks, while Frida regained consciousness. She blinked and said, Eric? Here, Mother. She threw her arms around his neck and started to cry. We would... Told we were tried and convicted. We were, said Eric softly. But we gained our pardon and were set free. Why did you not send word? She asked, a slight note of reproach in her voice. She touched his face as if uncertain of his substance. We couldn't, said Eric. We were in the prince's service and... He glanced around the room. We were not permitted to let anyone know. But that's all in the past. She shook her head slightly in amazement. She touched his cheek, then kissed it. Resting her head on his shoulder, she said, My prayers are answered. Nathan said, She prayed, lad. He wiped away a tear. We all prayed for you. Rue saw that Eric's own emotions were starting to rise, but Eric forced them down, never having been one to show his feelings openly. Rue took a deep breath, suddenly feeling self-conscious over the moisture gathering in his own eyes. Eric asked, What of you? How are you? Frida sat back and took Nathan's hand. There have been changes. Eric glanced from his mother to the smith. You too? Nathan smiled. We wed last summer. Then his expression darkened. You've no objections, I take it. Eric let out a whoop and leaned across the table and seized his stepfather in a bear hug, nearly knocking the wine over. Only Rue's quick reflexes saved it. Objections? You're the best man I know, Nathan. And if I could have named my father, it would have been you. Sitting back, he looked at his mother with an unashamed tear rolling down his cheek. Then he took her in another bear hug and said, I'm so happy for you, mother. Frida blushed like a bride. He came to me and was so sweet when you fled. He saw to my hurt every day, Eric. She touched Nathan's cheek with more tenderness than Eric could ever remember her showing anyone, including himself. He made me care again. 
Slapping his hand on the table, Eric said, We celebrate. To Milo, he said, I want your best bottle and a meal tonight to embarrass the Empress of Kesh. Done, said Milo, his own eyes glistening with emotion. And I'll only charge you cost. Rue laughed. You haven't changed, Master Innkeeper. Where's Rosalind? said Eric. Milo and Nathan exchanged glances, and Nathan said, She's with her family, Eric. Eric glanced around, not understanding. Family? You're her father. Rue reached over and took his friend's arm. She's with her husband, Eric. He looked at Milo. Isn't that what Nathan's saying, Milo? Milo nodded. Aye, and I'm a grandfather, too. Eric sat back. His emotions were in turmoil. She's had a baby? Milo looked at Eric. That's a fact. Eric said, Who's the father? Milo glanced around the room and said, She married young Rudolph, the baker's apprentice. You know him? Eric nodded. He's now a journeyman and will set up his own ovens soon. She's living with his family over by the square. Eric rose. I know the house. I want to see her. Frida said, Go slowly, son. She also thinks you're dead. Leaning over to kiss his mother again, he said, I know. I'll try not to scare her to death. I want her to come tonight. Then he added, with Rudolph. Rue said, I'll go with you. Frida squeezed his hand. Don't be long, else I'll think this all a dream. Eric laughed. Hardly. Rue's cousin Duncan will charm you with tales wondrous and improbable. The cousins smiled. Nathan looked at the handsome Duncan and said, You'll not be charming her too much, I'm thinking. Eric laughed. We'll be back soon. Rue and Eric hurried from the kitchen, through the empty common room of the inn, and out the front door. They hastened down the street that led to the town's square, and hardly noticed those few townspeople who stopped to stare in open amazement at the familiar figures of Rupert Avery and Eric von Darkmoor hurrying along. One man dropped a crock of wine as his eyes widened at the sight of their reputedly dead men striding past. One or two others tried to say something, but Rue and Eric were away before they could give voice to the greeting. Reaching the town square, they turned and made their way to the bakery where Rudolph worked and lived. At the front door, Rue saw Eric hesitate. Rue knew Eric's feelings for Rosalind were never simple. She was like a sister to him, but at the same time, there was something more. Rue and the others around the town knew that Rosalind was in love with Eric, even if he had been too thick to know. At least he had been aware just before his departure from Ravensburg that her feelings for him were more than sisterly. He had talked about it with Rue more than once, and Rue knew that Eric still didn't really understand how he felt about her. Suddenly, embarrassed by his own hesitation, Eric entered the bakery. Rudolph stood behind the counter, and when he looked up, he said, Can I help? His eyes widened as he said, Eric? Rue? Eric offered a friendly smile. Hello, Rudolph. He extended his hand as he crossed the small space between door and counter. Rue followed. Rudolph had never been what either Rue or Eric would count a friend, though in a town as small as Ravensburg, all the children of similar age know one another. I thought you dead, he half whispered, as if afraid to be overheard. That seems to have been the general opinion, Rue said, but we were freed by the king. By the king? asked Rudolph, clearly impressed, as he took Eric's hand and gave it a perfunctory shake. Then he shook with Rue. Yes, said Eric, and I'm back. When Rudolph's expression darkened, he quickly added, For a few days. I'm the Prince of Crondor's man now. He pointed to the crest on his tunic. I must be back there before the end of the month. Rudolph relaxed. Well, then, it's good to see you. He looked Eric up and down. I expect you've come to see Rosalind? She was a sister to me, said Eric. Rudolph nodded. In the back. Follow me. Eric and Rue walked to the end of the counter, where Rudolph lifted the hinged top and stepped through. They followed Rudolph through the large bakery, past now-cooling ovens that wouldn't be heated again after nightfall, as the bakers plied their tasks all night long, so there would be hot bread for sale at first light. Large tables, now cleaned, waited for the bakers, and vats that would hold dough after supper were empty. Rows of clean baking pans waited to be filled, and in the corner, two apprentice bakers slept in anticipation of the night's work ahead. Rudolph moved to another door, and they exited the bakery and crossed a small alley, 
to a room in a residence that Rue knew belonged to Rudolph's employer. Rudolph said, Wait here, and entered. A few moments later, Rosalind appeared at the door, a child upon her left hip. She gripped the door jam tightly while Rudolph stood behind her, offering her support. Eric, she half whispered. Rue? Eric smiled, and Rosalind stepped forward and put her right arm around his neck, hugging him fiercely. He held her gently, trying to be aware of the squirming baby, and then he realized she was crying. Here now, he said, softly pushing her away. None of that. I'm fine. I did the Prince of Crondor a service and was pardoned for my crime. Why didn't you send the word? She whispered harshly. Rue was surprised by the anger in her voice toward Eric, but Eric glanced at Rudolph, who nodded at the question. We couldn't, said Eric. He pointed to the crest on his tunic and said, I'm the prince's man now, sworn to his service, and I was under oath not to speak of my freedom since... He didn't want to bring up the rape and the trial in Condor. I left, but now I'm here. Rosalind's child started to squirm and complain, and she turned to calm the child. Shush, Gerd. Gerd, said Eric. It was my father's name, said Rudolph. Eric nodded as he looked at the little boy. Then his eyes widened, and Rue saw his knees go weak. Rue grabbed Eric's arm as he gripped the door jam. What? asked Rue. Then he looked again at the little boy. Realization hit him. Rudolph was a stocky short man with reddish-brown hair. There was nothing of him in this child's face. But from the expression that showed there, and the size of the child, he knew instantly what had occurred while he and Eric had been gone. Softly, Rue asked what Eric seemed unable to say. Stefan's? Rosalind nodded. Without taking her eyes from her foster brother's face, she said, Gerd's your nephew, Eric. Three. Bargains. The baby cried. Rue laughed as Eric quickly handed him back to Rosalind. He had offered to hold the boy, but the squirming youngster had had Eric looking overwhelmed in less than a minute. The mood in the room was guarded, a mix of happiness and apprehension. While everyone was pleased to see Rue and Eric alive and well, those in the tap room of the Inn of the Pintail knew that word of Eric's return would quickly reach his half-brother. The Prince of Crondor might have pardoned Rue and Eric for their crime against Eric's half-brother Stefan, but the surviving brother, Manfred, might not. And Stefan's mother certainly would not. There was a long leap between the letter of the law and its practice. When vengeful nobles were involved, everyone knew. Milo and Nathan motioned Rue aside, and Nathan said, Are you planning on staying long? Rue glanced to where Eric sat studying his nephew, fascinated by the little life before him. Eric mostly wanted to see his mother and you, he said to them. I've got some business. We'll be gone in a week or so. Nathan whispered, Better sooner than later, Rue. Rue nodded. I know. Matilda von Darkmoor. Milo put his finger alongside his nose and nodded once, indicating Rue was correct in his surmise. Rue said, But Frida threatened Matilda's boy's inheritance. You're telling everyone that the baby's Rudolph's, aren't you? Yes, said Nathan. But it's as plain as the nose on your face who his sire is, Rue said Milo, looking fondly across the room at his grandson. There are no secrets in this town. By now the Baron surely knows the baby exists. Rue shrugged. Maybe, but I overheard Manfred talking to Eric. When? demanded Nathan, his voice an anxious whisper. In the death zone, the night before we were to be hung. He came and told Eric there was no hard feelings. He said Stefan was a swine. Nathan shook his head. One thing to say that to a man you count dead the next day, another to a rival to the title of baron. Rue said, I don't think that's a problem. Manfred said there were other bastards, not just Eric. Seems the old baron loved the ladies. Milo nodded. That's truth. I hear there's a lad over in Wolfsheim who looks a lot like Eric. Well, said Nathan, see if you can't get Eric away as soon as possible. We'll do what we can to protect little Gerd, but if Eric's presence calls undue attention to the baby... I'll see what I can do, said Rue. I have business, and the sooner I get it done, the sooner we'll leave. Anything we can do to help? 
asked the smith. A calculating look entered Rue's eyes. Well, now that you mention it, I could use a reliable wagon, but one that's not too dear, you understand? Milo's eyes rolled heavenward, and Nathan laughed at the obvious ploy. Gaston's still the only place you're likely to find a wagon, said the smith. Eric glanced over to where his friend stood talking to the smith and the innkeeper, the three of them smiling while Nathan laughed at something Rue said, and shook his head with a smile of affection. Rue saw the gesture and returned it, as if to say, Yes, it's good to be home. Rue was out at first light, only slightly hungover, making his way to the outskirts of town. Gaston, he cried as he came into sight of his destination. The building was little more than a run-down barn, made over to a sort of storage building, with a small shed attached to the front. A sign hung over it, crudely painted hammers, crossed as if they were a noble's swords. As Rue reached the door to the shop, a head stuck out, and a narrow-faced man of indeterminate years regarded him. Avery, he exclaimed, half pleased, half irritated by his manner. Thought you hung, he observed. Rue stuck out his hand. Wasn't, he replied. Kind of obvious, returned the man named Gaston. He spoke with a slight accent, one common to those living in the smaller backwater towns in the province of Bastyra. But he had lived in Darkmoor since before Rue had been born. He shook Rue's hand and said, What you need? Rue said, Got a wagon? One out back for sale. She not much to look at, need a little work, but she sound. They walked around the building, a combination carpentry shed, tannery, and tinker shop. Gaston was master of no trade, but adept at fixing all manner of things and the only source of repair for those without sufficient funds to pay the local smiths and carpenters. If a poor farmer had a scythe that needed to last one more harvest, he brought it to Gaston. Not the forge, where Eric used to apprentice to old Tyndall, and then Nathan. Rue had heard Eric comment that Gaston might not be a fine smith, but he was solid on the basics, and Rue's father had always taken his wagons to Gaston for repair. They moved to a low fence, composed mostly from scraps of wood Gaston had found here and there, and Gaston opened the rickety gate. It swung open on stiff, loud hinges, and Rue entered the yard where Gaston stowed most of his property. Rue halted a moment and shook his head. He had been in the yard countless times. Nevertheless, he was amazed whenever he saw the colossal collection of refuse Gaston lay claim to. Scraps of metal, a shed full of cloth, and a huge covered stack of wood, all organized in a fashion known only to Gaston, but one which Rue knew was flawless. If Gaston had what you needed... He knew where it lay, and could put his hands on it in moments. Saw your papa. Where's he now? asked Rue, not entirely interested. Sleeping all drunk. He came back from a run down to Salador. Six or seven wagons, I don't remember, but they got there in good order and were paid a bonus, and he picked up a cargo and came back full, so he blew off a bit last night. Gaston hiked his thumb over his shoulder to a bundle of rags under one of two wagons nestled against the lee side of the barn. Rue went over and found the bundle was snoring. He recognized one of the two wagons as his father's. It was as familiar to Rue as his own pallet had been at home, and, truth to tell, he had slept in it about as often. When his father got into one of his drunken rages, Rue had often hidden under the canvas tie-down and slept the night there, rather than risk a pointless beating. Too drunk to walk three streets home, said Rue, kneeling and pulling back the topmost rag. The stench that struck him as he did made him wish he hadn't. Not only hadn't his father bathed in some time, his breath hit Rue full on as he snored in obvious stupor. Gack! Rue moved back a couple of steps. Gaston scratched his chin and said, We had a few, truth to tell. Tom was buying, so I wasn't going to leave him lying there in the streets. I bring him over here. I wasn't going to take him all the way home by then. Rue shook his head. Not likely. He regarded the snoring face of his father. The old man seemed smaller somehow. Rue wondered at that, but knew that he would seem large enough if he was awakened before he bestirred himself. Then Rue laughed. He wasn't a boy any longer, and his father hadn't towered over him in years. Rue wondered if his father tried to strike him again. Would he cower as a child would before an enraged parent? Or would he act without thought and break his father's jaw? Not willing to put that to the test, he said, We'll let him sleep. 
He probably didn't miss me when I was gone, so I doubt he'll be glad to see me now. Gaston said, you shouldn't go saying that, Ruth. He was right enough upset you were going to be hung. Said it more than once. Thought 30 years hard labor was fair, he said. Rue shook his head and changed the subject. The wagon? She be over there, said Gaston, pointing to the one that sat next to Rue's father's. It was a serviceable wagon, though in need of some repair and a lot of paint. Rue quickly inspected it, ensuring the axles and wheels were sound. He said, We need to replace some of the fittings on the tongue, but it'll do. How much? Gaston and Rue began haggling, and after a minute a deal was struck. It was slightly more than Rue wished to pay, but a fair price, and the wagon was exactly what he was looking for. He paid the money and said, Horses? Martin still be cheapest for sound animals, answered Gaston. Your papa got an extra team these days. Won them in a dice game last month. A calculating look crossed Rue's face, and he said, Thanks. That's good to know. Glancing at the snoring figure of his father, he said, If he wakes before I return, keep him here. I need to talk to him before I leave town. Rue started for the gate, and Gaston said, Where are you off to now? Growers in Vintners Hall. I have to buy some wine. He left the yard and made his way down the street as the town began to stir into the day's activities. Workers were already at their shops, and now those women heading out to purchase goods and food for their families were also about. Rue nodded in greeting at a few familiar faces, but mostly he was lost in thought about the next step in his plan for wealth. As he reached the town square, opposite the growers in Ventner's Hall, a clatter of hooves upon cobbles heralded the approach of riders, and from the sound, Rue knew they were coming fast. A moment later, the squad appeared around the corner of the very hall for which Rue was bound, five riders at a canter. The pedestrians scampered out of the way as the five men in the colors of the Baron of Darkmoor hurried by. Rue marked the leader, the same corporal they had encountered in Wilhelmsburg, and he knew instantly where they would eventually stop, Milo's Inn. Rue hesitated and decided against heading directly there. He had business to conduct, and besides, he was pretty sure this would be a matter between Eric and his half-brother Manfred. If the Baron needed to speak with Rue Avery, he could come looking for him after he finally found Eric. Rue entered the hall. Eric stood admiring the forge. Nathan and his apprentice, Gunther, were showing off the changes they had made since Eric had left. They were minor, but Eric made a point of admiring the boy's work. It was clear he doted on Nathan and had developed much the same attitude that Eric had toward the smith, that of a boy for a foster father. Nathan's own children had been killed in an almost forgotten war, and he took special pains to care for his apprentices. You look fit, said Nathan. You like the army? Eric said, there's much about it I don't like, but... Yes, I think I like the order, the sense of knowing what is expected of you. Nathan motioned with his head for Gunther to find some task to attend to, leaving them alone. And the killing? Eric shrugged. Not much. There are times when it's like hacking wood for the fire, something you must do. Other times I'm too scared to think. But mostly it's, I don't know, ugly. Nathan nodded. I've worked with a lot of soldiers in my day, Eric. Be cautious of those who enjoy the butchery. They serve when the fighting's hard, but they're like guard dogs. Better to keep them on a short leash most of the time. Eric looked at Nathan, and their eyes locked. Then Eric smiled. I promise I'll never get to liking it. Then you'll do, said Nathan, returning Eric's grin. Though you'd have been a fine smith, no doubt. Smithing is something I still enjoy. Maybe you'll let me turn a hand to some? Rue approached. Nathan! Eric! Eric said, How is this mysterious business deal of yours going? Just about finished, answered Rue with a grin. A couple of things more, and I'll be ready to go. He made a face. Besides, there are soldiers wandering around town looking for you. The sound of riders entering the inn's courtyard cut short Eric's reply. They left the forge and mounted the barn, entering the courtyard just as the baron's five guardsmen were getting ready to dismount. Eric recognized the leader, the corporal they had encountered two days before. You know, he said, pointing to Rue and Eric, the baron wants a word with you too. Rue rolled his eyes heavenward, patting his tunic pocket to ensure he still carried his royal pardon. Can't this wait? No. But I'll give you a choice. 
Ride your own horse, or I'll be happy to drag you behind him. Rue said, I'll get my horse. A few minutes later, Rue and Eric were mounted and rode past the squad. The corporal said, Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? They slowed to let the corporal overtake him. Then Eric said, You came cantering in, yet your horses are barely winded and none of them are sweating. So you rode less than a mile to fetch us. Manfred's camped in the old sheep meadow at the edge of town. The corporal looked astonished, but before he could speak, Eric put heels to his horse's barrel and was off at a canter. Rue was second behind. The squad followed suit, and soon the seven of them were hurrying through the town. A few minutes later, they passed through the buildings at the east edge of town, and as Eric had predicted, they found Manfred's field tent erected in the old sheep meadow where the King's Highway intersected the road south. Eric dismounted and tossed the reins to a guardsman standing near the entrance of the tent. As the five riders came up alongside, Eric regarded the corporal. What's your name? asked Eric. Alfred, said the corporal. Why? Eric smiled. I just wanted to know. Watch the horse. Rue and Eric moved to the tent, and one of the soldiers there drew aside the flap. Sitting inside was Eric's half-brother Manfred. I must confess I never thought I'd see you two again, said the baron, indicating they should sit, considering the circumstances of our last meeting. At the time, I thought the same, answered Eric. Rue studied the half-brothers. Manfred looked nothing like Eric. Eric was the mocking likeness of their father, the very fact of which had driven Manfred's mother to demand Eric's death over the murder of Stefan, her elder son. Manfred was his mother's son. He was dark, intense, and handsome in a nervous way. He wore a neatly trimmed beard, a new affectation, and Ruth thought it a little silly, though he kept that opinion to himself. My lord, the Duke of Salador, who, as you may know, is the king's cousin, has ordered me to send a squad of men to Crondor for special duty. No details of why or for how long are forthcoming. Do you know something about this? Eric nodded. Something? Will you tell me? I cannot. Cannot or will not? Both, said Eric. I am the prince's man and obey his injunctions against speaking before I'm bidden. Well, if you have no objections, I'd like them to return to Crondor with you and your friend. Eric sat back. An escort? Manfred smiled, and in that one expression there was a hint of the man who sired them both. In a manner of speaking, as you are the prince's man in this, I'll place them under your command. Being the dutiful soldier you are, I have no doubt you'll hurry to bring them safely to our most noble prince as quickly as possible. Eric leaned forward. If I could tell you, Manfred, I would. You will never know how much it meant to me for you to come see me in jail as you did. It was very kind of you. It made a difference. But when you finally do know why the prince is commanding this levy, you'll understand why I may not speak it now, and that it is of the utmost importance. Manfred sighed. Well, very good. I trust you'll not be lingering in Ravensburg, either of you. Eric raised an eyebrow. I'm bound to be back at Crondor within the month, but Rue is a free man and may choose to stay. Manfred smiled. He may choose what he wishes, but if your friend is wise, he'll quickly leave. He looked at Rue. My mother has not forgiven either of you, and while I will not seek to do either of you injury, I cannot protect you from her agents. If you wish to live to an old age... You better do it elsewhere. He leaned over toward Eric, lowering his voice, and lost his smile. You gain a significant protection by wearing that new tunic, Eric. Even here in sleepy Darkmoor, we know of the Eagle of Crondor. You're the prince's man's man. But your friend Rupert has no patronage and few friends. It's better for everyone if you take him with you. I'm getting a cargo together, and we'll be leaving in a couple of days with my cousin, said Rue. Manfred rose. See that you do. It would be well for you both not to be in town when my mother learns you are alive and back within her reach. Glancing at the two men, he said, Even in Crondor, watch your backs. What about the child? asked Eric. Manfred said, Mother still doesn't know of his existence, and I would like to see it kept that way for as long as possible. He looked troubled. It's a bit of a different story here than it was with you, Eric. 
The boy is Stefan's baby, not her philandering husband's. It's her own grandson. But he's a bastard. And as I have yet to wed... Understood. Your presence in Ravensburg might push her to side against the child. Have you considered that? Eric shrugged. Not in that fashion. Truth to tell, Manfred, I've not been much of a thinker the last two years. Too much to do. Not enough time to ponder. Manfred shook his head and said, You've changed. You were the town lad when we met, and now you're a harder man, Eric. Eric studied his brother's face. I think we both are. Manfred rose and said, I'm out hunting, so I'd better have something to show Mother when I return this evening to the castle. Be about your business and expect the levy to appear tomorrow at that inn you called home. Eric followed the baron outside. One of these days I hope we can meet under more favorable circumstances. Manfred laughed, and again the resemblance showed itself. I doubt it. Our fortunes and fates are very different, brother. As long as you live, and I have no children, Mother sees you as a threat to her line. It's that simple. Dryly, Rue said, Then get married and have some. Manfred said, Would that it were that simple. I serve at the king's pleasure and my Duke of Salador's whim. They have yet to indicate to me which noble daughter would prove suitable wife material. He sighed slightly, but Eric noticed. And truth to tell, I haven't pressed them to decide. I find the company of women difficult. Is there someone? Yes, Eric, suddenly sensing that his half-brother, mostly a stranger to him, barely held some sorrow in check. Manfred's manner turned neutral. Nothing of which I choose to speak. Eric had nothing more to say, and his brother didn't offer his hand. Eric saluted and started back to where his horse waited. Rue headed toward the tent flap. With a quick move, Eric turned back toward his brother. That corporal, Alfred. What of him? Send him with the levy. Manfred shook his head and smiled slightly. You have an account with him? Of sorts, said Eric. Manfred shrugged. There's not much to recommend the man. He's a brawler. He'll never make sergeant because of it. You have a need for brawlers, said Eric. Once they're broken of brawling, they're the kind of men we need. You can have him. Turning back into the tent, Manfred vanished. Lou and Eric returned to their horses and mounted. Eric looked down at Alfred and said, Fare you well, Corporal. We'll meet again, bastard said Alfred with a baleful stare. Oh, count on it. Eric returned the dark look. Rue added with an evil smile, Sooner than you think. With heels to their mounts, Rue and Eric left the soldiers behind and returned to Ravensburg. And I'm telling you that if you put any more on that wagon, you're going to break an axle, shouted Tom Avery. Rue stood nose to nose with his father, who was only slightly taller than his son, and after a moment said, You're right. Tom blinked, then nodded once, curtly saying, Of course I'm right. The two wagons sat in the yard behind Gaston's shop, loaded with small barrels of wine. Duncan inspected each tie down carefully for the third or fourth time, and looked dubious about the prospect of so many barrels of wine remaining secure. Rue had spent the day conducting business, spending every coin he had as well as what Eric had given him in purchasing a modest quality wine that, he hoped, would realize him a significant profit once it reached Crondor. While not an expert on wine, Rue was a child of Ravensburg and knew more about it than most merchants in Crondor. He knew that the high cost of wine in the Prince's City was due to the cost of shipping it bottled. Only the most common bulk wine came otherwise, shipped in large barrels but the smaller barrels of modest quality wine used in the tap rooms in the area were never shipped much farther away than a neighboring village because the wine commanded little profit in an area where high quality wine was taken for granted. While still not as fine as the great wines served to the nobility, this wine would stand out in Crondor's common inns. Rue had shrewdly purchased wines he knew to be a cut or two above the quality of what he had drunk in the Prince's City, 
Rue calculated that if he could get the inns and taverns frequented by the businessmen of the merchant's quarter to buy his wine, he could realize as much as a threefold profit on this venture, including the cost of wagons and horses. Duncan said, You sure you know how to drive this thing? Tom wheeled to face his nephew and said, Rue's a first-rate teamster, as you'd have been had you not run off after that girl. Duncan smiled in remembrance. Alice, he supplied. That didn't last long. Besides, he put his hand upon the pommel of his sword. This is how I earned my living for the last fifteen years. Well, we'll need it, said Tom, rubbing his chin. It was the spot Rue had hit him when the old man had come awake and started to bully his son. Three times he had tried to lay hands on the boy, and three times had found himself in the dust, looking up at his son. The last time Rue had punctuated his lack of patience for this conflict with a stiff right jab to the old man's face. After that, Tom Avery looked on his son with a newfound respect. Turning to Rue, he said, You sure you know your way along this road you told me of? Rue nodded. It was a back country road, little more than a trail in places, where he and Eric had encountered Helmut Grindle, a trader from Crondor. Rue had learned there was a way from Ravensburg to Crondor that was passable without having to pay toll on the King's Highway. Eric had papers from the prince which had saved them any charges on the way to Ravensburg, but Eric and his company of levies from Darkmoor had left that morning for Crondor, and they would be in the prince's city a week before the slow-moving wagons would arrive. Rue knew that the wagons were loaded to capacity, and that any trouble would leave half his cargo stuck in the backwoods between Darkmoor and the coast. But if his plan worked, he'd have enough capital for something more audacious, and he was sure he could make enough on this one journey to get his career fairly launched. Well, said Rue, no reason to linger. The sooner started, the sooner finished. He said nothing of Manfred's warning about his mother's vengeance. He didn't trust Duncan enough to count on his staying close by, should he learn that a noble might be sending agents after Rue. His father, he knew, could be trusted to drive his wagon. Say what you might about Tom Avery, he was steadfast in his work when sober. But in a fight, he would be useless, no matter what bluster and boasting he indulged himself in when drunk. Ride with me, Rue said to Duncan. I'll reacquaint you with driving a team. Duncan rolled his eyes heavenward, but climbed aboard. He had sold his horse for a small price, which earned him a share in Rue's venture, and now was a minority owner of one wagon, four horses, and a great deal of wine. Rue's father had insisted only on his usual fees, not a coin more or less, which silently pleased Rue. He enjoyed his father's treating him as he would any other trader. Gaston waved farewell as they rolled through the gate out of his yard and turned down the cobbles of Ravensburg. The wagons creaked and groaned under the weight, and the horses snorted at being asked to work, but they were underway, and Rue felt a keen sense of anticipation. Try not to get yourself killed, called out Gaston as the gate shut. Rue ducked behind the wagon as another arrow sped through the space he had just occupied. The first had struck inches from his head. He yelled a warning to his father and Duncan as he scrambled under the wagon, drawing his sword and trying to ascertain from where the arrow had come. A third shaft emerged from the evening gloom, and he marked where he judged it had originated. He signaled to Duncan that he was going to back between the wagons and move in a circle around the ambushers. Duncan signaled, he understood, and motioned around the campsite, indicating he should be wary of other attackers. They had been on the road for almost a week, having left the King's Highway just west of Ravensburg and making their way across open country to the small westward trail road Rue and Eric had used when fleeing the area two years earlier. The travel had been uneventful, and the wagons were proving sturdy and the horses sound, which had contributed to Rue's increasing optimism as the days passed. If his father had judged him daft for picking a large, unwieldy cargo, he kept his opinion to himself. He was an old teamster and had driven stranger cargo than dozens of small wine casks before. They camped each night at sundown, letting the horses graze along a picket, supplementing the grass with a small amount of grain mixed with honey and nuts which kept them fit and energetic. Each day Rue used what knowledge of horses he possessed to check their soundness, and more than once he had silently wished for Eric's presence, as he would find anything that Rue might miss. But Rue had been astonished to discover that his father knew as much as Eric, 
at least on the subject of draft animals, and each day the old man inspected right alongside his son, and each day he judged the animals fit to continue the journey. Now Rue crab-crawled on elbows and knees, turning as he moved between the wagons, and when he had the wagons between himself and the source of the arrow fire, he stood and ran into the woods. Only two years of combat and intense training saved his life, for another bandit had moved opposite the first and tried to impale Rue on his sword point. The only thing he accomplished was to die silently. Rue hardly broke stride as he ran him through, dodging sideways into the dark woods in case there was another bandit close by. Silence greeted him as he paused to consider his next move. He slowed his breathing and looked around. The sun had set less than an hour before, and the sky to the west might still hold some glow, but under the thick trees it could have been midnight. Rue listened. A moment later he heard another arrow flight, and he moved. Circling as quietly as he could through the darkness, he ran swiftly to the place where he thought the bowmen might be hiding. At this point he was convinced he was being besieged by a pair of poor bandits, trying to pick off the two guards so they could plunder whatever cargo ventured along the small road far from the king's justice. Rue waited. After a few more moments of silence, he heard someone stirring in the brush ahead of him, and he acted. As quick as a cat on a mouse, he was through the brush and on top of the other bandit. The struggle was quickly over. The man attempted to drop his bow and pull a knife when he sensed Rue's approach from behind. The man died before the knife was out of his belt. It's over, said Rue. A moment later, Duncan and Tom appeared, wraith-like in the gloom. Just two of them? asked Duncan. If there's another, he's halfway to Crondor, said Tom. He had obviously fallen hard, as he was dirty from boot to the top of his head on his left side, and he had a bruise on his left cheek. He held his right arm across his chest, holding tight to his left biceps, and flexed the fingers of his left hand. What's the matter? asked Rue. Fell damn hard on this arm, I guess, answered his father. It's all tingly and numb. He seemed short of breath as he spoke. Blowing out a long note, he added, some time of it that was. Not ashamed to admit I was scared for a bit. Duncan knelt and rolled over the bandit. This one looks like a rag picker, he said. Few honest traders and only a few more dishonest ones brave this route, said Tom. Never been a rich outlaw I heard of, and certainly not around here. He shook his hand as if trying to wake up a sleeping limb. Duncan came away with a purse. He might not have been rich, but he wasn't coinless, either. He opened the purse and found a few copper coins and a single stone. Walking back into the light of the campfire, he knelt to inspect the gem. Nothing fancy, but it'll fetch a coin or two. Rue said, Better see if the other one is dead. He found the first man he had encountered lying face down in the mud, and when he rolled him over, discovered a boy's face on the corpse. Shaking his head in disgust, Rue quickly found the boy without even the rude leather pouch the other bandit had possessed. He returned to the wagons as Duncan put down the bow he had taken from the first bandit. Pretty poor, he said, tossing it aside. Ran out of arrows. Rue sat down with an audible sigh. What do you think they'd be doing with all this wine? asked Duncan. Probably drink a bit, said Tom. But it was the horses and whatever coin we carry, and the swords you have, and anything else they could sell. Duncan said, Will you bury them? Rue shook his head. They'd not have done the same for us. Besides, we've no shovel, and I'm not about to dig their graves with my hands. He sighed. If they'd been proper bandits, we'd have been feeding the crows tomorrow instead of them. Better keep alert, Duncan said. Well, then, I'm turning in. Tom and Rue sat before the fire. Because of his age, Rue and Duncan allowed Tom the first watch. The man with the second had it roughest, having to awake for a few hours in the dark, then turn in again. Rue also knew that dawn was the most dangerous time for attack, as guards were the sleepiest and least alert, and anyone contemplating a serious assault would wait for just before sunrise. Chances were near certain if Tom had morning watch. Should trouble come, he'd be sound asleep when he died. Tom said, had a stone like that one Duncan's got once. Rue said nothing. His father rarely talked to him, a habit that had developed in childhood. Rupert had traveled with his father many times as a boy, learning the teamster's trade, but on the longest of those journeys, from Ravensburg to Salador and back, he rarely had more than ten words for the boy. 
When at home, Tom drank to excess. And when working, remained sober but stoic. I got it for your mother, said Tom quietly. Rue was riveted. If Tom was a quiet man when sober, he was always silent about Rue's mother, sober or drunk. Rue knew what he did about his mother from others in the village, for she had died in childbirth. She was a tiny thing, said Tom. Rue knew his diminutive status was a legacy from his mother. Eric's mother had mentioned that more than once. But strong, said Tom. Rue found that surprising. She had a tough grit to her, continued Tom, his eyes shining in the firelight. You look like her, you know. He held his right arm across his chest, clutching his left arm, which he massaged absently. He peered into the fire as if seeking something in the dancing flame. Rue nodded, afraid to speak. Since he had struck his father, knocking him to the ground, the old man had treated him with a deference Rue had never experienced before. Tom sighed. She wanted you, boy. The healing priest told her it would be chancy, with her being so tiny. He wiped his right hand over his face, then looked at his own hands, large, oft-scarred and calloused. I was afraid to touch her, you know, with her being so small and me having no gentleness in me. I was afraid I'd break her. But she was tougher than she looked. Rue swallowed, suddenly finding it hard to speak. He finally whispered, You never speak of her. Tom nodded. I had so little joy in this life, boy. And she was every bit of it. I met her at a festival, and she looked like this shy bird of a thing, standing on the edge of the crowd at the Feast of Midsummer. I had just come up from Salador, driving a wagon for my uncle, Duncan's grandfather. I was half drunk and full of myself, and then she was right there before me, bold as bright brass, and she says, dance with me. He sighed, and I did. He was silent a while. He hugged himself, and his breath seemed labored, and he had to swallow hard to speak. She had that same look you do, not fetching, with her thin face and uneven teeth, until she smiled. Then she lit up and was beautiful. I got her that stone I was speaking of for our wedding. Had it set in a ring for her. Like a noble, said Rue, forcing his voice to a lighter tone. Like the queen herself, Tom answered with a shallow laugh. He swallowed hard. She said I was mad and should sell it for a new wagon, but I insisted she keep it. You never told me said Rue softly. Tom shrugged and was silent. He took a deep breath, then said, You're a man now. Showed me that when I woke to find you standing over me at Gaston's. Never thought you'd amount to much, but you're a shrewd one. And if you can beat the king's own hangman and learn to handle yourself so I can't bully you, why, I figure you'll turn out all right down the road. Tom smiled slightly and said, you're like her, that way. You're tougher than you look. Rue sat in silence a minute, not knowing what to say. Then after a bit he said, Why don't you turn in, Father? I have some thinking to do. Tom nodded. I think I will. Got a pain in my neck. He moved his left shoulder as if to loosen tight muscles. Must have really twisted it, hitting the ground when those lads started shooting arrows at us. Hurts from my wrist to my jaw. He wiped the perspiration from his brow. Broke a bit of sweat, too. He sucked in a large breath and blew it out, as if just standing had been exertion. Getting too old for this. And you get rich. You remember your old father. Hear me, Rue? Rue started to smile and say something when his father's eyes rolled up into his head and he fell forward, face down, into the fire. Rue yelled, Duncan! And with a single move, yanked his father out of the flames. Duncan was over in an instant and saw the waxy pallor of Tom's face, the white eyes and smoldering burns on his cheek and neck. He knelt next to Rue, then said, He's dead. Rue remained motionless as he silently regarded the man who had been his father and who had died still a stranger to him. Four. Setback. 
Rue signaled. Duncan reined in the second wagon, coming to a halt behind the first. Rue turned, stood, and shouted, Crondor! They had been traveling this way since burying Tom in a grave Rue had dug with his bare hands, covering him with stones to keep scavengers away. Duncan had become a fair driver. He had remembered a few things taught to him by Tom when he was a boy, and Rue had increased his skill until he no longer had to spend every minute worrying about the second wagon and its cargo. Rue was still troubled by his father's death. He couldn't escape the feeling that he had glimpsed something in his father when he had been speaking about Rue's mother. Rue knew there was a great deal about his own history he didn't understand. His father had always been an aloof man when sober and abusive when drunk, and in part Rue now understood why. Each time Tom looked at his son, he saw a reminder of the wife he had loved beyond measure, taken from him at Rue's birth. But there had been more, and Rue now had dozens of questions, none of which his father would ever answer. He vowed to return to Ravensburg and try to find those few people in the town Tom might have called friend to ask them those questions. Perhaps he might travel to Salador to visit with Duncan's branch of the family. But he wanted answers. Suddenly, Rue had been made aware that he really didn't know who he was. Pushing aside that thought, he insisted to himself it wasn't as important who one is as who one becomes, and he was determined to become a rich, respected man. Duncan tied off the reins and jumped down from his wagon, walking to where Rue stood. Rue had come to like his cousin, though there was still the rogue in his manner, and Duncan didn't bring out any strong sense of trust, the way Rue trusted Eric or the other men he had served with under Callus. But he liked the man and thought he might be useful, for he had enough experience with nobility to tutor Rue in manners and fashion. Duncan climbed up on the first wagon and looked at the distant city. We're going in tonight? he asked. Rue glanced at the setting sun and said, I don't think so. I'd have to find a stable yard to house this wine until we could move out in the morning. We're still more than an hour from the gate now. Let's make a camp and we'll head in at first light, try to sell some of this before the inns get too busy. They made camp and ate a cold meal before a small fire, while the horses, tied in a long picket, grazed along the roadside. Rue had given them the last of the grain, and they were making satisfied noises. What are you going to do with the wagons? asked Duncan. Sell them, I think. Rue wasn't sure if he wanted to depend on other shippers, but he didn't think his time was best spent actually driving the wagons back and forth between Ravensburg and Crondor. I'll maybe hire a driver and send you back for another load after we sell off this lot. Duncan shrugged. Not much by way of excitement, unless you count those two hapless boy bandits. Rue said, One of those boy bandits almost put an arrow through my head. He tapped the side of his skull. If you remember. There is that, Duncan sighed. I mean by way of women and drink. We'll have some of that tomorrow night. Rue glanced around. Turn in. I'll take the first watch. Duncan yawned. I won't argue. Rue sat by the fire as his cousin grabbed a blanket and crawled under one of the wagons to protect himself from the dew that would form during the night. This close to the ocean, it wasn't a possibility, it was a certainty, and waking up wet wasn't either man's idea of a pleasant way to start the day. Rue considered what he would do first in the morning and made up several speeches, rehearsing each and discarding this phrase or that as he tried to determine which sales pitch would work best. He had never been a focused thinker in his youth, but so much was riding on his doing well that he became lost in his thinking and didn't realize how much time had passed until he noticed the fire burning down. He considered waking Duncan, but decided instead to reconsider some of his sales pitch and just stuck some more wood in the fire. He was still practicing his pitch when the lightning sky finally took his attention from the now merely glowing embers of the fire, and he shook himself out of his half-daze, half-dreaming, and he realized that he had not truly slept all night. But he was too filled with excitement and too ready to rush forward into his new life, and he figured Duncan wouldn't object to the extra rest. He rose and found his knees stiff from sitting in the damp, cool night air without moving for hours. His hair was damp, and dew shone upon his cloak as he shook it out. Duncan! he yelled, rousing his cousin. We've got wine to sell! The wagons clattered over the cobbles of Crondor streets. Rue indicated Duncan should pull up behind him over to one side, allowing some room for traffic to pass on the narrow side street. 
He had picked out his first stop, a modest inn named the Happy Jumper, near the edge of the merchant's quarter. The sign was of a pair of children turning a rope for a third who was suspended in midair over it. Rue pushed open the door and found a quiet common room, with a large man behind the bar cleaning glasses. Sir? the barman asked. Are you the proprietor? asked Rue. Alistair Rivers at your disposal. How may I be of service? He was a portly man, but under the fat, Rue detected strength. Most innkeepers had to have some means of enforcing order. His manner was polite, but distant, until he knew the nature of Rue's business. Rupert Avery, said Rue, sticking out his hand. Wine merchant in from Ravensburg. The man shook his hand in a perfunctory manner and said, You need rooms? No, I have wine to sell. The man's expression showed a decided lack of enthusiasm. I have all the wine I need, thank you. Rue said, But of what quality and character? The man looked down his nose at Rue and said, Make your pitch. I was born in Ravensburg, sir, began Rue. And then he launched into a brief comparison of the bounties of that small town's wine craft and what was commonly drunk in Crondor's more modest establishments. At the end of his pitch, he said, The service to Crondor has either been bulk wine for the common man or impossibly priced wine for the nobles, but nothing for the merchant catering to a quality clientele until now. I can provide wine of superior quality at bulk prices because I don't transport the bottles. The man was silent a minute. You have a sample? he asked at last. Outside, said Rue, and he hurried out to fetch down a sample cask he had filled before leaving Ravensburg. Returning inside, he found a pair of glasses on the bar. He pulled the cork, and as he filled the two glasses with a taste, he said, It's a bit shocked, having rolled in this very morning off the road, but give it a week or two to rest before you serve it, and you'll have more business than any other inn in the area. The man looked unconvinced, but he tasted he rolled the wine around his palate, then spit it into a bucket, while Rue did the same. Alistair was quiet again, then said, It's not bad. A little jumbled, as you said, from the road, but there's some structure there, and abundant fruit. Most of my customers won't know it from the usual plonk, but I do have a few businessmen who frequent my establishment who might find this diverting. I might be interested in a half-dozen barrels. What is your price? Rue paused and quoted a price he knew to be three times what he would accept, and only fifteen percent below what the finest noble wines from Ravensburg would fetch. Alastair blinked, then said, Why not burn my inn to the ground and have done with it? You'll ruin me far quicker. He offered a price that was a few coppers less per barrel than what Rue had paid in Ravensburg. Then they began haggling in earnest. They were waiting for Rue when he came out of the third inn an hour after midday. His first two negotiations had proven profitable, earning him more than he had anticipated. He had gotten about ten percent higher a price from Alistair Rivers than he had hoped for, which had made him bargain harder at the Inn of Many Stars. His final price had been within coppers of what he had sold wine to Alistair for, so he knew what he was likely to get at the Dog and Fox Tavern. He had concluded his negotiations in quick order, and as he came out of the dog and fox, he said, Duncan, we need to unload five barrels. Then he halted. Duncan moved his head slightly to indicate the man sitting close to him on the wagon, who had a dagger point in Duncan's ribs, though you had to look to notice it. To passers-by, it appeared he was merely having a quiet conversation with the driver of the wagon. Another man stepped up and said, You the owner of these wagons? Rue nodded once as he studied the man. He was rangy to the point of gauntness, but there was quickness and danger in his movements. Rue saw no weapons in the man's hands, but guessed there was more than one of them secreted on him with an easy reach. His narrow face was covered by a two- or three-day growth of beard, and gray-shot, raggedly-cut black hair hung loosely about his forehead and neck. We was noticing you driving around and making deliveries. Wondered if you were new to Condor. Rue glanced from the man's face to the man next to Duncan, then looked around to see if the two were alone. A couple of others lingered in close proximity to the wagons, men who could aid their companions in moments without calling attention to themselves until needed. Rue said, Been here before, but just rolled into the city this morning. Ah, said the man, his voice surprisingly deep for one so thin. 
Well, then you'd not be knowing about the local licenses and duties, would you? Rue's gaze narrowed. We declared our cargo at the gate to the Prince's Magistrate, and nothing was said about licenses and duties. Well, these aren't the Prince's licenses and duties, in a manner of speaking. The man lowered his voice so he would not be overheard. There are ways to do business in the city, and there are other ways, if you catch my drift. We represent interests that would seek to keep you from encountering difficulties in Grandor, if you follow me. Rue leaned against the back of the wagon, attempting to look casual, while judging how fast he could kill this man if needs be, and what chance Duncan stood of disarming the man who held a dagger on him. Of the first, he was confident. He could kill this man before his companions could take two steps in his aid. But Duncan didn't have Rue's combat training, and while a competent swordsman, he would probably die. Rue said, I'm very stupid today. Pretend I don't know anything and educate me. The man said, well, There are those of us in Crondor who like to make sure the daily commerce of the city goes undisturbed, if you see what I mean. We don't care much for unseemly price wars and large fluctuations between supply and demand. Toward that end, we make sure that everything coming into the city has a reasonable profit, so that no one has too much an advantage, don't you see? Keeps things civilized. We also keep thugs from roughing up merchants and destroying property, as well as make sure that a man can sleep in his bed at night without fear of having his throat cut, don't you see? Now, to that end, we expect a compensation for our work. Rue said, I see. How much? For your cargo, it would be twenty golden sovereigns. Rue's eyes widened. For each wagon. That was easily close to one half his expected profit on this cargo alone. His outrage couldn't be kept below the surface. Are you mad? Twenty sovereigns! He took a quick step back and said, I think not. The man took a step after Rue, which he had anticipated, saying, If you want your friend there to stay help. Suddenly Rue had his sword out and at the man's throat before he could move away. The man was quick and tried to move back, but Rue followed, keeping the point of his sword touching skin. Ah, uh -uh, said Rue. Don't move too quickly. I might slip and then you'd get blood over everything. If your friend doesn't get his dagger out of my cousin's ribs, or if either one of those two men across the street makes the wrong move, you're sucking wind through a new hole. Hold on, shouted the man. Then, glancing sideways without moving his head, he shouted, Bert, get down. The man next to Duncan got down without question, while the man whom Rue held at sword's point said, You're making a big mistake. If I am, it's not the first, said Rue. Cross the sagacious man, and it's the last, said the would-be extortionist. Sagacious man, said Rue. Who would that be? Someone important in this city, answered the thin man. We'll mark this a misunderstanding, and you ask about. But when we come back tomorrow, I'll expect better manners from you. He motioned for his two distant companions to leave, and they quickly darted into the midday crush of people. Other pedestrians had stopped to watch the display of one man holding another at sword's point, and it was obvious the thin man didn't care for the scrutiny. A merchant looked out from his shop and started shouting for a city constable. Glancing at Rue, the man said, If I'm handed over to the city watch, you're in even bigger trouble than you might be already. He licked his lips nervously. A shrill whistle sounded a block away, and Rue dropped his sword's point, and the man ducked away, vanishing into the crowd. What was that? asked Duncan. Shake down, Duncan said. Mockers. Mockers? Guild of Thieves, supplied to Duncan as he patted his ribs to make sure they were still intact. I expect. He mentioned someone called the Sagacious Man. That's the Mockers without a doubt. You can't do business in a city like Crondor without having to pay off someone. Rue climbed aboard his own wagon and said, Damn me if I will. If Duncan had an answer, Rude didn't hear it as he untied the rope holding down the barrels and lowered the drop gate. A shout and men running down the street caused Rue to glance past the wagon to where members of the city watch, wearing blue tunics and carrying large billy clubs, paused to see the merchant pointing at Rue. Rue swore under his breath. The constable approached and said, That gentleman tells me you was dueling in the street. Rue tossed a rope to Duncan. Dueling? Me? 
Sorry, but he's mistaken. I'm just unloading wine for this inn. He turned his chin toward the inn as Duncan came down to help get the barrels off the top of the wagon. Well, then, said the constable, obviously unwilling to go searching for trouble when it was so abundant in Grandor. Just see it stays that way. He motioned for his partner, and they returned the way they came. Duncan said, Some things never change. Unless I miss my bet, those two will be back in whatever pastry shop they were in when the whistle blew. Rue laughed. They lowered the five barrels to the street, and Rue convinced the innkeeper to send a worker to help Duncan carry them inside, so Rue could protect the wagons while the wine was delivered. After the remaining cargo was secured, they took reins and moved on to the next tavern. At sundown, they had sold close to a third of the wine Rue had purchased in Ravensburg. More, they had recouped almost all the gold Rue had spent. Rue calculated that he stood to triple his money if business the next day or so was as brisk as it had been so far. Where do we spend the night? asked Duncan. And when do we eat? I'm starving. Rue said, Let us find an inn with a good-sized yard so we can guard this wine against our friends. Duncan nodded, knowing full well whom Rue meant. They were in an area of the city unknown to Duncan, who had been to Crondor a number of times over the years, and from the wares displayed in the shop windows as they passed, not a terribly prosperous one. Rue said, Let's go around the block and head back the way we came. I think we're leaving prosperity behind if we continue on this way. Duncan nodded and watched as Rue headed his team out into the traffic of the road. The street was full of travelers as those finished with the day's work headed home, or to a local tavern or shop. Some shops were being shuttered, while others were lighting lanterns, indicating their proprietors were staying open past dark for those customers who could only shop in the evening. They moved slowly through the press, and Rue turned right into another street, and Duncan followed. It took them almost an hour to find an inn with a stable area big enough to accommodate their wagons behind locked gates. Rue made arrangements with the stable boy, took his sample cask, and led Duncan inside. The inn was known as the Seven Flowers, and it was a modest establishment catering to merchants and workers equally. Rue found a table near the bar and indicated Duncan should take a seat. He spied an interesting-looking barmaid, a little long in the face, but with an ample spread of bosom and hip, and he said, "'When you have a minute, if you bring us both a tankard of ale and dinner?' He indicated the table where Duncan sat. The woman looked at the handsome Duncan, and her smile betrayed her interest. Rue found his eyes fixed upon the woman's bosom where it strained against the fabric of her dress, and said, "'And if you're free at the end of the evening, join us.' He tried his best to look charming, and the remark got him a neutral expression and a non-committal noise. "'Where's the owner?' asked Rue. She indicated a heavy-set man at the far end of the bar, and Rue made his way through a half-dozen customers and started his pitch. After providing samples of his wine and arguing price, Rue arrived at a price with the owner of the inn, including a night's lodging and food, and returned to the table. The food was average, but ample, and after weeks on the trail, tasted wonderful. The ale was also average, but cold and plentiful. After the meal, when business had thinned, Duncan started working his charms on the serving girl, a woman of middle years named Jean. Another barmaid, a thin young woman named Betsy, joined them and somehow ended up sitting in Rue's lap. Either Duncan was terribly funny in his storytelling, or the ale gave everyone a more forgiving sense of humor. A couple of times the innkeeper had had to come over and order his barmaids back to work, but as the evening wore on, the two women had found their way back to Rue and Duncan's company. The pairing was obvious. Duncan had captured the attention of both women, but Jean, the more attractive of the two, had staked her claim early on, while Betsy was content to spend her time with Rue's hand fondling her. Rue didn't know if the girl really liked him or expected recompense, but he didn't care. The soft heat of flesh under cloth had him aroused, and after a while he said, Let's go upstairs. The girl said nothing, but rose and took his hand and led him upstairs. In his drunken state he didn't remember hearing Duncan and Jean entering the room with them, but soon he was lost in the feel, smell, taste, and heat of being with a woman. He was vaguely aware of Duncan and Jean on the pallet next to the one he shared with Betsy, but he ignored them. He had been with whores in camp less than a hand's breadth from other soldiers, so he thought nothing of it. He got out of his clothing and got Betsy out of hers in quick order, and was lost in passion when a shout came from outside, followed by the sound of cracking wood. 
He almost didn't notice it at first, but another crack followed, and suddenly, before thought was his, he was on his feet, pulling his sword from the scabbard, yelling, Duncan! Naked, Rue raced down the stairs and into the common room. Deserted and dark, the room was an obstacle course as Rue tried to get to the inn's courtyard door without laming himself on a chair or table. Duncan's oaths from behind told Rue he wasn't alone in his drunken difficulties. Rue found the door, pulled it open, and hurried toward the stable where his horses were being cared for and his wagons were housed. His feet encountered wetness as his nose greeted him with a familiar aroma. Wine. He entered the dark barn cautiously, his intoxication gone with a rush of battle readiness. Duncan overtook him, and Rue gripped his cousin by the arm, signaling in the dark to move to the side of the barn aisle. Something was wrong, and Rue couldn't put his finger on what that was until he saw the first horse. The animal lay on the ground, blood pooling from its neck. Quickly he took an inventory and found all four of his horses had been killed, their necks cut in exactly the right place to bleed them as fast as possible. "'Oh, damn!' said Duncan, and Rue hurried to find the stable boy lying in his own blood. They dashed to the wagons and found that every barrel had been stove in or had the bung pulled, so that wine flooded the courtyard. The cracking of wood that Rue had heard had been someone using a large hammer on the spokes of the wheels, so that the wagons were now useless without expensive repair. The innkeeper came hurrying across the courtyard when he saw the two naked men holding their swords. "'What's afoot?' he asked, halting, as if afraid to approach these two strange apparitions any more closely. From his nightshirt it was clear he had turned in. "'Someone's killed your stable boy and my horses, and ruined my wagons and cargo,' said Rue. Abruptly a scream cut the night, and Rue was running past the innkeeper before Duncan could react. Rue almost flew through the door to the inn, banging against a table, and took the stairs two at a time. He reached the room he and Duncan shared, and took a half-step in, his sword leveled. He faltered as Duncan came running up the stairs. Duncan looked over the shoulder of his shorter cousin, and again he said, Dan! Jean and Betsy lay nude upon the two pallets, their vacant gaze telling both men they were dead before the men could see the dark spreading stains flowing from where their throats had been cut. Whoever had come through the window had taken the two women from behind, killing them quickly and pulling them back on the mats. Rue was suddenly aware he was standing in something sticky and warm, and realized the women had probably come to the door after the men had raced out, only to die before they realized someone had entered the room from the window. Then Rue realized his clothing was strewn around the room. He quickly searched, and as the innkeeper arrived, Rue looked at Duncan and said, They took the gold. Duncan seemed almost to go limp as he leaned against the door jamb. Jam, he said for a third time. The constable of the city watch was obviously anxious to be done with his investigation. He looked at the dead horses and the dead stable boy, and went into the inn to inspect the dead barmaids, and then asked Rue and Duncan a few questions. It was also obvious that he knew the mockers were involved, and this would be reported in as an unsolved crime. Unless someone was caught in the act, finding criminals and proving guilt was a rare event in a city the size of the capital of the Western Realm. As the constable left, he instructed them to report anything they discovered that might help solve the crime to the office of the city watch at the palace. The innkeeper was devastated by the death of his three employees, and voiced his fear that he was somehow slated to join them. He ordered Rue and Duncan out of his inn at first light, and then barricaded himself in his room. As the dawn came, Rue and Duncan walked out of the courtyard of the Inn of the Seven Flowers. The early morning press of business hadn't begun, but already workers were moving toward their places of employment. As they entered the street, Duncan asked, "'What now?' Rue said, "'I don't know.' He inhaled as he spied a familiar figure across the street. Lounging against the wall of the building opposite them was the thin man from the day before. Rue crossed the street, almost knocking down a hurrying workman, and as he reached the man he heard him say, "'Quietly now, stranger, else my friends will have to shoot you.' Duncan overtook Rue in time to hear the remark, and spun around, looking for the bowman, on the rooftop above, a bowman had an arrow drawn hard against his cheek, aimed in their direction. The thin man said, I expect now you understand just the sort of troubles we can protect you from, don't you? If I thought I stood a chance of not getting my cousin shot in the bargain, said Rue, his anger barely held in check, I'd cut your liver out right now. Like to see you try, said the thin man. You caught me by surprise yesterday, but it would never happen again. 
He then smiled, and there was nothing friendly in the expression. Besides, there's nothing personal in this, lad. It's only business. Next time you seek to do business in Crondor, let those who can help you... Help you? Why did you kill the boy and the girls? Asked Rue. Kill? Me? I don't know what you're talking about, said the man. Ask anyone, and they'll tell you that Sam Tannerson was playing poker at Mama Jamila's in the poor quarter all night long. Did someone go and get themselves killed? He made a signal and moved away, saying, When you're ready to try doing business again, ask around. Sam Tannerson isn't hard to find, and he's always willing to help. He moved quickly off into the press of traffic and vanished from sight. After a moment, Rue asked again, Why did they kill the girls and the stable boy? Duncan said, My guess is that if you're too stubborn to pay them, they're making sure everyone else knows the price of doing business with you. Rue said, I've only felt more helpless once in my life, and that was when they were about to hang me. Duncan had heard the story of how Rue and his friend Eric had been reprieved from the gallows after a mock hanging. Well, you may not be dead, as they say, but what will we do? Rue said, start over. What else is there to do? Then he added, but first we head for the palace and the office of the city watch. What for? To tell them we know the name of the man who was behind this, Sam Tannerson. Do you think that's his real name? Probably not, said Rue, as he turned in the direction of the palace. But it's the one he uses, and it will do. Duncan shrugged. I don't know what good it'll do, but as I have no better idea, why not? He fell in beside his cousin, and they began walking toward the Prince of Crondor's palace. Eric looked out over the yard where the levies hurried through their drills. He remembered with some guilty pleasure the near fit Alfred, the corporal from Darkmoor, had thrown when informed he was now reduced to the rank of private in the prince's new army. The third time Eric had deposited him on his ear on the parade ground had convinced him to shut up and do as he was told. Eric suspected he would turn out to be a better-than-average soldier, if he could learn to control his temper. "'What do you think?' asked Robert de Longville from behind. Without turning to look, Eric said, "'I know better what to think if I knew what exactly you, the Duke, the Prince, and everyone else you meet with every night have in mind.' "'You've been down there. You know what's coming,' said de Longville, without emotion. "'I think we've got a few men here who might do well enough,' answered Eric. "'These are all seasoned soldiers, but some of them are worthless.' "'Why?' asked Robert. Eric turned and looked at the man to whom he reported. "'Some of them are barracks rats, fit for nothing much more than light garrison duty and three meals a day. I guess their lords decided it was cheaper to let us feed them. Others are too... He struggled for a concept. I don't know. It's like a horse that's been trained to do one thing, then you want to train him to do another. You first got to break him of the old habits. Robert nodded. Go on. Some of these men just can't think on their feet. If you're in a battle and giving orders, they're going to be fine, but if they're on their own... Eric shrugged. Robert said... Muster all the castle rats and those two set in their ways to think for themselves after the midday meal. We're going to send them back to their lords and masters. I want the ones who can think on their feet assembled an hour after the first bunch leaves the castle. I need to get this first bunch trained before we do some serious recruiting. Serious recruiting? Never mind. I'll tell you about it when the time's right. Eric saluted and was about to leave when a guardsman hurried out of the castle, saluted and said, Sergeant, the night marshal wants you and the corporal down at the city watch office at once. The Longville grinned. What do you think? Want to bet it's one of our own? Eric shrugged. No bet. Eric followed him through the maze of corridors in the prince's palace. The original keep, built centuries before to protect the harbor below from Quaggan raiders and pirates, had been added to over the years until a large, sprawling series of interconnecting buildings with outer walls rested hard against the harbor side and covered the entire hill upon which the old keep was the summit. Eric was starting to find his way around and feeling a little more comfortable, but there were still things he didn't understand about what was taking place here in Crondor. He had barely seen Bobby since returning to the city. The Injado had been given better than a hundred men each to oversee, with Bobby's order simply being, 
put them through their paces and keep an eye on them. Eric wasn't exactly sure what that meant, but he and the other corporal had contrived some vigorous training exercises based on the ones they themselves had endured when first coming into De Longville's service. After a week of this, Eric now had a pretty good idea who would fit in with a sort of army Callus was fashioning, and who wouldn't. Callus hadn't been seen since Eric returned, and when he had asked about their captain's whereabouts, De Longville shrugged and said he was off on some errand or another. That made Eric uneasy, as did the fact that Eric's place in the scheme of things was unclear to him. The regular guard in the palace either avoided him or treated him with unusual deference for a corporal. He had guard sergeants address him as sir, and yet when he asked questions he got brusque, even rude answers. It was clear there was some resentment on the part of the existing garrison over the creation of this new army of calluses. As they reached the office of the watch commander, Eric found his hand reaching for his sword without thought at the sight of Rue backing out of the watch commander's office with his own sword drawn. A shout from within could be heard, He'll not harm you! Put that sword away! He recognized the voice as belonging to William, Knight Marshal of Crondor. Rue's appearance was one of a man totally unconvinced, yet Eric couldn't see what was causing his friend such alarm. He almost fell, he was so startled by what he saw next. Coming out of the watch commander's office was a green-scaled serpent with large red eyes and an alligator-like head on a long, sinuous neck. Then Eric saw the thing's body, and saw it had wings. It was a small dragon. Before Eric could do anything, Robert said, Relax. He stepped forward and said, Fantas, you old thief! He knelt next to the creature and put his arm around its neck, giving it a hug as if it were a favorite hound. Bobby told Eric and Rue, This thing is a sort of pet to our Lord William, so don't be upsetting the king's cousin by trying to kill it, will you? Suddenly, from inside the office, Eric heard William's laugh and then his voice. He said he'd like to see them try. Bobby playfully rubbed behind the creature's eye ridges and said, Still a tough old boot, aren't you? Eric took Robert at his word that this was a pet, albeit the most fantastic pet anyone had ever imagined. The creature looked him up and down, and suddenly Eric was convinced there was intelligence behind those eyes. Eric stepped around to where Rue remained hard against the wall and looked past the creature into the office. Inside, the watch commander stood, while Knight Marshal William remained to one side of the desk. Lord William was a short man, barely as tall as Bobby, but he looked fit for his age, somewhere in his fifties. He was reputed to be among the shrewdest military minds in the kingdom. It was said that in the last years of Prince Arutha's tenure he spent nearly every day talking with the old prince, learning everything he could. Arutha's deeds had been part history, part legend, but he was accounted one of the finest generals in the annals of the kingdom. William said to Robert, Lord James will be along in a minute, and added to Rue and Eric, Would one of you please fetch some water? Your friend has fainted. Eric looked down saw Duncan's feet sticking through the doorway, and realized he must have been the first to step through the office and encounter the small dragon. Eric said, I'll go, and was off. To himself, he said, Just when I was thinking things couldn't get much stranger. 5. Newcomer Rue yawned. The discussion had been underway for hours. His mind wandered, so that when he was asked a question, he had to say, Excuse me, my lord. I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. Lord James, Duke of Crondor, said, Robert, I think our young friend here is in need of refreshment. Take him and his cousin down to the mess while William and I confer. They had been holding a discussion in the watch commander's office since Rue had arrived, and until Lord James had mentioned refreshments in the mess, Rue hadn't given much thought to the fact he and Duncan had not broken their fast. The Longville motioned for Rue and Duncan to follow him. Outside the office, as they moved down the hall, Rue asked, Sergeant, what's going on? I had almost no hope I'd ever see my money again, but I want that bastard Sam Tannerson's guts on a stick for what he's done. Robert grinned back over his shoulder. You're still a vicious little rodent, aren't you, Avery? I admire that in a man. As they moved through the castle, Robert said, It's not so simple as mustering the watch, going out hauling in this Tannerson and hanging him. No witnesses, offered Duncan. Right. And there's the issue of why there were these killings. Why were there? asked Rue. Destroying my wine would have been clear enough warning. 
Robert motioned for them to pass through a door into the soldiers' mess, as he said, Well, that's what the Duke and the Knight Marshal are asking themselves this very minute, I'm betting. Rue saw Eric and Jado standing at one end of the mess, while a bunch of soldiers in grey tunics and trousers sat eating. He waved, and Eric came over. Sergeant? he asked, to see if there were orders. Tell Jado to keep an eye on those recruits and join us. Eric did as he was ordered, and when he was seated with the others, castle serving boys hurried over with food and ale. Robert dug in and said, I think we're going to have a bit of fun tonight. Rue said, Fun? Well, if I can judge the Duke, said de Longville, I think he's going to come to the conclusion that there's been just a little too much killing going on of late, and it's time to do something about it. Do what? asked Duncan. The markers have been in control of parts of this city since just before I was born. I know that much. Robert said, true. But then there's never been a Duke of Crondor like Lord James. That's also a fact. He smiled and bit into a cold joint of mutton. Speaking around the mouthful, he said, Better stoke up your fires, lads. I think we're going to have a long night ahead of us. Rue asked, Us? Robert said, You'll want to come along, Avery. It's your gold we're trying to recover, isn't it? Besides, what else have you got to do that's better? Rue sighed, Right now, nothing. We'll give you a bunk for the afternoon so you can get your beauty rest, said de Longville. I think we're going to be up most of the night. Rue shrugged. If there's a slim chance to get my gold back, I'll take it. It's about what I started with, so I'll be even, not counting my time. He looked at Eric. That bit of gold you gave me was part of it, too. Eric shrugged. You don't invest thinking any venture is a sure thing. I knew that. I'll get it back to you somehow, Rue promised. He turned his attention to the men at the far end of the hall. Those you are a new band of desperate men, Sergeant? The long bill smiled. Not desperate enough. But then we haven't really gotten started with them. Right now, we're just weeding out those who don't have what it takes. Right, Eric? Right, Sergeant. Eric agreed. But I'm still not quite sure what the three of us are supposed to be doing. We'll figure it out, said Robert in a non-committal tone. With luck, Trenchard's revenge should be coming into port any day now, and maybe some more of our boys will be aboard. Duncan raised an eyebrow in question, but no one volunteered any details to him. Rue said... Where's the captain? Robert shrugged. He took off with Nacor for Stardock. He should be back in a few more weeks. I wonder what he's up to, mused Rue. Robert de Longville's expression changed to one that Rue knew well, and Rue instantly regretted his words. Everyone at the table, save Duncan, was privy to secrets known only to a few, and such lapses would put Rue into more trouble than he wished, should he again speak out of turn. Eric glanced at Rue, and years of friendship communicated all Rue needed to see to understand that Eric also wished Rue to remain silent. Rue cleared his throat. I think I could use that nap if we're going out tonight. Robert nodded, and Eric smiled, and Duncan seemed not to notice any of the exchange, and table talk turned to the mundane. Callus looked over the rail and said, See that? Nacor squinted against the late afternoon sun. Keshian Patrol. Callus and his companions were on a riverboat, hugging the coast of the Sea of Dreams, a few miles away from Port Shimata. Callus said, They're quite a long way on the wrong side of the border, if we can see them from here. Nacor shrugged. Kingdom, Kesh, always fighting over this area. Good farmland, rich trade routes, but no one ever gets crops in, and no one drives caravans through the Vale of Dreams because of the border raiders. So it lingers like an old man, too sick to live, but not ready to die. He looked at his companion. Tell the garrison commander at Shamata, and he'll send a patrol out to chase the Keshian south. He added with a grin. Callus shook his head. I'm sure someone will eventually mention it to him. He smiled a wry smile. I don't think I need say anything to him. If I do, he might feel the need to impress the Prince of Crondor's special envoy by starting a war for my amusement. Callus's eyes stayed fixed on the horizon long after the Cassian patrol vanished from view. Port Shimata was visible in the distance to the southeast, but they wouldn't be there for another hour, given the light wind of midday. What do you see out there, Callus? asked Nacor, his voice hinting at concern. 
You've been moody since we got back. Callus didn't need to explain many things to Nacor, who probably understood more about the Pantathian serpent priests and their evil magic than any man living. He had certainly seen some of the worst manifestations of it. But Callus knew that right now Nacor wasn't speaking of anything that had to do with Callus's concerns over the distant threat to the kingdom. It was a more personal issue that weighed on Callus's mind. Just thinking of someone. Nacor grinned and looked over his shoulder at Chopi, the former monk of Dala, who at Nacor's insistence now slept upon a bale of cotton. Who is she? You've heard me speak of her. Miranda. Miranda? asked Nacor. Heard of her from several men. A woman of mystery by all reports. Callus nodded. She is a strange woman. Thought attractive, added Nacor, also by all reports. That too. There's so much I don't know about her. Yet I trust her. And you miss her? Callus shrugged. My nature is not common. Unique, supplied Nacor. And issues of companionship are confusing to me, finished Callus. Understandable, said Nacor. I've been married twice. First when I was young to... You know to whom? Callus nodded. The woman Nacor knew as Jorna had evolved into the Lady Clovis, an agent of the Pantathians they had faced more than twenty years previously, the first time Nacor and Callus had ventured south to Novindus. Now she was the Emerald Queen, the living embodiment of Alma Lodaka, the Valhero, who had created the Pantathians, and the figurehead of the army building across the sea that would some day invade the kingdom. The second woman was nice. Her name was Charmia. She got old and died. I still get confused when dealing with women I find attractive, and I am six times your age. Nacor shrugged. If you must fall in love, Callus, fall in love with someone who will live a long time. I'm not sure what love is, Nacor, said Callus with an even more rueful smile. My parents are something unique in history, and there's no small magic in their marriage. Nacor nodded. Callus's father, Thomas, had been a human child, transformed by ancient magic into something not quite human, not quite dragonlord as humans called the Valheru, and that ancient heritage had been part of what had drawn Callus's mother, Aglarana, the elf queen in Elvendar, into a union with Tomas. Callus continued, While I've had my share of dalliances, no woman has held my attention. Until Miranda, finished Nacor. Callus nodded. Nacor said, Perhaps it's the mystery, or the fact that she's not around very much. Nacor pointed to Callus. Have you and she? Callus laughed. Of course. That's not a small reason I feel drawn toward her. Nacor winced. I wonder if there is any man alive who doesn't think he's in love between the sheets at least once. What do you mean? asked Callus. Nacor said, I forget that while you're past fifty years of age, you're still considered young by your maternal race's standards. A child, said Callus, still learning how to conduct myself as a proper Elidel should. He used the name his mother's people used for themselves, the race humans called elves. Nacor shook his head. Sometimes I think those priests who take vows of chastity understand what a drain it is to be constantly thinking about who you're going to bed with. My mother's people are not a bit like that, said Callus. They feel something grow between one of them and their destined mate, and at some point they just... no. Callus again looked out of the shore as the boat began to head in toward the inlet that led to Port Chamata. I think that's why I'm drawn to my human heritage, Nacor. The stately progress of the seasons in Elvendar has a sameness that I find only slightly reassuring. The chaos that is human society, it sings to me more than the magic glades of my home. Nacor shrugged. Who's to say what is right? You are unlike any other, but... Like every other man or woman born on this world, no matter what your heritage at birth, ultimately you must decide who you are to be. When you're finished with this childhood of yours, you may decide it's time to live for a while with your mother's people. 
just remember this much from an old man who really isn't very good at learning things from other people. Every person you encounter, whom you interact with, is there to teach you something. Sometimes it may be years before you realize what each had to show you. He shrugged and turned his attention to the scene before him. As the boat headed in to the reed-lined shore, smaller boats could be seen wending their way along the coast, fowlers hunting ducks and other water birds, and fishermen dragging their nets. The riverboat moved quietly along, and Nacor and Callus were silent for the remainder of the voyage. Chopi awoke as the sounds of the town grew in volume, and by the time the boat rested at the docks he was standing beside his master and Callus. As he was the prince's envoy, Callus had the right of rank in departing, but he moved away from the gangway and allowed the other passengers to depart first. When they at last left the boat, Callus studied the shoreline and the town of Port Shamata. The city of Shamata was separated from the port by almost eighty miles of farmland and orchards. Originally a garrison to defend the southern border of the kingdom against Great Kesh, Shamata had turned into the kingdom's largest city in the south. A squad of soldiers waited for Callus on the docks, and instead of heading down toward the city of Shamata, they would follow the shore of the Sea of Dreams until they reached the river that flowed down from the great Star Lake. They would follow the river to the lake, and then to Stardock Town, which sat on the south shore of the lake, opposite the magician's community on Stardock Island. Along the docks the usual assortment of beggars, confidence men, workmen, and hawkers moved, for the arrival of a boat from the coast meant opportunities, legal and otherwise. Nacor grinned as he said to Chopi, What's your purse? I don't have one, master. Nacor had finally despaired of ever getting the young man to stop calling him master, so he just ignored it now. Callus laughed and said, It's an expression. They left the boat and were greeted at the foot of the gangway by a sergeant in the tabard of the garrison of Shamata. Like the border barons of the north, the garrison commander at Shamata answered directly to the crown, so there was little court formality observed in the Vale of Dreams. Pleased to be free of any need to pay a social call on local nobles, Callus accepted the man's salute and said, Your name? Sergeant Aziz, my lord. My rank is captain, said Callus. We need three horses and an escort to the Great Star Lake. The pigeons arrived days ago, captain, answered the sergeant. We have a sub-garrison here at the port, with ample horses and enough troops to provide for your needs. My captain sends an invitation to dine with him this evening, Captain. Callus glanced at the sky. I think not. We can ride at least four hours, and my mission is urgent. Send your captain my regrets at the same time you send for mounts and provisions. Casting around, he pointed to a disreputable-looking inn across the street from the docks. You will find us there. At once, said the sergeant, and he gave orders to a soldier nearby who saluted and spurred his mount away. It should be no longer than an hour, Captain. Your escort, horses, and provisions should be here quickly. Good, said Callus, motioning for Chopi and Nacor to follow him into the dockside inn. A genial setting, the inn was neither the worst any of them had seen, nor the best. It was what one would expect from an inn located so close to the docks, fitting for a leisurely wait, but not somewhere one would choose to frequent if better accommodations were available or affordable. Callus ordered a round of ale, and they waited for the return of their escort. Halfway through their second drink, Nacor's attention was diverted by a sound from without. An inarticulate cry and a series of monkey-like hootings followed quickly by the sounds of a crowd laughing and jeering. He rose and looked through the closest window. I can't see anything. Let's go outside. Let's not, said Callus, but Nacor had already vanished through the doorway. Chopi shrugged and followed his master out of the inn. Callus stood and followed, deciding it was better to see what trouble Nacor could find before he got too deep into it. Outside, a crowd had gathered around a man who hunkered down on his haunches as he gnawed on a mutton bone. He was easily the filthiest man Callus had ever seen. He had looked and smelled, as if the man hadn't bathed in years. Spending time in the fields made one indifferent to the level of fastidiousness required in the prince's court, but even among common dock workers and poor travelers, this man was a walking cesspool. His hair was black with touches of gray and rank with oil and dirt. Shoulder length it was matted with debris and old food. His face was nearly black from dirt above an equally filthy beard, 
and his skin, where it showed through, was sunburned. He wore a robe so torn and ragged it seemed to have more holes than material. Whatever color the robe had been was a memory, for now the shreds were stained and smeared. Years of indifferent eating had left the man famine thin, and there were sores on his arms and legs. "'Do the dance!' shouted one of the workers. The crouching man growled like a beast, but when the call was repeated a few more times, he put down his nearly bare mutton bone and held out his hand. "'Please,' he said with a surprisingly plaintive tone, almost as if a child were begging. The word came out, "'Please.' Someone in the crowd shouted, "'Dance first! The ragged beggar stood and suddenly executed a furious, mad twirling. Callus stopped behind Nacor, who stood watching the beggar closely. Something about the movements seemed vaguely familiar to Callus, as if hidden in the mad twirling was familiar movement. "'What is this?' he said. Nacor spoke without looking back. "'Something fascinating.' The man finished dancing and stood there, swaying with weakness and held his hand out. Someone in the crowd threw him a half-eaten piece of bread, which landed at the beggar's feet. He instantly crouched and swept it up. A supervisor shouted, "'Here now, get back to work!' and most of the dock workers moved away. A few others remained a moment to watch the beggar, then they started to wander off. Callus turned to a man he took to be a local, and asked, "'Who is he?' "'Some crazy man,' said the stranger. He showed up a few months ago and lives where he can. He dances for food. Where did he come from? asked Nacor. No one knows, said the townsman, moving along. Nacor went over to where the ragged man crouched and knelt down before him, studying his face. The man growled like an animal and half turned away to protect his meatless bone and crust of bread. Nacor reached into his carry sack and pulled out an orange. He stuck his thumb in and pulled off the peel, then handed a section to the beggar. The beggar looked at the fruit a moment, then snatched it from Nacor's hand. He tried to stuff the entire orange into his mouth at once, creating a wash of orange juice that flowed down his beard. Sho P and Callus came to stand behind Nacor, and Callus said, What is this? I don't know, answered Nacor. He stood up. But we need to take this man with us. Why? asked Callus. Nacor looked down at the grunting beggar. I don't know. There's something familiar about him. What? You know him? asked Callus. Nacor scratched his chin. He doesn't look familiar, but given all that dirt, who can say? No, I don't think I know him. But I think he may be important. Oh? Nacor grinned. I don't know. Call it a hunch. Callus looked dubious, but over the years Nacor's hunches had proven to be important, often critical, so he only nodded. The sound of riders approaching signaled the arrival of their own mounts and escort. Callus said, You'll have to figure out how to convince him to get on a horse, though. Nacor stood, scratching his head. Now, that would be a trick, Callus said, and before anything else, we're going to have to give him a bath. Nacor's grin widened. That will be an even better trick. Callus returned the grin. Then you figure out how to do it. If I must, I'll have the guards throw him into the sea. Nagor turned and stood considering the options before him as the riders reached Callus. They gathered at a modest inn in the merchant's quarter, a few streets over from the poor quarter of Crondor. The inn was under the control of the Prince of Crondor, although few who frequented it knew that fact. A back room was being used for a meeting conducted by Robert de Longville. Duncan, you and William here, he indicated a man that Rue had never laid eyes on before. You'll find your way to a small booth near the corner of Candlemaker Road and Delanic Street. The man selling scarves and headcloths is a snitch for the mockers. Make sure he doesn't say anything to anyone. Knock him senseless if you must. Rue glanced at Eric, who shrugged. A dozen men, who were strangers, crowded into the small room with de Longville and those who'd had lunch with him earlier in the day. It was now an hour past supper, and most of the shops were either closed for the day or doing their evening business. Eric and Rue were to travel with Jado and de Longville to a shop and wait across the street. Robert had impressed on them that if he gave the word, they were to get into that shop as quickly as humanly possible. 
He said it twice, so Rue knew De Longville viewed that as a critical part of the night's mission. You, you and you, said Robert, pointing to three teams assigned to neutralize marker lookouts. Out the back door. He was silent for a few minutes, then pointed to Duncan and the man named William. Go now. Out the front. They left, and over the course of the next ten minutes, the rest of the agents were dispatched. When the four remaining men were alone, Rue said, Who were those other men? I'd say the prince needs a lot of eyes and ears in his city, said De Longville. Secret police, said Jado. Something like that, said De Longville. Avery, you're the quickest man here. Stay close to me. Eric, you and Jado are too big to escape notice for long, so stay where I put you and don't move. Once we leave this inn, no talking. Any questions? There were none, and De Longville led them out of the back of the inn. They hurried through the streets, attempting to look like nothing more than four citizens on some errand or another, urgent, perhaps, but unremarkable. They passed a booth at a corner where the poor quarter began and saw Duncan and the man named William engaged in deep debate with a vendor. Who noticed that Duncan stood in such a way that his holding a sword point to the other man's ribs was difficult to ascertain, while William was ready to intercept any who might come too close to the booth. They turned down a short street to another avenue, paralleling the first, and turned the corner. With a wave of his hand, De Longville motioned for Jado and Eric to secrete themselves within a deep and relatively dark doorway, while he quickly moved across the street with Rue. Using hand signals, he indicated Rue should stand against the wall between a doorway and a window. De Longville took up a position at the corner of the building, between the door and an alleyway that ran next to the building. From within the building, Rue heard the sounds of what he took to be a merchant, moving portions of his inventory around. He resisted the impulse to peek into the window, and tried to look like a man simply lounging for a minute, while he kept his eyes darting around, looking for signs of trouble. A figure swept out of the darkness, bundled in a great cloak. Vaguely, behind him, figures seemed to melt away into the darkness, and Rue sensed, more than saw, others ticking up nearby positions. The robed man moved purposefully past Rue and took the three steps up to the door of the establishment. Rue glimpsed him as he passed, and Rue's eyes widened. The man entered the shop, closing the door behind. Rue heard a voice say, Can I help? Hello, interrupted a familiar voice. A long silence was followed by the first voice saying, James? It's been a while, answered Lord James, Duke of Crondor. What? Forty years? More. There was a long silence. Then the man said, I assume your men are outside. Sufficient to make sure this conversation is uninterrupted and ends when I say it ends. Again there was a silence and the sound of two men moving around. What sounded like chairs being pulled across the floor ended with James saying, Thank you. I don't suppose it would do any good claiming I've long since gone straight and am nothing more than a simple merchant. Claim all you want, Brian, said to James. Thirty years ago, when I had heard a merchant named Lyle Rigger had shown up in Crondor, I asked Prince Arutha to set agents on you like hounds on a trail. Even when I was ruling in Rillanon these last twenty years, I've had regular reports on you. Rigger, I haven't used that name in years. I haven't used that name since... Where was it we met? We met in Lytton, said James. Yes, now I remember, came the reply. I used it only a few times since then. No matter, James sighed audibly. It took the prince's men a few years to make sure they had all your bolt holes covered and your runners identified, but once they did, it was easy enough for me to keep track of you. You've better men than we thought. We're always on the lookout for agents of the Crown. James said, That's because until tonight we were content to simply watch. Remember, I used to be a mocker. There are still a few around who remember Jimmy the Hand. Now what? Well, you're going to have to change your name again and do something about your appearance. If you don't, the beggars and thieves will decide it's time for a new leader. There was a chuckle, and Rue strained to hear every word. You know, it all goes back to that business with the crawler. If he hadn't tried to take over the guild in the first place, we'd have had a far more orderly change than we had when the virtuous man took over. 
That was a mess. So I hear, said James. But that's neither here nor there. What brings me to you tonight, Lyle, or Brian, if you prefer, is this. Lately, you've lost control over the guild. Too many happy little cutthroats are running around my city, killing my law-abiding, tax-paying citizens. A little theft and larceny are normal for a city like Crondor, but last night, one of your butchers killed a stable boy, two barmaids, and four horses as a warning to a young wine merchant that he needed to pay protection. That is excessive, agreed the man named Brian. So was the protection price, said James. Who was the man? I'll deal with him. No, I'll deal with him. If you want to keep your own head out of a noose, or more important, if you don't want your own people choosing a replacement for you before your body's cool, listen carefully. For some years to come, I'm going to need Crondor especially quiet and free of trouble. In fact, I'm going to need it very prosperous and rich. The reasons I'm going to need things this way are none of your concern, but trust me, when I say that in the long run it will benefit you and your ragged band of outlaws as much as anyone else in the city. Toward that end, I'm going to find Sam Tannerson and his comrades and publicly hang them. You will find me a believable witness who saw him leaving the end of the seven flowers holding a bloody knife. Get me an earnest-faced little street urchin. A girl would be best. Someone who will have the judge convinced that Tannerson and his pals are barely worth the rope to hang them with. Then you'll tell your merry band of thieves that things are getting too hot for such goings-on, and the next one of your bright lads to go getting creative ideas on setting examples won't live long enough to be hung. And I mean it, Brian. If one of your murderers steps out of line, you'd better string him up before I do, or I'll close you down for good and all. It's been tried before, came the answer. The mockers are still in business. There was a long silence before James said, I still remember the way to mother's. If I shout out before you can reach that dagger you have secreted in your boot, you'll be dead. And within an hour, your nightmaster will be under arrest and your daymaster will be roused out of his bed and taken into custody. I'll have mother's surrounded and closed down before sunrise. I'll have every thief who's known to my agents picked up, and while I won't get them all, or even half, I'll get enough of them. There will still be thieves and beggars in Crondor, Brian, but there will be no more mockers. Then why haven't you shut us down? It's been to my advantage just to keep you under observation. But as I said, now I need certain things. As I'm sitting in his shop and chatting with him this instant, we both understand. I know who the current successor to the upright man is. If I kill you... I might have to spend years finding out who the next leader of the Guild of Thieves is after you. There was a moment of silence. Then James said, It's ironic, but the reason I knew you were back in the city all those years ago is because we look so damn alike. A long sigh answered that. I've often wondered about that. Do you think we're related? I have a theory, came the answer, but no details followed. Just do us both a favor and keep your animals on a short tether. A few robberies of modest gain, a shake down here and there. Boost some goods off the dock and cheat the customs agents now and again out of their duties. I may even have a few jobs for you that will guarantee you and your ragged brotherhood a profit. Commissions of sorts. But this wholesale crime spree is over and the killings must stop today. If I have to go to war, I will. Is that clear? I'm still not convinced, but I'll think on it. James laughed, and to Rue it was a bitter laugh. Think on it. Not hardly. You agree this moment, or you don't leave here alive. Not much of a choice, was the hot reply. The man's voice showed his temper was held in check, but not by much. Rue glanced about. The conversation had lasted only a few minutes, but it felt as if he'd been eavesdropping for hours. Things seemed shockingly normal on the street, though he knew at least a score of the prince's men were within a hundred feet of where he and de Longville stood. You have to understand, said James, that when I say I need a quiet and prosperous city, it isn't my desire to make money for a bunch of merchants and provide an improved tax situation for my sovereign. Desirable ends in and of themselves, but the safety of my city depends on it, and I will say no more. 
save I will happily crush you if I must. Do we have an understanding? We do, said the merchant. There was a note of anger mixed in with the resignation. Then let me give you some good news, came James's voice, accompanied by the sound of a chair being pushed back. For ten minutes after I leave, the door to one of your bolt holes, the one that starts in the basement below and leads to the sewers, will be left uncovered. While I know exactly who you are, I am the only one. Flee to your next identity, and after you've cooled down and given some thought to what I've said, send me a message. If you understand, leak word on the street that the sagacious man has fled and the upright man has returned. Tell your day-master and night-master that it's to lead the authorities to think they've successfully driven you off. If I don't hear that message from you by this time tomorrow night, I will know that either you've been betrayed by your own people, or you haven't taken my warning seriously. Either way, the mockers had best prepare for war. There was a pregnant silence, and James finally said, Good. I know if I were you, I'd have thought for a brief second about going for that dagger, but I also judged you would decide against it. No one who is stupid rises to rule the mockers. It was a close call. You wouldn't have lived. Trust me. Now, as I was saying, you have ten minutes to flee. Go to Mother's and establish whatever new identity you need. Those agents of mine who know you by sight do not know who you really are. They know you only as a merchant I wanted watched. Some, no doubt, think you to be an agent of great cash or some other political foe. Those who know you by reputation and deed have no idea what you look like. I'm enough of a mocker at heart to give you that much. But I will always be able to find you. Never for a minute doubt that, Lyle. For that's how I always think of you. I don't doubt that for a moment, Jimmy the Hand. One thing. What? Were all the things they said about you true? There was an ironic laugh. Not half of the truth, Lyle. Not a half of it. I was a better thief than I thought I was, and not half as good as I claimed, but I've done things no other mocker has ever attempted, let alone succeeded at. Gods, that's the truth, came the grudging reply. No man can argue that. Never been another thief who's risen to the rank of bloody damned duke and single most powerful man in the kingdom next to the king. Now, where's Tennyson? You'll probably find him hiding out in a whorehouse called Sabella's. Across the porch from Rue, the Longville turned and hissed into the darkness, and then said quietly, Sabella's. A figure Rue hadn't seen there a moment before scurried off into the darkness. I know where that is. Have a witness for me first thing in the morning. She's dead, you know. If she rats out Tannison and the others, I have to put the death mark on her. You know Marker's law. Give me a young one, said James. If she's pretty and smart, I'll find a home for her in a distant city. Maybe even save her from a whorehouse and put her with a noble family as a companion for their children. You never know. But she'd better be young enough she's not too set in her criminal ways. A pause. Then. After all, I was fourteen when I met Arutha. And I haven't forgotten a thing. That's the God's truth, Jimmy. That's the truth, said Lyle. Suddenly the door opened, and Lord James, still covered from head to knee in a great cloak, swept down the steps. He paused for a brief moment next to Robert and said, You heard? I had. Words been passed, was all the Longville said, and then the Duke of Crondor vanished into the night. In the gloom down the street, Rue could see others fall in around him, and in a moment the street appeared to be empty again. Rue glanced at de Longville, who held up his hand, signaling they should wait. The next ten minutes dragged by... Then suddenly de Longville put two fingers to his mouth and blew a shrill whistle. From a side street, a squad of soldiers ran up, while Jado and Eric dashed from across the street. To the soldiers, de Longville said, You, enter that building and arrest anyone you find there. Confiscate every document you find and let no one in or out of this building after you seal it. To Rue, Jado and Eric, he said, Come with me. Rue said, Sabellas? Yes, and if we're lucky, your friend Tannerson will resist arrest. Jado said, 
Man, don't he sound happy at that prospect. To Longville said, I haven't had a good excuse to kill anyone in too long a time, Jotto. In silence, they hurried deep into the poor quarter. Rue followed close behind the Longville, and they reached the street where Sabella's occupied the first third of the block. The Longville whispered to a man at the corner, Are the men in place? Waiting for you, came the reply. Thought I saw something up there on the roof a few minutes back, but it might have been a cat. Things are pretty quiet. The Longville nodded, half seen in the gloom, then said, Let's go. They entered the whorehouse as if it were an enemy camp. Jotto struck a bouncer a head-ringing blow that brought the man to his knees before he could stop them entering the room, and as he knelt on the floor, Eric caught him with another blow that rendered him unconscious. Rue ran past to Longville and a couple of women, too startled by the eruption of violence, to do more than sit in open-mouthed astonishment. He reached the stairs, where a large woman of middle years had just turned to see what the disturbance at the front door was. She found Rue's dagger at her chin. Tanderson, he said in a quiet voice, dripping threat. She went pale, but whispered, Top of the stairs, first door on the right. Rue said, If you're lying, you're dead. The woman looked and saw Jado and Eric coming toward her, and, for the first time, registered the size and lethal aspect of the two men bearing down on her. No, I mean, first door on the left. Rue was off and along Villa stepped behind. He turned and signaled for Eric and Jado to hold the bottom of the stairs. He then turned back to see Rue reach the top of the stairs. Rue hesitated, motioned for DeLongville to kick the door, then ducked low. DeLongville kicked the door, and Rue was through in a crouch, his sword at the ready. He needn't have bothered. Lying in bed was Sam Tannerson, his vacant eyes staring upward at the ceiling as blood dripped from a gash across his throat. What? said DeLongville, as he saw the tableau before him. Rue hurried to the open window and looked out. Someone had exited the room minutes before they had arrived, from the look of things. Rue turned and started to laugh. "'What's so funny?' asked Eric, as he reached the top of the stairs and looked in. Rue pointed to the corpse on the bed. "'Some whore killed Tennyson, and I bet it was so she could steal my gold.' The Longville poked around in the man's garments and said, "'No purse or coins,' Rue said. "'Damn! So now some whore has all my gold.' De Longville looked at the corpse. Maybe. But we had better leave and talk about this somewhere else. Rue nodded once, put up his sword, and followed De Longville out of the room. The girl watched as across the street the men who had attempted to capture Tanners and left the inn, dragging out those men who had been playing poker downstairs. Other men prowling the streets nearby were checking to see if they were being observed. She was certain they hadn't seen her leave Tanners's room. She glanced at her hands, half expecting to see them shake, but instead they were firm upon the eaves of the roof where she crouched, sheltered in the darkness from the sight of those below. She had never killed before, but no one had murdered her sister before either. The cold rage that had fueled this revenge had not diminished with Tannerson's death, as she thought it would. There was no sense of closure, no sense of putting paid to the account. She still seethed inside, and nothing would bring her sister back to her. Curiosity pushed aside other concerns, and she wondered who those men had been. She had been less than five minutes out of the bedroom when she had heard the voices raised in anger across the street. She had left her work clothes secreted in a bag behind a chimney on the roof of the house opposite the whorehouse Tannerson used as a headquarters, against her need to get out of bloody clothing after the job was done. When she had decided to avenge Betsy, she had vowed that either Tannerson or she would lie dead on the floor of that bedroom tonight. Getting into Sabella's hadn't proven difficult. Bribing the whore to tell Tannerson someone special waited for him in the room had been easy enough as well. The girl's native stupidity had not caused her to think any farther than her full purse of gold without Sabella taking a cut. Now she'd keep quiet out of fear. For the first few moments of her flight, fear had nearly overwhelmed the girl. For the first five minutes after reaching the roof, she had just sat, too numb to move. Tannerson's blood had covered her from chin to waist, and she had finally gotten her fouled clothing off. Then she had heard the movement of men down the streets below, and fear kept her from attempting to leave. As she waited, fatigue pushed in on her, and she half dozed. For a minute or an hour, she wasn't clear, and then the raid had brought her alert. Now fatigue was pushed aside by fear. If those men who had entered Sabella's 
had been sent by the night master, she could have been seen or identified. Being hunted by the prince's police was one thing. Being hunted by the mockers was another. Her only hope in the second instance would be to flee the city and get as far away as possible, up to Lamut or down into the empire of Kesh. She crept along the roof until she came to where she had left her rope. Tossing aside the small bag that had contained her regular trousers, shirt, vest, dagger, and boots, and now contained a bloody knife and a blood-soaked shirt and trousers, she glanced over the eaves. Two men of the rear guard hurried past in the darkness below, and she moved to another corner of the roof, where she saw others moving in the same general direction as those who had just left the whorehouse. The girl sat back on her heels, considering. None of the men she had glimpsed looked remotely familiar to her, and she should have recognized at least one of them if they were mockers. Whoever had come into Sabella's were the prince's men, no doubt, for no one else in the city would be able to mount such a raid, especially not with men who seemed to appear and disappear out of the darkness like the best in the Guild of Thieves. It had to be the Duke of Crondor's special agents, his secret police. But what had they wanted with Tannerson and his band of thugs? wondered the girl. She was not worldly, but she was clever, intelligent, and curious. She gauged her distance to the next roof, backed up, and made a nimble leap to the roof opposite, and continued along the thieves' highway after the men below. After a block she was falling behind, and quickly found a drain pipe she could clamber down. At this hour the streets were dark and nearly empty, so she had to keep to the shadows, lest she attract attention. Twice she spied rear sentries who were placed to prevent anyone's following, so she waited and slipped after them when they at last moved out. It was an hour before dawn when she lost sight of the last man she had trailed, but she was near certain where the raiders had been bound, the prince's palace. They had used a circuitous route, and they had taken pains to avoid being followed, but she had kept her wits and hadn't rushed, and now she could see they were moving directly for the palace. She paused and looked around. The streets were completely deserted, as far as she could tell, but there was an uneasiness in the pit of her stomach that made her suddenly wish she hadn't been so curious. Fatigue was again threatening to overwhelm her, and she was due to report to the daymaster in less than two hours. She feared going to sleep, for if she did she was certain she wouldn't awake in time. Missing one day's picking pockets in the market wouldn't usually earn her more than a harsh word or a cuffing around, but not the morning after Tannerson's murder. She must do nothing to call undue attention to herself. Tannerson had been a brute and a man of few friends, but he'd had many allies and had established himself as something of a minor power among that faction of the mockers known as bashers, those given to strong-arm tactics, armed robbery, extortion, and protection, as opposed to the beggars and those who used more subtle forms of larceny. The sagacious man and his lieutenants, the daymaster and the nightmaster, had been reluctant to curb Tannerson and others like him who produced, and say what you might about the swine, he had produced. His small-scale reign of terror over the merchants near the docks and poor quarter had more than doubled the protection money coming into the guild over the previous year. But if she could show up with an account of men moving through the streets to the palace, she might divert any suspicion from herself and ensure that the sagacious man was more concerned with the actions of the prince's secret police than with those of a single girl pickpocket. She might even plant the idea that it was the prince's men who had cut Tannerson's throat. The girl's reverie, half from exhaustion, half from emotions spent in killing her sister's murderer, had dulled her wits. She was barely aware someone else was nearby when she turned and tried to flee. A man's hand seized her wrist and held her in a grip like iron as she drew her dagger to defend herself. Another hand froze her movement as she looked up into the man's blue eyes. He was the strongest man she had ever encountered, for no matter how she squirmed, she was unable to free herself, and he was quick. When she tried to kick him in the groin, he turned enough that her kicks fell harmlessly on thighs that were as hard as oaks. Other men approached, and in the early morning gloom the girl could make out a ring of dangerous-looking men closing around her. A short, unattractive man with a balding head looked her up and down and said, "'What do we have here?' He pried the dagger from her immobile hand. Another man, whose features she couldn't make out, said, This is the one who was following us. Robert de Longville said, Who are you, girl? The large man who held her said, I think there's blood on her hands. 
A shuttered lantern was uncovered, and suddenly the girl could make out the faces of the men who surrounded her. The one who held her was little more than a boy himself, roughly the same age as she. He might have arms on him as big as her thighs, but his face was still soft and boyish, though there was something in his eyes that made her wary. The short man, who seemed to be in charge, looked down and said, Sharp eyes, Eric. She tried to wipe them off, but didn't have water to bathe. Turning to a man in the outer rank of those who surrounded her, he said, Return to Sabella's and check the rooftops and alleys around there. I think you'll find a weapon in whatever she was wearing when she killed Tannerson. She couldn't have dumped them into the harbor and had time to catch up with us. Another man, even shorter than the leader, young like the powerful youth, but thin, even scrawny, pushed forward and thrust his face an inch from the girl's. What have you done with my gold? demanded Rue. The girl spit in his face for an answer, and Longville had to hold him back from striking her in reply. It's getting light, and this is too public a place, said the sergeant, his voice held to a harsh whisper. Bring her along to the palace, Eric. We'll question her there. The girl decided it was time to cease being passive and screamed at the top of her lungs, hoping to startle the powerful youth into releasing his grip enough so she could yank free. All that happened was a meaty hand clamped down over her mouth, and the short leader said, Open your yap again, girl, and I'll have him club you to silence. I have no need to be tender with you. She knew he was not making an idle threat. But as a shutter opened in a room above, and as two street boys peeked out of a nearby alley, the girl knew she had achieved her goal. Before she reached the palace, word would reach the daymaster that the thief called Kitty had been picked up by agents of the prince, and at least she would have an acceptable excuse for not reporting to muster at mother's this morning. She'd have a most reasonable excuse for the daymaster when she got back to mother's. As the young man called Eric half-carried, half-led her through the pre-dawn streets, the girl amended her last thought if she ever got back to Mother's, to explain. When they reached the palace, the mood among the men who escorted the prisoner lightened, except for Rue, who had demanded to know about his gold. He fumed and kept a suspicious eye upon the girl. They entered the palace through a small gate, moving past two alert guards who said nothing. Down a long hallway, illuminated by torches and sconces, they continued in silence until they reached a large stairway leading down into the lower portion of the palace. Several of the men moved away, leaving the girl in the custody of the Longville, Eric, Rue, Duncan, and Jado. Half pushing, half throwing her, Eric released the girl's arm as they entered an interrogation cell. Shackles hung from the wall, and if the girl had taken the time to inspect them, she would have seen them rusty from disuse. But she turned like a trapped animal and crouched, as if awaiting an attack. Tough one, isn't she? asked de Longville. What about my gold? demanded Rue. What gold? said the girl. De Longville stepped forward. Enough. Looking at the girl thief, he asked, What do we call you? Anything you want, she snapped. What's the difference? De Longville said, You've caused us a great deal of difficulty, girl. He motioned, and Jada brought over a small wooden stool, upon which de Longville sat. I am tired. This has been a very long night, and there are things about it I don't like much. The thing I like the least is finding you have killed the man I was going to hang tomorrow. I don't know what your cause with Tennyson was, child, but I needed him for a public hanging. Glancing at the other man, who now leaned against the walls of the cell, he said, We need someone to hang. Giotto said, If we dress her up a bit in a man's clothing and cut her hair, maybe... If the threat reached the girl, it didn't show in her reaction. She merely glared at the men, one at a time, as if silently marking their features for some future revenge. Finally, she said, He killed my sister. Who was your sister? asked de Longville. She was a bar girl, a whore over at the Seven Flowers. Her name was Betsy. Rue blushed. Suddenly he could see the resemblance, though this girl was far prettier than her sister had been. But Rue had been intimate with Betsy, and his reaction to this revelation was surprising. He felt embarrassed and didn't want to let this girl know he had been the man her sister had been with when she had been killed. "'What's your name?' the Longville asked again. "'Catherine,' said a voice behind them, and Rue turned to see Lord James standing in the door to the cell. "'Pickpocket!' He walked around to Longville and studied the girl's face. They call you Kitty, don't they? The girl nodded. 
She had been frightened by the others, for they were hard men, but they were commonly dressed. This man, however, was dressed like a noble, and spoke as if he expected to be obeyed. He studied her face, then said, I knew your grandmother. Kitty looked confused for a minute. Then her eyes widened, and she turned pale. Gods and demons, you're the bleeding duke, ain't you? James nodded and said to De Longville, How did you catch this little fish? De Longville explained that one of his rear guard had spotted her coming down a drain pipe, and had signaled they were being followed, and how the trap for her had been laid. I just dropped Eric off in the shadow so he could grab her when she walked past him, he finished. He stood and indicated the duke should take the stool. James sat and calmly said, You'd best tell me exactly what happened, girl. She told of discovering that Tannerson and his bashers had killed her sister, and of how she had arranged to lure him to a room. She had turned down the lamp and rested on the bed, and when Tannerson had entered, he saw a pretty young girl, and it wasn't until he leaned over her and found her dagger entering his throat he suspected anything. She had ducked out from under him as he had fallen on the bed, and she had tried to get as much blood off her body and hands as possible before she fled out the window. Rue interrupted and said, Did you take any gold from him? He didn't have a purse, she said. At least I don't think so. I didn't stop to look. Rue swore. Someone heard you leave, looked in, saw the blood, and took the gold. What about the locked door? asked De Longville. It was Duke James who said, It's a common thing to find that those latches aren't as secure as you think if you know where to find the hidden trip. Probably one of the employees at the inn has your gold room. They knew how to set the latch, so it fell into place when they closed the door. If you'd been there five minutes earlier, you might have caught the thief in the act. Now we could tie the thief to a spit and roast him slowly, and we won't find the gold. Rue swore again. James sat back. You're something of a problem, Kitty. I had reached an accommodation with a sagacious man over the disposition of Tannerson and his companions, and you've managed to completely foul that up. He rubbed his chin. Well, your career with the mockers is at an end. What are you going to do? She asked, her voice made faint by fear. Give you a job, he said, rising. To De Longville, he said, We need female agents, Bobby, but keep her on a short leash for a while. If she proves untrustworthy, we can always kill her. He left the room, and De Longville motioned for the others to follow him. Coming up to Kitty, he reached out and took her chin in his hand. You're pretty enough under all that grime, he said. Looking for some sport, then, are you? She asked, a glint of defiance in her eyes. What if I am? He responded, his voice harsh and low. He pulled her face forward and gave her a quick kiss, but his eyes remained open, and he watched her face carefully. She pushed herself away. Well, you wouldn't be the first rough man to put hands on me, she said without emotion. I was taken young, and it's all the same to me. Getting poked by one man is much like getting poked by another. She stepped back and removed her vest. Then she unbuttoned her tunic and removed it, along with her boots and trousers. The Longville turned to the door where Eric and Rue waited and motioned for them to move away. He studied the girl a moment. She had a lithe body, small breasts, and slender hips, but there was a nice balance to her. She had a long neck and large eyes, and he said, Yes, you're pretty enough. Turning away, he told her, Now, get dressed, and I'll have some food sent to you. Rest a while, and we'll talk some more later in the day. And think on this. You now work for me. And if I need to, I'll as happily cut your throat as take you to my bed. He didn't look back as he left the cell, closed the door behind him, and locked it. He then moved to where the others were waiting for him. To Eric and Jado, he said, Go back to your quarters and get some sleep. I'll need you alert in a couple of hours. With a sagacious man fleeing and this Tannerson murdered, we may find things getting lively in the city soon. As they left, he turned to Duncan and Rue. What about you two? Rue looked at Duncan, who shrugged. I guess we also need to find jobs, said Rue. De Longville said, You can still work for me. Thanks, but if I let this one setback stop me, what sort of merchant would I be? True, said Robert. 
Well, you can find your own way out. If you want to, grab a bite of the commons before you do. Have a hot meal on the prince, with my compliments. He walked away, and as he left, he said, But if you change your mind, you know where to find me. Duncan waited until Longville was out of earshot and said, Just what are we going to do? Rue sighed, long and loud. I have no idea. He walked toward the soldiers' commons. But if we're going to be out looking for work, we at least can do it on a full stomach. 6. Barrett's Rue jumped. The waiter coming out the door swerved expertly to avoid Rue as he came into the kitchen at Barrett's coffee house, and Rue put down his tray as he called out his order. The chaos in the kitchen stood in direct contrast to the calm evidenced in the common room and the private areas on the second floor of Barrett's. The large oak double doors kept the sound away from those merchant and traders negotiating in hushed voices throughout the coffee house. Rue had sought employment for almost a week before he thought of Barrett's. Several merchant concerns had looked upon a poorly dressed former soldier with little civility, and no one seemed interested in taking on even the most junior of partners without receiving a large sum of capital as an incentive. Promises of hard work, diligence, perspicacity, and loyalty were far less important than gold to these men. Most merchants either had sons or apprentices, and few had any work available save as guards or menials. Rue felt close to defeat before he remembered the young waiter at Barrett's named Jason, who had directed Eric and Rue to the horse trader by the city gate. Rue had returned to Barrett's, found the man in charge of the waiters, mentioned Jason by name, and after a short consultation with Sebastian Lender, the manager of Barrett's, a man named Hone, offered Rue a tryout as a waiter. Rue quickly learned his way around the floor, with Jason acting as his tutor. Rue had come to like Jason, the youngest son of a merchant in another part of town. McKellar, the head waiter, had told Jason to show the new boy the ropes. Rue disliked being referred to as a boy, but given McKellar's age, he supposed it was reasonable. Duke James would appear a boy next to McKellar. Jason had proven an easy-going teacher, one who didn't presume Rue was stupid because he didn't know his way around the coffee house. Rue's years of growing up around Eric's family at the end of the pintail helped, as he wasn't completely ignorant of what went on in the kitchen or in a common room. Still, there was much about Barrett's that was unusual to Rue. First of all, he had been required to swear an oath, on a relic from the Temple of Sung, the goddess of purity, promising he would never reveal to anyone what he might overhear while waiting tables. He was next fitted for the standard uniform of tunic, trousers, apron, and boots, his own were considered too worn, and was informed the price of his clothing would be deducted from his pay. Then he was taken into the kitchen and introduced to the vast variety of coffees and teas, baked goods, and breakfast, lunch, and dinner items offered to the clientele of Barrett's. A quick study, Rue memorized as much as he could, confident he would learn the rest as he needed. The organized chaos of the coffee house at its busiest reminded Rue of a battle in many respects, the orders came in from each waiter, who was expected to remember everything a customer requested, and who would also remember which table to return to, and which gentleman or nobleman received which item. Mostly it was coffee, or an occasional sweet roll, but often it was a complete breaking of fast or a noontime meal. Rarely did anyone eat an evening meal at Barrett's, as most businessmen preferred to eat at home with their families, but sometimes the late afternoon business ran long, and waiters and cooks could be working until two or three hours after sunset before the last customer left and the doors were locked. That was the custom at Barrett's, that the doors remained open so long as one customer remained, and a few times over the years, at the height of financial crisis in the kingdom, the coffee house had remained open around the clock, with the wait staff expected to remain alert, neatly dressed, and ready to answer the call of the frantic businessmen and nobles crowding the floor of the common room. The cook said, Your order's ready. Rue grabbed his tray from off the counter, double-checked the order, and moved toward the door. He paused a beat to ensure the slight swing of the door was the result of the last waiter moving through it, and not because some fool had forgotten which door to pass through. Always keep to the right, he had been told. And Jason had told him the biggest problem was caused by customers, who occasionally would mistake the kitchen door as an entrance to the jakes or a back way out, and the resulting collision was usually both loud and messy. Just before reaching the door, Rue turned and backed through as if he had been doing this for years, and moved with a fluid grace into the commons. Only his battle-trained reflexes prevented a collision with a customer, who turned and moved across the aisle down which Rue moved. "'Excuse me, sir, 
Rue intoned when what he wanted to say was, What's where you're going, fishbrain? He forced a smile. Jason had impressed upon him that while his salary from Barrett's was modest by any measure, the true source of income for the waiters was the gratuity. Quick, efficient, polite, and cheerful service could earn a waiter a week's wages in a day, if business was particularly good. Occasionally a single table would provide enough income for a waiter to invest in one of the common undertakings. For which reason, Rue, as the newest member of the staff, had the poorest section of the common room. He glanced longingly up to the galleries where the business associations, brokers, and partnerships gathered. Among their number were several bright young men who had begun their business lives as waiters at Barrett's. It might not be as quick a rise as seeking treasure in far lands, but it could be as dramatic as that in results. Rue placed his order expertly in front of each businessman, as he had been instructed, and they all but ignored him as they continued their discussion. He heard enough to realize they were discussing the extramarital adventures of an associate's wife, rather than matters of business, and he ignored them. A single copper piece, more than the price of the coffee and rolls, was placed upon his tray, and Rue nodded once and backed away. He moved through his area, inquiring politely if anyone needed anything, and when he had made his way around his area and had received no new orders, he stationed himself quietly in plain sight, ready to answer the call of any customer who needed him. For a few minutes he had time to himself, and he again looked around the room, memorizing faces and names, certain that some day such information might be useful. From across the room a figure waved at him. Rue recognized him as another waiter, Kurt, a tall, nasty-tempered bully who had most of the younger waiters cowed. He was also a suck-up, and had both Hone and McKellar convinced he was a competent and pleasant waiter, while he was neither. He managed to get the younger waiters to do as much dirty work as possible while avoiding work at every turn. Rue wondered how such a lout had come to such a senior position at Barrett's. Rue ignored the wave, and at last Kurt came across the room toward him. As he approached, Kurt forced a smile for the benefit of the patrons. He would have been a handsome young man, Rue judged had he not had such a mean turn to his smile and such narrow eyes. "'I was signaling you,' he hissed between clenched teeth. "'I noticed,' Rue answered, without looking at him. He kept his eyes on the customers in his section. "'Why didn't you come?' asked Kurt, in what he must have assumed was a threatening tone of voice. "'Last time I looked, you weren't paying my salary,' answered Rue, moving to the elbow of the customer who had just tipped him a single copper coin. He nimbly filled the man's half-empty cup without being asked, and the two businessmen at the table barely noticed him doing his job. Kurt put his hand on Rue's arm as he turned. Rue glanced at the hand and said, I would advise you not to touch me again. Kurt almost snarled as he quietly said, And what if I do? You don't want to find out, Rue answered calmly. Kurt said, I've eaten bigger men than you for breakfast. Rue said, I have no doubt but I'm not interested in your love life. He dropped his voice. Now get your hand off my arm. Kurt withdrew it and said, You're not worth a scene at work, but don't think I've forgotten you. I'll be here every day to remind you in case you do, said Rue. Now, what did you want me to come over for in the first place? Shift change. You're on the door. Rue glanced at the large, fancy timepiece that was hanging from the ceiling, a water clock, fashioned in cash, it displayed the hour and the minute by a rising column of blue water that dripped into a transparent tube marked with the hours at a controlled rate. One of his jobs, as junior to most waiter, was to be in the common room at dawn to quickly flip the valve that caused the strange device to pump water back to the tank above, while the second tank began dripping so that the time was always accurate. Rue had been uncertain why it was so critical for these businessmen always to know what time it was, but he was fascinated by the device and the fact that he could see what time of day it was with a glance to the center of the room. "'Why the change?' he asked as he headed for the kitchen. Kurt a step behind him. "'We're not due for a shift change for another hour.' "'It's raining,' answered Kurt with a smug grin as he brushed his black hair away from his forehead and took up his own tray. New boy always gets to wipe up the mud. Rue said, Fair enough, I guess. He didn't think it was fair at all, but he was damned if he was going to give Kurt the satisfaction of seeing him distressed by the news. He left his own tray and cleaning cloth on a shelf designated as his, 
and moved quickly through the large kitchen door and crossed the commons to the front door. Jason was waiting for him, and Rue looked out to see that a tropical storm up from Cash had swept across the bitter sea and was now dumping massive amounts of warm rain on the prince's city. Already a pile of damp rags were tossed into the corner, and Jason said, We try to keep the floor as clean as possible before the rail, so we don't have to mop down the floor completely throughout the coffee house. Rue nodded. Jason tossed him a rag and knelt and began to clean up the mud that was splashing in from the force of the rain along the edge of the doorway on his side. Rue duplicated his actions at his own door and knew it was going to be a long, frustrating morning. After the fourth cleaning of the portal, a large carriage turned the corner at high speed just a few feet from the doorway to Barrett's. A splash of mud through the door barely missed Rue's boots. He quickly knelt and used a rag to get as much of it off the wood as possible. The rain continued its steady tattoo, and little splatters of dirty water continued to edge the wooden floor with grime, but the majority of the entrance hall to the coffee shop was still clean. Jason tossed Rue a fresh rag. Here you go. Thanks, answered Rue, catching it. This seems a bit pointless, he added, nodding through the open door to where the rain was picking up in intensity. It was a typical fall storm off the bitter sea, and it could mean days of unrelenting rain. The streets were becoming rivers of mud, and each new arrival at Barrett's tracked increasing quantities of the dark brown ooze onto the wooden floor of the entranceway. Think how it would look by now if we didn't keep at it, suggested Jason. What else do we do besides fight mud? asked Rue. Jason said, Well, we help customers out of coaches. If one pulls up on your side, first see if it's driven by a coachman alone or if there's a footman riding on the back. If there's no footman, open the carriage door. If the coach has one of the new fold-down steps, lower it for whoever's inside. If there's no step, get that box over there and carry it to the coach. He pointed to a small wooden box kept in the corner of the entrance for such use. It sat next to some dirty towels and a larger metal pan. A coach pulled up, and Rue glanced at Jason, who nodded. There was no footman, as this was a hired coach, and Rue could see there was nothing like the fancy swing-down step in evidence. He grabbed up the box and, ignoring the rain, placed the box below the door, then pulled it down on the handle as instructed. Swinging the door open, he waited. An elderly gentleman climbed quickly down from the coach and took the two steps into the relative shelter of the entranceway. Rue grabbed the box and was barely a stride away as the coach moved on. He reached the entrance in time to hear McCuller greet the newly arrived patron. Good morning to you, Mr. Estabrook. Jason was already cleaning the mud from Mr. Estabrook's boots as Rue replaced the box in the metal pan designed to confine water in mud. He then took up a rag, and by the time he had it in hand, the client had moved into the inner sanctum of Barrett's. That's Jacob Estabrook? asked Rue. Jason nodded. You know him? I know his coaches. They'd come through Ravensburg all the time. He's one of Crondor's richest men confided Jason as they finished cleaning up the floor. He's got an amazing daughter, too. Amazing how? said Rue, putting away the muddy rag. Jason was a young man of middle height, a lightly freckled, fair complexion, and brown hair, one who Rue judged unremarkable in appearance, but his expression became close to transfixed as he answered, What can I say? She's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Rue grinned. And you're in love. Jason blushed, which amused Rue, though he kept any jibe to himself. No, I mean, if I could find a woman who looked like that who would give me a second glance, I'd tithe Dorothea, the goddess of luck, for the rest of my life. She's going to marry some very rich man or a noble, I'm certain. It's just that she's someone to daydream about, supplied Rue. Jason shrugged as he put away his cleaning rag. He then glanced at Rue's feet and said, Boots. Rue looked down, saw that he was tracking mud on the floor they were trying to clean, and winced. Taking the rag out of the metal pan, he cleaned his own boots and then the tracks he had made. You don't do much of this when you spend your life barefoot. Jason nodded. I guess. Now, about this one de Sylvia. Sylvia asked to Brooke. Yes, yeah, Sylvia. When have you seen her? She sometimes travels here with her father on her way to shop in the city. They live out on the edge of the city, near the Prince's Road, on a large estate. Rue shrugged. He knew that in Crondor, the King's Highway was called the Prince's Road, and he had traveled it with Eric the first time he had come to Crondor, though they had left the highway and cut through the woods and some farmland. 
Later travels had been but a southern road to the training ground where he had learned the soldier's trade, so he had never seen the estate of which Jason spoke. What's she look like? She has the most amazing blue eyes and blonde hair that's almost pale gold in color. Rue said, Blue? Not green? Blonde hair? Blue eyes, blonde hair, answered Jason. Why? Just checking. I met a really beautiful woman who almost got me killed, but she had green eyes and dark hair. Anyway, go on. There's nothing more to say. She rides up with her father and then goes off after he gets out. But she smiles at me, and she even took a moment to speak to me once. Rue laughed. That's something, I guess. A shout and the sound of a large wagon moving near caused Rue to turn. Heaving around the corner, looking for a moment as if it were about to attempt to enter the building, came a horse, as tired, old, and ragged a creature as Rue had ever beheld. A loud grinding of wood upon wood was punctuated by oaths and the sound of a lash as a wagon wheel ground across the open portal and the driver came into view. An instant was all Rue needed to realize this man didn't possess even the most rudimentary knowledge of driving a wagon, and had tried to turn the corner too sharply, jamming the wagon against the side of the building. Ignoring the driving rein, Rue turned and moved in front of the horse, grabbing the animal by the bridle, while shouting, Whoa! The animal obeyed, as it was hardly moving at all because of the jamming of the wagon against the corner, the deep mud, and near total exhaustion. What's this? demanded the driver. Rue looked up at a young man, only a few years older than Rue, so thin and soaked through to his skin from his appearance. It was also obvious he was a sailor, as he wore no boots or shoes and was sunburned and drunk. Heave to, mate, cried Rue, before you run ashore. Trying to look threatening, the young sailor shouted belligerently, Clear away! You're fouling my rig! Rue moved around the animal, its sides heaving from the exertion, and said, You cut that too sharp, friend, and now you're hung up. Do you know how to back this animal? It was obvious he didn't. The sailor swore and jumped down, losing his balance and falling face down into the thick ooze. Cursing and slipping as he tried to stand, he at last regained his feet and said, Damn the day I tried to do a favor for a friend. Rue looked at the overloaded wagon, now up to the wheel hubs in mud. It was piled high with crates, all covered and lashed down with a canvas cover. Your friend did you no favor. That load needs two horses or better four. Just then Jason yelled, What is all this? Before Rue could answer, he heard Kurt's voice shouting, Yes, Avery, what is this? A blind man could see we have a wagon stuck in the doorway, Kurt, he answered. An inarticulate growl was the best reply he got. Then the keller's voice cut through the sound of the driving rain. What have we here? Rue hurried away from the mud-covered sailor and ducked under the neck of the still-panting animal. Without bringing more mud into the entrance, he peered into the coffee house. McKellar and some of the waiters stood there, just beyond the splash of mud and rain, and watched the spectacle of a horse almost inside the establishment. The driver is drunk, sir, explained Rue. Drunk or sober, have him get that animal out of here, demanded the ancient head waiter. Rue could see Kurt smirking at the order. Rue turned and saw the sailor starting to walk away. He took three quick steps, as quick as possible in the ankle-deep mud, and overtook the man. Swinging him around by the arm, he said, Wait a minute, mate. The sailor said, You're no mate of mine, bucko, but for all of that I'll not hold it against you. Care for a drink? You need a drink like that horse needs another lashing, said Rue. But drunk or not, you need to get that wagon from out of my employer's doorway. The sailor looked halfway between anger and amusement. He took that pose of control assumed by drunks who don't wish to appear drunk, and slowly said, Let me explain to you, me, that. A friend of mine named Tim Jacoby, a boyhood chum I just met today, convinced me that it would be better to be a wagon driver in his father's employ than to risk another voyage. Rue glanced back and with alarm saw the horse was attempting to kneel in the mud, an impossible act because of the confining traces. Oh, God, he said, grabbing the sailor's arm and trying to pull him back toward the wagon. He's colicking. Wait a minute, shouted the sailor, pulling away. I haven't finished. No, but the horse has said Rue, grabbing the man again. I was saying, continued the sailor, 
I was to deliver this wagon to Jacoby and Sons freight haulers, then get my pay. The horse started making a sick, squealing noise as McKellar's voice sounded from the doorway. Avery, move along, will you now? The customers are starting to be annoyed. Propelling the sailor back to the wagon, Rue found the old animal down on its knees, with its back legs trembling furiously. Pulling a knife from his tunic, Rue quickly cut the traces, and as if sensing freedom, the horse struggled to its feet, staggered forward, then collapsed into the mud. With a sigh that sounded like nothing so much as relief, the horse died. Damn me, said the sailor. What do you think of that? Not bloody much, said Rue. The horse had managed to stumble around the corner, so that now the other entrance was half blocked. The exiting and entering patrons could now choose how they would get soaked and muddy, climbing around a filthy wagon or over a dead horse. McKellar said, Jason, you and the other boys pull that animal and that wagon away from here. Rue shouted, No! McKellar said, What did you say? Rue said, I meant to say I wouldn't advise that, sir. Rue could see McKellar peering past the wagon from the doorway as he said, Why is that? Hiking his thumb toward the horse, Rue replied, "'That animal was old and sick, but it's a draft horse. It weighs fourteen hundred pounds if it weighs an ounce. The entire staff's not going to be able to pull it from that sucking mud, and that wagon was too heavy for it to pull, so we won't be able to move it.' "'Do you have a suggestion?' called McKellar to the now completely soaked Rue. Rue's eyes narrowed, and a slight smile crossed his face for a moment as he said, "'I think I do.' He turned to the sailor. Walk to your friend's company and tell him that if he wants his cargo, he can come here to claim it. I think I'm going back to sea, said the sailor. He reached inside his tunic and pulled out a leather wallet, bulging with documents. You can have this, sir, he added with a drunken half-bow. You do, and I'll hunt you down myself and kill you, said Rue. He took the wallet and said, Go tell your friend's father his fate is here at Barrett's and to ask for Rue Avery. Then you can go drown yourself in ale for all I care. The sailor said nothing as Rue shoved him away, but he turned in the direction he had indicated Jacoby's lay and not back toward the harbor. Jason! Yes, Rue. Run and find some knackers. Wait, he corrected himself. Knackers would charge money to cut up and haul away the animal. Run to the poor quarter and find a sausage maker. Tell him what we've got here, and that he only has to come and haul it away. The knackers are going to sell the meat for sausage anyway. Why pay a middleman? Jason's voice could be heard asking McKellar if that was all right, and when the answer came in the affirmative, he ran out into the rain and disappeared quickly toward the poor quarter. Rue quickly inspected the wagon and knew that it would never be moved until it was unloaded. I'm going for some porters, he shouted to McKellar. We need to unload the cargo before we can move this rig. McCutter said, Very well, as quickly as possible, Avery. Rue hurried down to the next street, then one street over, until he came to a Porter's Guild hiring office. Stepping inside, he saw a dozen burly men sitting around a fire, waiting for work. Moving to the small desk where the Guild officer sat, he said, I need eight men. And who are you? asked an officious little man sitting on the stool behind the desk. I'm from Barrett's, and we have a wagon stuck in the mud in front of the coffee house. It needs to be unloaded before it can be moved. At the mention of Barrett's, the man lost some of his officious manner. Uh, how many men did you say? Years of being around teamsters and porters served Rue well, as without hesitation he said, Your stoutest eight men. The officer quickly singled out eight of the twelve men and said, There's an extra charge for the weather. Rue narrowed his gaze. In his best no-nonsense tone, he said, What? There are now tender boys who can't stand to get wet? Don't try to hold me up so you can catch some extra drinking money, or I'll be talking to the guildmasters about how many other clever little schemes you may have conceived over the years. I was loading and unloading wagon since I could reach a tailgate, so don't be telling me about guild rules. Rue actually had no idea what he was talking about, but he could smell a con in his sleep. The man's face turned red as he made an inarticulate sound in his throat and said, Actually, that is for snow and ice, not rain, now that I think on it. Sorry for the misunderstanding. Rue led the eight men back into the storm to the wagon. He unhitched the tailgate and pulled up the canvas. Oh, damn, he said. The cargo was mixed, but right before him was a large pile of fine silk, worth more gold than he'd make this year and the next if he was any judge of fine fabric. But once wet and muddied, it might as well be homespun for the price it would command. He said to the lead porter, Wait here. 
Rounding the wagon, he found McKellar still at the door with a mixed company of waiters and customers, the latter watching the performance with some amusement. I need one of the large, heavy tablecloths, sir. Why? Some of the cargo will have to be kept dry, and... He glanced around. Seeing the unused building, Catter Corner, to Barrett's, he continued, And we can put it there for the afternoon, but we'd probably have less difficulty if we kept the cargo undamaged. They might claim we damaged their goods and should have let it sit where it was until they came to collect it. That argument might not have convinced any inn or tavern keeper in Crondor that it was a good idea to possibly ruin a precious tablecloth. But Barrett's was an establishment founded on protecting cargo, among other investments, and McKellar nodded. With dozens of litigators among his clientele, he wanted nothing to do with the possible hearing before the local magistrate. Fetch a large tablecloth, he instructed Kurt. Looking pained to have to do anything to help rule, Kurt turned and moved between the patrons, returning a few minutes later with a large cloth. Rue held it close to his chest and hunched over in an attempt to keep it as dry as possible as he ran to the back of the wagon. He pushed it under the tarp and then loosened the two end tie-downs. Holding the canvas up with one hand, he climbed awkwardly into the back of the wagon, making sure he didn't touch the precious silk. He motioned to the nearest porter and said, Climb up here, but be cautious you touch nothing. Get any mud on this cloth and you'll be discharged without pay. The porter knew from the exchange in the hall that this boy knew a thing or two, and that one of the porter's guild's reasons for existing was for goods to be carried without damage, so he was cautious enough to be almost slow in getting up next to Rue. Hold the canvas so it keeps this dry, Rue said, pointing at the silk. Rue tried to examine the balance of the cargo, which was difficult in the dim afternoon light of this heavy storm. After a moment, he was convinced it could withstand a little water. He unfolded the tablecloth and made sure that only the clean side, not the mud from his tunic that had gotten on it, touched the silk. It took him nearly ten minutes to get the entire bundle covered and turned over and covered again with a large linen cloth, but when it was as protected as it was going to be, he said, Now untie the rest of the tie-downs. The other porters hurried to obey, and when the job was done, he said, Wrap this canvas around the bundle. Two porters jumped into the wagon and did as instructed, while Rue jumped down and started across the street. Bring it here! he shouted to the porters, urging them to move as quickly as possible. He reached the door of the abandoned building and saw that there was a small decorative lock on the door. He inspected and then rattled it. With no idea how to pick such a lock, he sighed, raised his boot, and kicked as hard as he could. The lock remained intact, but the small hasps four screws pulled from the wood as the door swung inward. Rue stepped inside the abandoned house. The faded grandeur of the entrance was nothing short of spectacular to Rue. A large staircase wound up from the hallway to a railed landing on the second floor, and from the vaulted ceiling of the entranceway a large crystal chandelier hung, dust dimming whatever sparkle the faint afternoon light might have imparted. The sound of the porters coming up behind him caused Rue to forego exploring the upper hall for a moment as he crossed the entranceway and opened a large sliding door. A formal sitting room, devoid of furnishings, lay below the balcony, but it was dry, as both large windows on the opposite wall were intact. Rue told the porters, Bring that in here, and put it against this wall. He indicated the farthest wall from the windows, just in case someone managed to break one of them. Salvaging this silk would be worth something to him only if he kept it undamaged. The porters put the bundle of cloth down, and Rue said, Get the rest of the cargo and haul it over here. It took the eight men less than a half hour to unload the wagon. Rue had opened the wallet and found the inventory list, as he had expected, but with one significant difference. There was no bill of lading for the bolts of silk. Each of the boxes bore a customs stamp and had a corresponding paper also bearing a stamp and signature. But as far as the royal customs were concerned, that silk did not exist. Rue considered this, and after the last load was brought into the building, he had the workers pick up the silk again and move it to another room, a small storage closet under the stairs, next to an old metal pail and dried-out mop. He led the men back outside and secured the door by pushing the hasp screws back into the stripped-out holes in the wood. There was no security in it, but any casual passerby might think the lock still intact. By then, Jason had returned with a sausage-maker and a half-dozen apprentices and workers, as unsavory a band as Rue had seen this side of the war in Novendus. Leading the porters over to where Jason stood, now as drenched as Rue was, he said, "'Remember to tell me where you got this crew so I never buy sausage there.' Jason made a face. One step inside his shop would do it. He watched in revulsion as they set to the horse with large knives. I may never eat a sausage again, even if it's from the king's own table. 
Horses, dogs, and other animals died in the streets of Crondor often enough that the bloody spectacle of the sausage-makers cutting up the horse did little but cause a few passers-by to look twice. But it would have been a major embarrassment for Barrett's to have its customers have to move around a dead animal to enter or exit. Over his shoulder the sausage-maker shouted, "'Do you want the hooves, skin, and bones?' "'Take it all,' said Rue, as the lead porter came up to tap him on the shoulder. "'You wash eight sovereigns,' said the porter. Rue knew better than to argue price. The guild official working behind the desk might try to net a little extra gold out of him, but this worker would be quoting guild rates, and no merchant in the kingdom would get the guild to come down a copper piece from those rates. Rue said, "'Not quite yet.' He motioned for the porters to follow him back to the wagon. "'Pull this out and get it to that courtyard behind the building where we put the cargo.' "'We're porters, not bloody horses,' said the lead porter. Rue turned and gave the man a dark look. "'I'm cold, wet, and in no humor to argue. "'You can pick it up and carry it like porters for all I care, "'but move it over there!' he shouted. "'Something in this little man's manner impressed the porter, "'for he didn't argue, and signaled his men to form up. Four took the Rue into traces, "'while the other four moved to the rear of the wagon. "'They raised the tailgate, and two got ready to push while the other two moved to turn the rear wheels by hand. It took some struggling and a great deal of swearing, but after a bit of work, the wagon was broken loose from the mud and was half-rolled, half-dragged through the mud across the street and down the little alley that led to the rear courtyard of the abandoned building. "'How did you know there was a courtyard behind that house?' asked Jason. Rue grinned. "'I told a friend I might buy that place some day, so I got curious and looked around.' There's a little alley that leads around it, and two windows that look out of the sitting room over it. Might be a nice place for a lady's flower garden. Going to marry a fine lady, said Jason, in only slightly mocking tones. I don't know, said Ruth. I might marry that Sylvia Estabrook you speak so highly of. Soon the sausage maker and his half dozen apprentices and workers were finished with their bloody work, and they carried off the horse, leaving some scraps of skin and entrails behind. Rue said, the rain will clean things up quick enough. He led Jason back toward the entrance as the porters returned. There now, shouted the senior most porter, about our pay. Rue motioned for them to follow and led them across to the portal to find McCullough still there. Sir, these men need to be paid. Paid, said the head waiter. It was obvious to Rue that the old man hadn't given a thought to cost when Rue had gone to get the porters. These are guild porters, sir. At mention of that word, McCullough almost winced. Like every other person in business in Crondor, he was used to the many guilds in the city, and no business could long endure if it found itself at odds with the guilds of the city. Very well. How much? Before the head porter could answer, Rue said, Ten gold sovereigns, sir. Ten, said McCutter. That was more than a skilled craftsman might expect to earn in a week. There are eight of them, sir, and it is raining. McCutter said nothing as he removed a large purse from his belt and counted out the coins, handing them to Rue. Rue went to where the porter stood and gave the head porter nine. The man frowned. You told the old coot. In low tones, Rue said, I know what I told him. You take the nine and give eight to your guild scribe, and he gives you back your share. He doesn't complain about the ninth coin he doesn't know about, and you don't complain about the tenth. The man didn't look pleased, but he didn't look that unhappy, either. The extra few silver royals each man would get were a proper bonus. He slipped the money into his tunic and said, I get you. We'll hoist a drink to you this evening. Rue turned away and moved back to the entrance, where Jason was toweling himself dry. Rue stepped into the area and saw it was now filthy with mud and rain. The wind was picking up, and McKellar said, We'd better close the shutters, and then we'll clean up this mess. He signaled for Kurt and another waiter. Clean up this area. To Rue and Jason, he said, Go around back and come into the kitchen from the alleyway. I don't want you trucking mud across the floor. Change into clean clothing and get back to work. Rue tossed his dirty wet towel back into the metal pan and saw Kurt glowering at him, as if this extra work was Rue's fault and not the result of the weather. Rue grinned at him, which deepened Kurt's irritation. As he started to leave, McCutter said, Avery? Rue turned, Sir? You thought and acted quickly. You did well. Thank you, sir, said Rue, as he and Jason stepped back into the storm. As they headed for the alley behind the coffee house, Jason said, That's rare. What? You don't often hear McKellar compliment one of us. Sometimes he calmly tells us how we're lashing things up, but most of the time he says nothing. 
He expects us to do the right thing. You've impressed him. Rue rubbed his nose. I'll remember that when I'm dying of a cold tonight. They turned the corner and moved down the alley, reaching the large delivery yard behind the coffee house. They climbed up on the loading dock and then moved into the kitchen. After the time spent in the cold storm, the kitchen felt hot to them. They went to where they kept dry clothes and started to change. As Rue finished dressing, Kurt came into the kitchen to where Rue and Jason were tying on their aprons. Well, I had to clean up your mess, Avery. You owe me for that. What? said Rue, his expression a mix of amusement and irritation. You heard me. I don't get door duty. But because of you, I'm mopping up more mud than I've seen since I started working here. I don't have time for this, said Rue, pushing past him. Kurt's hand fell on his arm. Rue turned, and using a hold taught him by Chopin when they were traveling across the sea in Callus's mercenary band, he bent Kurt's fingers back to a very uncomfortable angle, just short of causing him injury. But the pain gained him instant results. Kurt's face drained of color, and his eyes began to water as he dropped to his knees. Rue calmly said, I told you, you didn't want to find out what would happen if you touched me again. He caused Kurt another moment of pain, then released his fingers. Next time I'll break your hand, and then we'll see how fit you are for waiting tables. Kurt whispered, You're mad. Rue saw fear in Kurt's eyes. Like all bullies, he didn't expect any resistance, but when it came from a small man like Rue, he was doubly shocked. Very mad, said Rue, and capable of killing you with my bare hands. Remember that, and keep your mouth shut when I'm around, and we'll get along just fine. Rue didn't wait for a response, or to say anything to the kitchen staff, who had turned to stare at the sight of Kurt being forced to his knees. Rue knew he now had an enemy, but he didn't fear Kurt. He had lost all fear years before, and it would take something a great deal more frightening than a pumped-up town bully to make Rue Avery know it again. 7. Opportunity Rue smiled. The man had come looking for him about mid-morning, and McKellar had summoned him from the kitchen, where he was learning to brew coffee to Mr. Hone's satisfaction. Without introducing himself, the man said, Are you the boy who stole my wagon? Rue halted and studied the man. He was of middle height, only a head taller than Rue, was stocky, and had a round face. His hair was cut short, but slicked with some pomander oil in a quiggin style, with ringlets across his forehead. He wore a shirt with a collar that was too high for him, given his thick neck, and with far too much lace down the front. With his cutaway jacket and tight trousers, he looked comic to Rue. Two less-than-comic bodyguards stood behind him. Each wore only a long belt knife, and otherwise were unarmed, but Rue could see instantly these were killers, exactly the sort of men Rue had served with in Callus's company. The man who had spoken might have dressed the part of a young city dandy, but his anger and his narrow eyes caused Rue to sense he was as potentially dangerous as the two men who served him. Rue said, And you are? I am Timothy Jacoby. Ah, said Rue, making a display of wiping his hands on his apron before offering his right to shake. Your drunken friend mentioned you by name. Did he ever get to your shop last night? Instantly, anger was replaced by confusion. It was obvious to Rue that the man had expected some denial. He reluctantly took Rue's hand and shook in a cursory fashion and let go. Friend? He was no friend, just a sailor who I bought some drinks who... who did me a favor. Well, he obviously felt that returning to sea was a better choice than telling you he almost drove your wagon into Barrett's coffee house. So I heard, Jacoby answered. Well, if he ran off, that explains why I had to buy information from a rumor monger. She said someone had unloaded my wagon in front of Barrett's and moved all the cargo. I thought the sailor had been overcome by robbers. Rue said, No, your goods are safe. Reaching into his tunic, he removed the large leather wallet and handed it to Jacoby. Here are the customs documents. The entire cargo is in that house across the way, safely dry. Where's the horse and wagon? asked Jacoby. The horse died. We had to cut it out of the traces, and Knacker slaughtered it and hauled it away. I won't pay a dime for the Knackers said Jacoby. I never authorized that. I could have sent another team and hauled it away myself. No bother, said Rue. The wagon was ruined, which he knew to be a lie, so I had it hauled away. Let me have it for scrap to cover the cost of the porters and knackers, and we'll call it even. Jacoby's eyes narrowed. Ruined, you say? How do you know? My father was a teamster, 
said Rue. And I've driven enough to know yours wasn't serviced regularly, which he knew to be the truth. And with the traces all cut up, there's not a lot but four wheels and a flatbed, which was also true. Jacoby was silent a minute, his dark eyes studying Rue while he thought. How many porters? Eight, said Rue, knowing Jacoby could check with a porter's guild easily enough. Jacoby said, show me my goods. Rue looked back to where McKellar stood. The old man nodded, and Rue moved across the street. The storm had halted late the night before, but the streets were still deep in mud. Jacoby had arrived by carriage, and Rue took silent delight as the fancy boots and the lower half of his trouser legs were fouled by the thick muck. Reaching the door, Jacoby looked at the heavy lock. How'd you get the key? I didn't, said Rue, easily pulling the hasp away. The screws came out, and one fell to the porch. Rue picked it up and stuck it back in the hole. The owner obviously thought no one was likely to steal this house. He pushed open the door and led Jacoby to where his cargo was hidden. Jacoby did a quick inventory, then said, Where's the rest? Rest? said Rue innocently. There was more than this, said Jacoby, anger barely held in check. Rue then knew for certain what the plan had been. The silk had been smuggled in from Kesh to the Crondorian docks. From there it had to get to the trader's office, with the sailor duped into driving the wagon for some quick gold. If Royal Customs arrested the sailor, Jacoby could claim that he knew nothing of the silk, and that the sailor was smuggling it in Jacoby's wagon without his knowledge. Any guild, a teamster, or even an independent such as his father had been, would have checked the cargo against the manifest to ensure that he was not accused of stealing something never loaded. But a drunken sailor, who was lying about his ability to drive a single horse-drawn wagon, was likely not even to think about what was in the back. Rue looked at the man and calmly said, Well, if you'd like to go to the constable's office and swear out a complaint, I'll be more than happy to accompany you. I'm sure he will be almost as interested as the Royal Customs Office to know why you're concerned with something not accounted for on this bill of lading. Jacoby fixed Rue with a dark stare, but after a moment it was clear he could do nothing. Both men knew what was going on, but at this point Jacoby had only two options left open to him, and he took the obvious choice. Jacoby nodded once to the man on his right. From within his jacket he produced a dagger, as Jacoby said, Tell me what you did with the silk, or I'll have him cut your heart out. Rue moved to the center of the room, giving himself space to defend himself. He had a dagger secreted in his own boot, but waited to pull it. Jacoby's two thugs might be dangerous to an untrained man in a tavern brawl, or if they had the drop, but Rue knew his own abilities, and unless these men were as skilled as the men Rue had trained with, Rue knew he could defend himself. Put that away before you hurt yourself, Rue said. Whatever reaction Jacoby had expected, that wasn't it. Cut him, he said. The first thug lunged forward while the second pulled his belt knife. The first attacker found Rue's hand on his wrist and suddenly tamed and shot up his arm as Rue dug his other thumb into a particularly delicate set of nerves in his elbow. He quickly wrestled the knife from the man's hand and let it fall to the floor, deftly kicking it aside. He then disposed of the first guard with a kick to the man's groin, causing him to groan as he collapsed. The second thug was disposed of as quickly, and Jacoby pulled his own knife. Rue shook his head as he said, You really shouldn't do this. Jacoby's temper got the best of him, and he made a growling sound as he lunged at Rue. Rue easily got out of the man's way, gripped his arm as he had the first man's, and found the same bundle of nerves. But rather than jabbing to force the fingers limp, Rue ground his thumb into his elbow, ensuring as much pain as possible. Jacoby cried out softly as his knees buckled and his eyes filled with tears. Then Rue released his grip and the dagger fell from limp fingers. Rue calmly picked it up. Jacoby knelt, holding his right elbow with his left hand. Rue calmly took the dagger and reversed it, handing it to Jacoby. You dropped this. The first thug was slowly trying to regain his feet, and Rue could tell he would need to soak in a cold bath to reduce the swelling in his groin. The second guard looked at Jacoby with uncertainty written on his face. Jacoby said, Who are you? Name's Avery. Rupert Avery. My friends call me Rue. You can call me Mr. Avery. He waved the dagger. Jacoby took the dagger and looked at it a moment. Rue said, Don't worry. I can take it back any time I want. Jacoby got to his feet. What kind of waiter are you? The former soldier kind. I tell you so you don't think about sending these two buffoons with some friends tonight to teach me a lesson. 
then I'd be forced to kill them, and then I'd have to explain to the city watch why you were trying to teach me a lesson. Now, I suggest you get back to your office and get another wagon and team and get this cargo out of here. The owner of this building might want to charge you rent if he finds you warehousing your goods here. Jacoby signaled it to his guards to go on outside, and after they had left, followed them to the door. He paused and regarded Rue over his shoulder before leaving. From outside the door, he said, The wagon? Rue said, Do you see a wagon anywhere around here? Jacoby said nothing for a long moment, then spoke. You've made an enemy, Mr. Avery. Rue said, You won't be my first, Jacoby. Now get out of here before I get irritated with you. And thank Ruthia, he invoked the goddess of luck, that someone hasn't taken all your cargo and vanished with it. After Jacoby left, Rue shook his head. Some people. He didn't even say thank you. Returning to the door, he closed it and crossed the street. McKellar was waiting for him and said, You were gone a long time. It wasn't a question. Rue said, Mr. Jacoby seemed to think some of his cargo was missing and was ready to claim Barrett's was responsible for the loss. I carefully accounted for every item on the manifest, and he was satisfied when he left. If McKellar wasn't completely convinced, he seemed ready to accept the lie at face value. With a nod of his head, he indicated Rue should return to his duties. Rue moved back toward the kitchen and found Jason standing next to the door. You taking a break this hour? Jason nodded. Do me a favor, if you've a mind to. Go to the hiring hall and see if my cousin Duncan is still in town. After the destruction of the wagons of wine, Duncan had decided Rue's get-rich-quick plan was over and was seeking guard duty on a caravan heading eastward. If he is, asked Jason, tell him we're back in business. If Jacoby had revenge on his mind for Rue, he didn't attempt to extract it quickly. The night passed with Rue sleeping lightly in the loft he rented above the kitchen at Barrett's. Duncan had returned with Jason, complaining that he had been about to leave on a large caravan heading to Kesh, and was sleeping next to his cousin. Rue suspected it was a lie, as Duncan was inclined to aggrandize his own discomfort and diminish others, but he didn't mind. He knew that the silk he had hidden in the building was worth a great deal more than he had first thought. Otherwise, why would Jacoby have been so desperate to regain it? So having Duncan around was important. Rue knew he needed someone reliable to guard his back as he entered into the world of commerce. The night passed slowly as Rue lay awake, making and discarding plan after plan. He knew that the silk would be his recovery from the disaster of his wine venture and that while sound in theory, the manner in which he had undertaken to build up his wine trade revealed to anyone who cared to look just how unpracticed Rue was in matters of business. As dawn approached, Rue rose and dressed. He went out into the pre-dawn morning, listening to the sounds of the city. A village boy from a small community in the mountains, he found the strange sounds of Crondor exhilarating, the squawk of the gulls flying in from the harbor, the creaking of wagon wheels moving over the cobbles of the street as bakers, dairymen, and fruit sellers brought their wares into the city. The occasional craftsman, moving cautiously through the gloom of the streets on his way to work, passed by, but otherwise the street was abandoned as Rue moved across to the old building. He had felt a strange attraction to the once rich domicile from the first moment he had seen it. He had visions of himself standing at the large windows on the second floor, looking down upon the busy intersection that stood between the home and barracks. Somehow that house had become a symbol for Rue, a concrete goal that would show the world he had become a man of importance and means. He entered the dark house and looked around. The gray light that came in the doorway barely outlined the stairway under which he had stored the silk. He suddenly wondered at the upper room and moved up the stairway. He paused as he reached the top of the stairs as they bent to the right to form a balcony overlooking the entryway. He could see the shadowy form of the chandelier and wondered what it would look like with the candles ablaze. He turned and saw that the hallway led into pitch darkness. He could barely see the handle to the first door on the right, the one that would provide a window view of the city street. He opened the door and saw the room in the dim light of the gray morning. The room was empty, save for some rags and a few shards of broken crockery. Rue walked to the window and looked out. In the morning gloom he saw the doorway of Barrett's. A thrill ran through Rue, and he put his hand out and touched the wall. 
He held motionless as the sun rose in the east, until at last the street below him filled with citizens of the city about for the day. The noise of the quickly building throng below robbed him of the secret quiet he had taken for himself, and he resented it for that. He moved quickly to the other rooms, curiosity making him want to know every inch of the townhouse. He discovered a master suite in the rear, several other rooms, a guard robe, and a rear servant's stairway. A third floor seemed equally divided between a storage area and what might pass as a workspace for the servants. At least there were shreds of fine clothing and a thimble to convince Rue he had found where the lady of the house had once met with her seamstress. Rue worked his way through the house, and when he was done, he left with a twinge of regret. He closed the door behind him and promised himself that he would return some day as the owner. As he reached the center of the street, he realized he was holding a small shred of cloth. He examined it. It was a faded piece of once fine silk, now yellowed by age and dirt. Without understanding quite why, he slipped it inside his tunic and moved past the doorway to Barrett's. The door swung open as he passed through the side street, and he knew he was late. He should have been among those opening the coffee house. Rue returned to his quarters, put on his apron, and hurried to the kitchen, where he slipped in with the other waiters without attracting attention. Duncan had not stirred for a moment, and the silk was still safe below the stairway. Rue knew it would be a long day until he was free in the evening and could embark on making his fortune. Duncan found him during his lunch break. Rue moved into the rear courtyard of the coffee house and said, What is it? It's less than diverting sitting in that cramped loft, cousin. Maybe I could be about seeing if there's a buyer for... A warning glance from Rue silenced him. I have plans already. If you really want to get something done, return to the house across the way and inspect the wagon. Let me know what you think we need to repair the traces. You're no teamster, but you've been around enough wagons to have some sense of it. If we need to buy new letters, let me know. And if we can repair what's there, so much the better. Then what? asked Duncan. Rue reached into his tunic and pulled out the gold piece he had acquired from a keller the day before. Get something to eat. Then buy what we need to refit the wagon. I need enough for two animals. Why? said Duncan. That won't buy what we need and get us horses. Besides, what are we going to haul? Rue said, I have a plan. Duncan shook his head. Your plan seemed to lead nowhere, cousin. Rue's features clouded, and he was about to say something in anger, but Duncan said, Still, it's your gold, and I've nothing better to do. His smile caused Rue's anger to flee before it was fully formed. Duncan's roguish ways always brought a smile to his lips. Get on with you, said Rue. One of us has to work for a living. Rue returned to the kitchen, as he was due to return to the floor, and he regretted he had spent his few free moments talking with Duncan rather than grabbing a bite to eat, as was the purpose of the break. Suddenly he was hungry, and that only made the day pass even more slowly. "'Are you sure you know what you're doing?' asked Duncan. Rue said, "'No, but I can't think of anything else to try.' He adjusted the end of the silk bolt he carried under his arm. They stood before a modest home, located as far from Barrett's as one could live without leaving the merchant's quarter. Duncan carried the other end of the long bolt of silk, still wrapped in canvas and linen, and glanced around. They were not in a particularly rough part of town, but it wasn't a completely safe area, either. Only one street over, a traveler would find a home's less cared for, occupied by working families, often several to a dwelling, four or five people living in a room. Rue shook his head as he realized this house was totally in keeping with what he would expect from Helmut Grindel. Rue knocked on the door. After a minute, a woman's voice said, Who is it? Rue said, My name is Rupert Avery, and I seek Helmut Grindel, a merchant with whom I am acquainted. A cleverly hidden peephole opened in the door. Rue noticed it only because of a tiny glint of light. Then, after a moment, the door opened. A plain-looking young woman, plump, with light brown hair, pulled back under a modest fillet of dark cloth. Her blue eyes were narrow with suspicion, but she said, Wait inside, sir. Rue and Duncan stepped inside. The girl turned, and Rue noticed she wore simple but well-made and well-cared-for clothing. A possibility crossed his mind, and he let his face cloud over. What? whispered Duncan when they were alone. I hope that's the maid, was all Rue said. 
A few minutes later, a narrow-shouldered, stooped over man entered, glanced at Rue, and said, Avery, I had heard you'd been hung. Pardoned by the king himself, said Rue, and any who don't believe me are free to inquire at the palace. Tell them to ask for my good friend, Duke James. A lively light came into Grindel's eyes. I may have someone do that. He motioned through a curtained doorway. Come inside. They left the plainly decorated hallway and entered a very finely finished sitting room. The decor was what Rupert expected, and was consistent with what he had learned of Grindel when he and Eric had ridden along with him on the road to Crondor. Grindel was a merchant who specialized in luxury goods, small and easily transported, which he moved across the kingdom in ordinary wagons that looked to be carrying unremarkable wares. In fact, they contained more gold in value per square foot than Rue had seen in any cargo during a young lifetime spent loading and unloading wagons. The young woman returned, and Grindel said, Carly, bring us a bit of wine. He motioned for the two men to sit, and Duncan did. Rue introduced his cousin to the merchant, then said, I hope we're not intruding. Of course you're intruding, said Grindel, with no hint of tact. But I suspect you've got some scheme or another that you think would interest me, and I find that sort of nonsense occasionally diverting. He glanced at the bundle that Duncan and Rue had put down, now propped against the side of Duncan's chair, and said, I suppose it has something to do with whatever you have in that large canvas bundle. The girl, whom Rue, with an inward sigh of relief, took to be the maid, returned with a tray, three silver cups, and a carafe of wine. Rue sipped and smiled. Not your best, but not your worst either, Master Merchant. Grendel smiled. You're from Darkmoor, now that I think on it. Wine country. Well, then, maybe if you can show me something worthwhile, I'll pull the cork on something rare. What is your plan, and how much gold do you need? His tone remained light, but Rue could see the suspicion in his eyes. This was as shrewd a man as Rue had ever encountered, and one who would smell a confidence job before Rue could dream it up. There was nothing to be gained by trying to dupe the man. Rue nodded, and Duncan put down the bundle and slowly unwrapped it. When he had the canvas open, he began unwrapping the linen, and when at last the silk was revealed, Duncan stepped away. Grendel quickly knelt and inspected the cloth, gently picking up a corner and thumbing the weave. He moved part of the bolt and calculated the weight, and from that the length. From the size of the bolt, he knew the width. You know what you have here? he asked. Rue shrugged. Kessian, I'm guessing. Yes, said Grindel. Imperial. This silk is supposed to go to the plateau of the emperor. It is used to weave the little skirts and other light clothing worn by the Kessian truebloods. A calculating look entered his eyes. How did you come to possess this? Rue said, something like salvage. No one appeared who could prove ownership. Grindel laughed as he sat back down in his chair. Of course not. It's a capital offense to smuggle the silk from the Empire. He shook his head. It's not that it's the best in the world, you understand, but the true bloods have a strange sense of ownership with anything associated with their history and traditions. They just don't like the idea of anyone but one of their own possessing such items, which makes them all the more valuable for those vain nobles who want something they're not supposed to have. Rue said nothing. He simply looked at Grindel. At last the old man said, So, what does this rare bit of contraband have to do with whatever plan you have rattling around in that devious skull of yours, Rupert? Rue said, I don't really have a plan. He outlined his attempts to import wine from Darkmoor in bulk. And, surprisingly enough, Grindel didn't comment unfavorably on the idea. When he explained his encounter with the mockers and the fatal outcome for Sam Tannerson, Grindel waved him to a halt. You're at the heart of the matter now, boy. He sipped his own wine. When you deal with this sort of item, he waved for the silk, you're dealing with the mockers or those businessmen who must needs deal with them regularly. He tapped his chin with his bony finger. Still, there are dressmakers who would pay dearly for silk of this quality. Duncan said, what makes it so dear, besides the imperial exclusive, I mean? Grindel shrugged. 
It is rumored to come from giant worms or spiders or some other fantastic creatures rather than from the usual silkworms. I have no idea if any of that is true, but there is this one thing. It'll wear for years without losing its luster or shape. No other silk I know of can claim that. Again silence fell on the room, then Grindle said, You still haven't said what you wish of me. You've already been a great help, said Rue. Truth to tell, I have a wagon but no horses, and I was thinking of selling this. I thought perhaps you might suggest a likely buyer and a fair price. A calculating look crossed the merchant's face. I might. He then nodded once and added, Yes, I just might. Duncan covered the silk again, and Grendel called out, Carly! The girl appeared a moment later, and Helmut Grendel said, Daughter, bring me a bottle of that vintage from Oversbrook. What year was it? I know the one, Father. Looking from father to daughter, Rue forced a smile. He had two reasons not to smile. The first was the girl wasn't the maid, but the daughter. He sighed inwardly and turned to smile in her direction. The other reason was the choice of wine. He knew exactly what Grendel was proposing to do, drink one of the very sweet Advarian-style wines that flourished in the cold climates of Grindel's ancestors. Rue personally had had limited experience with sweet wines, and had only drank such on one occasion, a bottle he had stolen from his father's wagon the last time the rare, hand-picked berry wine had been transported into Ravensburg. He had suffered the worst hangover of his young life from drinking too much. But he knew that right now he wanted nothing more in life than Helmut Grindel's approval, and he would drink the entire bottle if asked. Then, glancing at the plump and plain girl, he knew he also wanted the girl's approval as well. His steady gaze caused the girl to blush as she left the room, and Grindel said, None of that, you young rogue. Rue forced a grin. Well, it's hard to ignore a pretty girl. Grendel erupted in laughter. I told you once before, Avery, that your biggest fault was in thinking other people were not half as clever as you. Rue had the good grace to blush, and when the girl returned with the sweet white wine, he said nothing. When they had hoisted a toast, Duncan offering up some meaningless pledge of good faith and hope for good fortune, Rue said, Then I guess we're going to do some business? Helmut Grendel's expression turned from an affable smile to stony coldness. As he said, perhaps, he leaned forward. I can read you like a parchment nailed to the side of a tavern, Rue Avery. So let me set you straight on some things. I spent enough time with you and your friend Eric on the road to have a good sense of you. You're smart, and you're clever, and those aren't the same thing. You have a cunning nature, but I think you're willing to learn. He lowered his voice. I'm an old man with a homely daughter, and no one pays court to her who doesn't have his eye on my purse. He halted, and when Rue said nothing in protest, he nodded once and continued. But I won't be around forever, and when I'm dead I want grandchildren at my bedside shedding tears. If the price of such vanity is finding my son-in-law among those who have an eye on my purse before my daughter, so be it. But I'll pick the best of them. I want a man who will take care of my grandchildren and their mother. He spoke even softer. I need someone to take over my trade and to care for my girl. I don't know if you're the lad, but you might be. Rue looked back into the old man's eyes and saw in them a will as hard and unyielding as any he had encountered, including Bobby de Longville's. He only said, If I can be. Well, then, answered Grindle, the cards are on the table, as the gamblers say. Duncan looked as if he wasn't quite sure what he was hearing, but he continued to smile as if this had been but another friendly chat over wine. What should I do with the silk? Grendel asked. Rue considered, then answered, I need to start. Take the silk and give me horses, refit my wagon, and give me a cargo and a place to take it. Let me prove myself to you. Grindel rubbed his chin. That silk is decent collateral, no doubt. He waved his hand in the air as if calculating figures in his mind. Then he said, One more thing before I say yes or no. Who will be looking to find you for loss of that silk? 
Rue glanced at Duncan, who shrugged. Rue had told him of the run-in with Jacoby, and Duncan didn't seem to think it worth holding back. Rue said, I think Tim Jacoby had the silk smuggled in from Kesh, or he was to receive it from whoever did. In any event, let's say he's less than pleased with not having it tonight. Jacoby, said Grindle. Then he grinned. His father and I are old enemies. We were boys together, friends once. I hear his son Randolph is a decent enough boy, but Timothy's a different sort. He's a bad fellow. So I gain no new enemies by supporting you in this. Then we're in business? asked Rowe. Seems we are, answered Grindle. He poured more wine. Now, another drink. They drank, and after the second glass, Duncan said, You wouldn't have another daughter, then, would you? A pretty one, perhaps? Rue covered his eyes, but was taken aback when Grindle laughed. He uncovered his eyes, and was surprised to see Helmut Grindle genuinely amused at the question. They drank the bottle dry and spoke of many things, but mostly Helmut Grindle and Rupert Avery made plans, discussing various trading strategies and cargoes, which routes to take, and after a while... Neither man noticed that Duncan had fallen asleep in his chair, or that Carly Grindle had come down, removed the bottle of wine, replaced the low, guttering candle, and retired, leaving the two men to talk late into the night. Rue said, Look alert. Duncan nodded. See them? They were driving a wagon along the coast road, just south of the town of Sarth, the next safe harbor north of the city of Crondor. The wagon had been restored to Rue's satisfaction, and the horses were fine animals, and Grindle assured him that his share of the profits from the silk would prove ample for his participation in this undertaking. A band of armed men gathered near the roadside, holding some sort of discussion. As the wagon approached, one of the armed men called it to the attention of the rest, so that by the time Rue and Duncan were upon the group, the men were arrayed across the road, with one in front holding up his hand. "'Who disputes my right to pass on the King's Highway?' demanded Rue. No man, said the leader, but these are difficult days, and we need to ask if you've seen armed men riding past to the south. None, said Duncan. Who are they? asked Rue. Bandits, and they hit us late last night. A full score of them, or more, said a man nearby. The leader threw the man a black look over his shoulder, then said to Rue, Bandits, late last night they robbed a couple of merchants, ransacking their stores, then robbed the two inns in the town. Rue glanced at Duncan, who looked amused. It was nearly mid-afternoon, and there was a small ale cask nearby, so Rue was pretty convinced these soldiers had been debating the best course of action since dawn. "'You're the town militia?' asked Rue. The leader puffed up a bit. "'Yes, we are. In service to the Duke of Crondor, but free men protecting our own.' "'Well, then,' said Rue, as he urged his horses forward, "'you had better get right after them.' The man who was doing the talking said, well, that's the problem, then, isn't it? We don't know where they went, so we're not too sure which is the best way to take on after them. North, said Rue. That's what I said, the man who had presumed to talk before was speaking again. Why north? demanded the leader of Rue. Because we've been on the road since leaving Crondor. If raiders had hit you, then fled south, they would have passed us on their way. None came by us this morning, so it's safe to assume they're heading north up toward Hawk's Hollow or Quester's View. Rue was no student of geography, but he knew enough about trade routes to know that once past the northeast branch road that led up the eastern edge of the Calastius Mountains, there was no easy route across them south of Sark. One of the more drunken soldiers said, Why not west or east? Rue shook his head. To the leader he said, Sergeant? The man nodded. Sergeant, if they were heading west, they would have been in boats, not on horseback. And to the east lies what? Only the road to the Abbey of Sarth and Moor Mountains. Rue said, They've gone north, and odds are they're bound for Illith. For where else will they fence what they've stolen here? That was enough for the leader, who said, Men, we ride. The deputation of town militia moved in something like haste, though some of the defenders of Sarth were having difficulty moving in a straight line. Rue continued up the road and watched as the little squad headed for various locations around the town to get their mounts. Think they'll find the bandits? asked Duncan. Only if they are very unfortunate, said Rue. Where's the prince's army? asked Duncan. Rue said, 
off on the prince's business, I should think. Sarth lay within the boundaries of the Principality of Crondor, which meant it had no local earl, baron, or duke to answer to, and to provide protection. Crondorian soldiers would ride a regular patrol from the boundary between the Principality and the Duchy of Yaban to the north to the city of Crondor itself. But for local problems, a militia, watch, or town constable would have primary responsibility to keep the peace until such a patrol arrived, or answer a request for help. Rue and Duncan had been pleased with the beginning of the journey. Rue had tendered his resignation from Barrett's, and had been surprised to hear something akin to regret from McKellar. He promised Jason that, should fate take a kind turn, he might find him a position that matched his wit some day. Helmut Grindel had been straightforward enough about bringing Rue into the business. He had spoken several times of matching the boy, as Grindel called Rue, with his daughter Carly. A couple of passing references had caused the girl to blush when she was in earshot, but Grindel had at no time bothered to ask his daughter what she thought of the matter. Rue had joked with Eric about marrying Helmut Grindel's ugly daughter, and now that the reality was before him, he wondered at his quips. The girl wasn't ugly, just not very attractive, but then neither was Rue, so he didn't think much about that. He knew that if he were to become rich enough, he could afford pretty mistresses, and that his primary obligation to Grindel would be to keep his daughter fat with child and ensure that the old man's grandchildren were well fed and provided for. Rue also knew that if he could build upon what Grindel already had in his possession, he stood to inherit, or rather, Carly stood to inherit, which would be the same thing, quite a tidy sum, and that with that to work with, why, there was no limit to his future. Rue had talked with Duncan about several plans he had, but Duncan's interest in business was cursory, beginning and ending with when he would be paid and how much, and where the nearest whore or willing barmaid might be found. Traveling with Duncan had been an education for Rue, and he found himself more likely to spend the night with a tavern wench than alone, because of Duncan's influence, but he was constantly amazed at how focused Duncan could become on wooing an innkeeper's pretty daughter. The man had a passion for women that far exceeded Rue's normal young male appetite. Duncan, on the other hand, had absolutely none of Rue's passion for riches. He had traveled, fought, loved, drunk, and ate, and his dreams were not shared. But while easy money appealed to him, hard-earned money was something that would never come his way. Rue drove through the south end of Sarth, and when he saw a store with a broken-in door, he pulled over. Keep an eye on things, he said to Duncan, as he jumped down from the bookboard. He entered the establishment and saw at once it had been totally ransacked. Good day, he said to the merchant, who looked at him with an expression halfway between irritation and hopelessness. Good day, sir, said the merchant. As you can see, I am unable to conduct business in my usual manner. Rue studied the merchant, a middle-aged man with an expanding middle. "'So I've heard. I'm a trader, by name Rupert Avery,' he said, sticking out his hand. "'I'm on my way to Illith, but perhaps I may be of some service.' The merchant shook in a distracted manner and said, "'I'm John Vincy. What do you mean?' "'I am a trader, as I said, and I am able perhaps to provide some goods that you may need to replace your pillaged stores.' The man's manner changed instantly, and he regarded Rue with a studied expression, as if suddenly he had wagered every coin he owned on the outcome of a bet. What sort of goods? Only the finest, and I am embarked upon a journey to Illith, and was planning on purchasing goods to return to Crondor. But I may be able to add a leg, as it were, providing you can, in turn, trade with me those goods I was seeking to purchase in Illith. The man said, What manner of goods? Goods easily transported in small quantity, but of high enough quality to ensure me a profit. The merchant studied Rue a moment, then nodded. I understand. You trade in high-priced baubles for the nobility. Something like that. Well, I need little in the way of finery, but I could certainly use a dozen bolts of sturdy linen, some needles of steel, and other goods required by the townspeople. Rue nodded. I can take a list with me to Illith and return within two weeks. What have you to offer? The merchant shrugged. I had a small cache of gold, but those bastards found it quickly. Rue smiled. The merchant had most certainly left a small strong box of gold, poorly hidden, to let the raiders think they had captured his only treasure. 
but almost as certainly had another richer deposit of coins nearby. Some items of worth? The merchant shrugged. A few articles, perhaps, but nothing that might be called unique. Unique is for the very rare client, said Rowe. He rubbed his chin and said, Just something that might wait a long time to find a buyer here, but that might find a quick home in Crondor. The merchant stood motionless for a moment, then said, Come with me. He led Rue through the back of the store and out across a small courtyard and into his home. A pale woman worked in the kitchen while two small children fought over possession of a toy. The man said, Wait here, without bothering to introduce his wife to Rue, and went up a narrow flight of stairs. He returned a few moments later and held out a leather-covered box. Rue took the box and opened it. Inside was a single piece of jewelry, an emerald necklace, closer to a full choker, of matched stones. It was set with cut diamonds, tiny but brilliant, and the gold work was fine. Rue had no idea of its real worth, but calculated it was probably of fine enough quality to warrant a second look from even the most jaded dealer in gems. What do you want for it? I was keeping this as a hedge against a disaster, said the merchant. And this qualifies as one, I guess, he shrugged. I need to restock, and quickly. My business will be non-existent if I can't provide goods to the townspeople. Rue was silent for a minute, then said, Here's what I'll do. Give me a list of what you need, and we'll go over it together. If we can agree upon a price, then I'll bring back the goods from Illith within two weeks, perhaps as quickly as ten days, and then you'll be back in business. The man frowned. There's a Quaggan trader due in less than a week. And what assurance have you he'll have any of the goods you need? said Rue instantly. What good would it do you if he's a slaver? The man shook his head. None. But then again, we don't see a lot of slavers in these parts. Slavery was banned in the kingdom, save in the case of condemned criminals, and the importation of slaves from Cash or Quegg was illegal. You know what I mean, said Rue. For a small premium, I can bring you exactly what you need. The man hesitated, and Rue said, The children will continue to eat. The merchant said, very well. Go to the inn at the end of the street and find a room. I'll meet you for supper, and we'll go over the list together. Rue shook hands with the man and hurried to where Duncan waited. Duncan was half dozing when Rue climbed aboard the wagon. What? he said in sleepy tones. The inn, said Rue. We find ourselves a room and make a deal. Duncan shrugged. If you say so. Rue grinned. I say so. Helmut Grindle looked up when Rue entered his study. And how did we do, young Rupert? Rue sat and nodded in appreciation when Carly entered with a glass of wine for him. He sipped at it and said, Very well, I think. You think? asked Grindle, sitting back in his chair. He glanced through the window where Duncan stood watch over the wagon. I don't see a wagon large with cargo, so I must assume you found something tiny but valuable. Rue said, Something like that. I took our goods to Illith, and after three days of shopping them around, made trades I thought were most profitable, and restocked with goods. Grendel's eyes narrowed. What manner of goods? Rue grinned. Twenty bolts of fine linen, two hogsheads of steel nails, ten dozen steel needles, a dozen hammers, five saws, one gross spools of fine thread. Grendel interrupted. What? He held up his hand. You speak of common inventory. What are the long discussions we had on rare items of value for wealthy clients? Who said, I got a little gold as well. Grindle sat back in his chair and fingered his shirt front. You're holding back something. What is it? I took those items mentioned and traded them in Sarth for this. He held out the leather box. Grindle took it and opened it. He sat silently for a very long time examining the necklace. After a moment he said, This is very fine. He calculated in his head. But not worth enough more than what I sent north to make this a very profitable journey. Rue laughed and reached inside his tunic. He pulled out a large purse, which he tossed on the table. It landed with a heavy clank. As I said, I got a little gold as well. Grindle opened the purse and quickly counted. He sat back with a smile. This is a profit to be reckoned with, my boy. I got lucky, Rue said. 
Luck is when those who are prepared take advantage of the moment, answered Grindle. Rue shrugged, trying hard to look modest and failing. Grindle turned toward the rear of the house and called, Carly? After a moment, the girl appeared. Yes, father. Carly, I've given young Avery here leave to pay court to you. He will come to escort you out next sixth day eve. Carly looked at her father, then Rue. Uncertainty etched on her features. She hesitated, then said, Yes, father. Looking at Rue, she said, Sixth day, then, sir? Rue said awkwardly, not knowing what to say. Then he nodded, saying, After the noon meal. The girl fled through the curtains at the rear of the room, and Rue wondered if he should have said something pleasant, such as he looked forward to it, or she looked attractive in her gown. He shook off the irritation that this uncertainty brought, and counseled himself to quiz his cousin Duncan on what to say to the girl, then returned to matters at hand. Grendel poured them both a stiff drink of sweet wine, and said, Now tell me how you did this, my boy. Every step of the way. Rue smiled, basking in the approval written in Grindle's eyes, as he beamed at Rue, occasionally looking down at the necklace. 8. Players Rue pointed. I see grey luck, he said. Eric Jotto, Duke James, Robert de Longueville, and Knight Marshal William waited upon the royal dock as Trenchard's revenge was approaching the waiting party. Anxious eyes scanned the distant ship, looking for those other members of Callus's company who might have somehow survived the Emerald Queen's attack on the distant city of Maharta. "'Easy to see that grey streak,' said Rue, shading his eyes against the bright afternoon sun. In the last month, since he had become veritable partners with Helmut Grindel, Rue had been too busy to think overly long on his former companions. But when Eric had sent word that the other ship from Novendus was sighted coming across the harbor's outer boundary— he left Duncan to oversee the loading of wagons for a short trip up the coast to Sarth, and hurried to see the ship put in. Like Eric, he felt the loss of those other men who had endured the hardship of that long voyage across the sea two years before. Then he saw a familiar figure near Greylock, and he shouted, Luis! It's Luis! Chado said, You're right, man. It's that foul-tempered Rhodesian mother-lover, or I'm a priest of Sung. Rue waved, and Greylock and Luis waved in return. Then the mood darkened as Rue realized there were no other members of his company on deck. As if sensing his boyhood friend's thoughts, Eric said, Maybe some of them are ill below decks. Maybe, agreed Rue, but his tone revealed he had little hope that was true. Time passed slowly as the ship came closer to the royal docks. Unlike Admiral Nicholas, the captain of the Revenge seemed disinclined to ignore the prerogatives of the harbor master and his pilots, so the ship slowed until it was close enough to the docks to be towed by longboat, then hauled into place. As soon as the gangplank was run out, Greylock and Louise came down. Greylock saluted Duke James and Knight Marshal William, while Louise, Jotto, Eric, and Rue all slapped each other on the back, weeping unashamedly at the sight of one another. Then something odd about Louise struck Rue, and he said, your hand. Louise wore a long-sleeved jacket and black gloves. The former Rhodesian courtier, turned murderer, lifted his right sleeve, letting it fall away. His right hand was fixed in a half-claw, the fingers unmoving. A moment of regret shone in his eyes, but all he said was, Buy me a drink, and I'll tell you about it. Done, said Eric, then turned to de Longville. If you don't need us right now, Sergeant? De Longville nodded. Don't get too drunk. I need you and Jado clear-headed tomorrow. And bring Luis back with you. I'll have a few questions for him, and there's the matter of his official pardon. Pardon? said Luis. I remember the captain saying something, but doubted he'd get it done. Come along, said Rue. We'll tell you about it and try to keep you from getting hung by the city watch before tomorrow. Eric said, Master Greylock, it's good to see you. I'll be around, answered the former swordmaster of the Baron of Darkmoor. We can catch up tomorrow. A momentary sadness passed over his face. We have a lot to talk about. Eric nodded. Obviously, he had news about those who hadn't survived the sack of Mahartai or the exodus to the city of the Serpent River. The reunited members of Callus's company were quickly free of the royal docks, and Eric led them to an inn close by, often used by soldiers from the palace. 
Eric suspected that every employee of the inn was in the prince's service, the Longville had made it clear he preferred his men to frequent the inn of the Broken Shield, rather than others farther into the city proper. As the drink was decent for the money, the women were friendly and agreeable, and it was close enough to visit without neglecting his duties at the palace, Eric was satisfied to give the inn his business. Since it was early in the afternoon, business was light. Eric signaled to the barman for a round of ales, and as they sat, Rue asked, "'Louise, what happened to you? We thought you lost crossing the river.' Callus's company had been forced to swim across the mouth of the Vedra River to reach the city of Maharta, each man fully armed, and many had not reached the far shore. Luis rubbed his chin with his good hand. "'I nearly was,' he said, his Rhodesian accent lending an oddly musical quality to his words. "'Cramped up just a few yards short of that little island you all crawled on to before you continued on, and by the time I got my head back above water, I'd been swept south of it. So I tried to reach the far shore and started cramping again after a while.' He shook his head, and suddenly Rue realized how much older he looked. A man of not yet middle years, he now had noticeable gray in his hair and mustache. He let out a long sigh as the barman set pewter jacks of ale before them. He drank deeply and continued, I didn't wait when the second cramped it. I dropped my shield and sword, pulled my belt knife, and started cutting off armor. When I could get above water again, I was half drowned, and I didn't know where I was. The sky was dark, and all I knew was I didn't have much left. I saw a boat and swam for it. He held up his ruined right hand. That's how I got this. I reached out for the gunwale and got a hold of it to when a fisherman smashed it with an oar. Eric visibly winced, and Rue said, God! I must have shouted, said Luis. I blacked out and should have drowned, but someone hauled me in as I came to on a boat full of refugees sailing out into the open sea. How did you get to the city of the Serpent River? asked Rue. Luis told his story about the desperate fishing folk who sailed past the warships heading after those fleeing the harbor proper, ignoring the little boats that were fleeing the estuary near the city. We started taking on water, he said, looking off into space, as he remembered. We landed a day northeast of the city, and those of us not inclined to trust their future to the sea went ashore. They repaired the boat, I suppose, or they were taken captive by the invaders. I didn't stay around long enough to find out. He sighed. I owed someone there my life, and never did find out who it was who pulled me out and why. We were all brothers and sisters in misery. He held out his hand. Besides, this was starting to throb and puff up, black and angry. How did you fix it? asked Rue. I didn't. I considered cutting it off, truth to tell. It hurt so much by the third day, and I was sweating from the fever. I tried the Reiki, Makor taught us, and it helped the pain, but it didn't keep me from burning up. But the next day I found this camp with a priest of some order I'd never heard of. He couldn't magic it, but he did bathe it, then wrapped it in a poultice of leaves and herbs. Gave me something to drink that broke the fever. He was silent a moment, then said, He told me it would take some powerful healing magic to restore my hand, the kind that temples charge a lifetime's gold to undertake and he also said it would be a chance thing. It might not take. Luis shrugged. As I am unlikely ever to have the wealth needed, I will never know. He pushed his now empty ale jack away and said, So now I am here, and as I understand it, a soon-to-be-pardoned and freed man, and I must consider my future. Eric signaled for another round of ale. We all faced that. If you don't have any plans, Rue said, I could use a man with a good head and some familiarity in dealing with people of importance. Louis said, Really? Eric laughed. Our friend has realized his ambition and is currently working hard at marrying the ugly daughter of the rich merchant. Jado fixed Rue with a narrow gaze. You're not taking liberties with that tender child, are you? Rue held up his hands in mock defense. Never! He shook his head. Fact is, she appeals to me a little more than you do, Jado. She's a nice enough girl, very quiet. Not as ugly as I imagined, really, and there's a hint of something when she manages a smile. But right now I'm fighting a two-front battle. Oh, this sounds desperate, offered Eric. Well, I'm trying to be as capable as I can to impress her father. But the girl knows I'm about to be hand-picked to marry her, and I don't think she's happy about it. Make her happy, offered Louise. How? Caught her as much as you're obviously courting a father. 
said the Rhodesian. Bring her small gifts, and talk to her of something besides business. Rue blinked, and it was obvious to those at the table that this thought had never occurred to him. Really? The other three men laughed, and after they were finished, Louis said, Who else made it? Eric lost a smile, and Jado's grin faded to a scowl. Not many, said Rue. Eric said, The captain and the sergeant, Nacor and Chopi. Those of us here and a few others from some of the other squads, but of our original six, only we three. He indicated Rue, Luis, and himself. Jado said, That's better than the rest of us. They all nodded. Jado's original company had perished in a holding action with the Sa'awar while he carried word to the captain, and he lost his other companions during the final battle at Maharta. Tell him about Bigel, suggested Rue, and Eric told Luis about the last of their squad to die. By the time he finished, they were smiling again. I swear he looked surprised. After all that talk about the goddess of death and how pious he was, Eric said, and this and that, he looked as if... What? asked Rue, who hadn't been there but had heard the story before. As if he was saying... Eric lowered his voice to sound like Bigos. Oh, this is what it's like. He widened his eyes in mock astonishment. The others chuckled. After the next round was served, Luis picked up his jack of ale and said, To absent companions. They drank and for a moment were silent. What are you two doing? asked Luis. We're helping the captain build his army, said Jado. Eric and me are corporals. Eric removed a small book from within his tunic. Though they have us doing some odd things. Luis picked up the book and looked at the spine. Cassian? he asked. Eric nodded. Not that hard to learn to read after you learn to speak it, but it's slow going. I never was the reader Rue was when we were boys. What is it? asked Rue. An ancient book on warfare from the Lord William's Library, Jotto said. I read it last week. This week he's got me reading something called The Development of Effective Lines of Supply in Hostile Territory by some Quagan lord or another. Louis seemed impressed. Sounds like they're making a couple of generals out of you. I don't know about that, but it matches what Natombe told us when we were on the march in Novindus, said Eric. Louis nodded. Natombe had been another of their company, but he had come from the heart of Kesh and had served with the Inner Legion, the most effective army in the history of Great Kesh, one that had conquered more than two-thirds of the continent of Triagia. He had spent many hours talking to Eric about the manner in which the ancient legions deployed their forces and fought their many campaigns. Given the close quarters of their tiny six-man tent, Louis and Rowe had heard every one of those conversations, save when they were serving guard duty. Jado said, We're building an army like none seen before. He lowered his voice. And you know why? Louis half laughed and shook his head. Better than you do, I think. He glanced from face to face. I only got away from their advanced units by minutes a half dozen times, and I watched as they butchered those trying to get away. He closed his eyes a second. I'm a hard man, or so I thought, but I saw things down there I couldn't imagine. I've heard sounds I can't get out of my ears, and I've smelled odors that linger in the nose no matter how much spice you burn or wine you drink. The mood was now somber, and after a quiet minute, Rue said, Well, yes, we know what's going on. Still, we have to get on with our lives. Do you want to work with me? Louis shrugged. Doing what? I need someone with court manners who can present certain goods to men and ladies of breeding, nobility even, and who can negotiate prices. Louis shrugged. I've never been much of one to haggle, but if you show me what you want, I think I can do this. Conversation ceased as the front door opened, and Robert DeLongbill entered, a slender girl at his side. The four men at the table regarded the unlikely pair, the short, stocky, and pugnacious sergeant, and the almost frail but attractive young woman. She wore common clothing, a homespun dress, and simple shoes. Other than unusually short hair, her appearance was unremarkable, but Eric's face showed he recognized her. Kitty, he said. DeLongbill held up his hand. This is my fiancée, Catherine, and if any of you murdering scum so much as look at her in a way to cause her to blush, I'll have your liver on a stick. He said this with a casual tone, but his eyes clearly instructed the men. There is something going on you do not need to know anything about, 
and wise men heeded even the vaguest warnings. The girl looked irritated at being referred to as de Longville's fiancée, but said nothing. He took the girl to the barman and spoke to him. He nodded and directed the girl toward the kitchen. She threw one last black look at de Longville, then went into the kitchen. De Longville returned to the table and pulled up a chair. She's going to work here, so if one of you lot causes her any trouble... He let the threat go unfinished. Rue shrugged. Not me. I have a fiancé of my own. Oh, is that a fact, said de Longville, evil delight showing in his eyes. And does she know her intended is a former gallows rat? Rue had the good manners to blush. I haven't told her everything. And he hasn't proposed, said Eric. He's assuming a bit here. Well, that's all, Rupert, said de Longville, signaling for an ale. Louis said, They were telling me that not many of our friends came back. De Longville nodded. Not me. But we've gone through this before. His features darkened as the barman placed an ale before him. I've been down under to that bloody continent twice now, and I've left nearly 2,000 dead men behind, and I'm sick of it. Is that why you and the night marshal have us reading these? Asked Pichardo, indicating the books he and Eric held. The Longville's manner changed, and he grinned as he reached out and pinched Jado's cheek. No, Ducky. It's so I can watch your lips move. It amuses me. Eric laughed. Well, whatever the reason, there's a lot of interesting things in these books. I'm not sure I understand it all. Then talk to the night marshal, said the Longville. I have orders that if any of the corporals need to discuss what they've read, they're to go to Lord William's office. The Longville took a long drink and smacked his lips with exaggerated satisfaction. The Knight Marshal? asked Eric. He was the most important military leader in the West, after the Prince of Condor. One of the two of them carried the title Marshal of the Armies of the West in time of war. And historically, it was the Knight Marshal as often as it was the Prince. For any soldier, he was something of a figure of awe. Despite having spoken to the man a half dozen times, Eric had never spoken with him in private or for longer than a few minutes. The prospect of trying to hold a conversation about something he didn't understand obviously caused Eric some distress. Don't worry, said de Longville. He understands how stone-headed you lot are, and he won't use any big words. Rue and Louise laughed, while Eric said nothing. It just seems strange that you and the captain think we need to learn this, Sergeant, said Giotto. De Longville glanced around the room. If you haven't puzzled it out yet, this inn is owned by the Duke. Every man and woman working here is one of James's agents. He hiked his thumb toward the bar. Catherine is here to alert us to any mockers who might come snooping around. After our set to with them last month, we need to make sure they don't cause us more problems. What I'm trying to say is this is the safest place outside the palace to talk about what we all know from our last voyage. His voice lowered. But there's nowhere that's safe and always. He paused. You need to learn as much as you can, because we're building an army like no other in history. You need to be able to take command of as many men as are there, and if that means that everyone in the chain of command above you is dead, you're going to be a general. So if you find yourself in command of the armies of the West and the fate of the kingdom and the entire world, for that matter, is suddenly in your hands, you'll not muck things up too badly. Eric and Jado exchanged glances but said nothing. Rue pushed back from the table. Makes me glad I chose a life of commerce, he said. Well, it's been wonderful, but I have wagons to see to. He asked de Longville, Can I take Louise with me now? De Longville nodded. Come by in the morning and we'll have your pardon signed, he said to Louise. He motioned for Louise to accompany him. He bade the others goodbye and left the inn. As they walked, Louise said, Wagons? I'm a trader now, Louise, and I deal in items of value. I need someone to teach me to talk to the nobility as well as act as my agent. Louise shrugged. He held up his right hand. I guess I don't need this to talk. How bad is it? asked Rue as they maneuvered through the busy street. I can still feel things, but it feels like I'm wearing heavy gloves. I can't move any finger much. With a sudden movement, he had a dagger in his left hand. This one still works, however. 
Rue smiled. He knew Louise to be the best man with a short blade he had ever seen, and realized that while Louise could not soldier as he used to, he was far from helpless. As they headed toward Helmut Grindel's establishment, Louise asked, Where are Sophie and Nacor? With the captain. And where is the captain? Rue shrugged. Off on some errand for the king. I hear he headed down toward Kesh. Stardock, maybe. They continued on. You can't go in there, said the student. Callus pushed past the door guard, Nacor and Shopi following after, and kicked open a large door to the inner chamber of the Council of Magicians, the ruling body of the Academy of Magicians at Stardock. Five magicians looked up and one half rose. What is this? he said. Khalid, said Callus in a cold, even tone of voice, I have been patient. I have been waiting for weeks for some indication from this body that it understands the problems confronting us and is willing to aid us. Another magician, an older man with nearly white beard and hair, spoke. Lord Callus, Captain, corrected the half-elf. Captain Callus, then, said the elderly magician named Chalmus. We appreciate the gravity of your warning and have considered your king's request. My king, said Callus in a tone of astonishment. He's your king as well, need I remind you? Khalid held up his hand. The Academy has long considered our relationship with the kingdom to have terminated with Pug's departure. No one bothered to inform the kingdom, observed Nacor. The five at the table looked at him with a mixture of irritation and discomfort. Nacor had once sat at that same table, when most of those now in control of the Academy had been either students or teachers. Of the five now ruling Stardock, only Chalmers had been a contemporary of Nacor's. Callus held up his hand to silence further comment. More to the point, no one bothered to inform his majesty. He glanced from face to face. The council chamber was a high-ceilinged circular room, and the deep ensconced torches cast flickering light across the room. Only the presence of a circular overhead wooden candle holder provided enough light to see clearly each man's features. But Callus's eyes were more than human and he could see the telltale flicker around the eyes, the quick sidelong glance. Khalid might be the one to speak first, but Chalmers was the leader of this committee. Nacor had filled him in on each of these men. Over the weeks they had been waiting for some declaration that the Academy at Starduck understood the gravity of the warning carried there by Callus and his companions. Chalmers had been a student of Korsh, one of the two Keshian magicians who, along with Nacor, had ruled the island community for five years after Pug's departure. His first acolyte, Chalmers, had risen to the council upon Corse's death, and had showed every sign he was just as conservative and intractable as his predecessor had been. The others Nacor had known as students while he had taught at the academy, before finally leaving in disgust at the insular tendencies of the administration. Callus said, Let me make this simple so there can be no misunderstanding. You may not sever your ties with the kingdom. Despite your having come from many nations, this island, he pointed downward for emphasis, belongs to the kingdom. It is a royal duchy, and while Pug lives, it will remain so. Despite his absence, he is still a royal prince of the kingdom by adoption and a duke of the royal court. And if Pug dies, it will pass on to his son, the King Marshal of Crondor, or whoever else the king deems fit to assume the title. He leaned forward, knuckles upon the table, and said, You've been granted free reign to conduct your affairs as you like, but by no means does this allow you unilaterally to declare yourself free of kingdom rule. Is this clear? Or do I have to send to Shamata for a garrison of soldiers to occupy this island, while the king decides which of you traitors to hang first? Noglek. The youngest and most quick-tempered of the magicians sprang out of his chair. You can't be serious. You come into our council chamber and threaten us? Nacor grinned. He's telling you how things are, he said. He waved Noglek back into his chair. And don't bother to bluster about your magic powers. There are other magicians who would happily support the kingdom's efforts to regain control of this island. He circled around the table and stood next to Noglek. You were one of my better students. You were even leader of the Blue Riders for a while. What happened to you? The man blushed, his fair skin coloring up to his reddish-brown eyebrows. Things change. I'm older now, Nacor. The Blue Riders have been... 
Their activities have been curtailed, said Chalmers. Your more unconventional views caused friction among the students. Nacor made a waving motion with his hand, and Noglek stepped away. Nacor sat down and motioned for Shopi to come stand next to him. Now, what are we going to do about this? he asked. Chalmers said, Captain Callis, we are certainly alarmed at some of the things you've reported regarding your voyages across the ocean. We agree that should this Emerald Queen you spoke of attempt to cross the seas and invade the kingdom, the situation would become most difficult. I think that should these events come to pass, you can tell His Majesty we will give the most serious consideration to his requests. Callis was silent a minute. Then he looked at Nacor. I told you this would happen, Nacor said. Callus nodded. I thought we should give them the benefit of the doubt. Nacor shrugged. We've wasted nearly a month here. Callus nodded. You're right. To the other magicians in the room, he said, I am leaving Nacor here as the Crown's duly appointed representative. He will act as a ducal regent in my absence. You can't be serious said Khalid. Most serious, said Nacor. You don't have such authority, said a magician named Salind. Nacor grinned. He's the eagle of Grandor. He's the king's personal agent. He holds the rank of Duke of the King's Court in addition to being a knight captain in the armies of the West. He can have you all hung for treason. I'm returning to Grandor, said Callus to report to the prince and to get further instruction as to what we are to do with you until such time as Pug returns. Returns? said Chalmers. It's been nearly twenty years since we last saw Pug. What makes you think he will return? Nacor shook his head. Because he will need to. Are you still so narrow of vision? He stopped himself. Stupid question. Pug will be back. Until then, I think I shall have to see what needs to be changed around here. Nacor had been snooping, as was his habit, since the day they arrived, so everyone in the room knew instantly he already had a long list of things he would change. The magicians glanced at one another, then Chalmers and the others rose. Very well, said Chalmers to Callus. If you expect such behavior will bring the results you wish, you are wrong, I fear. But we shall not actively oppose you. But if you're leaving this gambler in charge, then... Let him be in charge. With that, he led the other four magicians from the chamber. Callus watched them depart, then turned to Nacor and Chopi. Will you two be all right? I will protect my master, said Chopi. Nacor made a dismissive gesture. Bah! I need no protecting from that group of old ladies. He stood up. When do you leave? he asked Callus. As soon as I can get my horse saddled in town and get started back to Shamata. There's still a half day ahead. Nacor said, I knew I was hungry. Let's get something to eat. The three of them walked down a long hall, past the now totally confused door guard, and at the end of the hallway they stopped. Callus would head outside to gather the soldiers he had brought with him to the island and take the ferry to town. Nacor and Chopi would head in the other direction, toward the common kitchen. You take care, said Callus. They gave up too easily. Nacor smiled. Oh, they're all up in Chalmers' room this moment, plotting away, no doubt. He shrugged. I've lived far longer than any of them, and not because I was careless. I'll keep an eye out for surprises. Then his mood turned serious. I've had enough time to look around to know this much. Tell the prince that there are only a few here who have the talent and the temperament to be of any help to us. The rest might be useful in some minor ways, moving messages and the like, but there are only a few real talents here. He sighed. I thought after twenty years they might have developed dozens of students around here, but I suspect those with genuine ability leave as soon as they can. Well, we need someone. We need Pug, said Nacor. Can we find him? asked Callus. He'll find us. He glanced up and down the hall. And he'll find us here, I think. How will he know we need his help? said Callus. The prince tried using the charm Pug gave Nicholas, and Pug didn't answer. Pug will know, said Nacor. Glancing around again, he added, 
He may already know. Carla stood silent a moment, nodded, turned, and without another word, walked down the hallway. Nacor took Chopi's arm in his hand. Let's get something to eat. Yes, master. And don't call me master, insisted Nacor. As you wish, master. Nacor sighed, and they walked down the hallway. What do you see? asked Miranda. Pug laughed. Nacor's up to his old tricks. I can't hear what they're saying, but I saw Chalmers and the rest of them stalk out of the council chamber. I suspect Callus left Nacor in charge. Miranda shook her head, and a rain of droplets fell around Pug's head and shoulders, striking the calm pool of water he had used for his scrying. The faint image of the distant chamber room vanished in the ripples. Hey, Pug feigned irritation. Miranda laughed and shook her head harder, making more water fly. She had just emerged from swimming in the warm ocean and had found Pug spying on the doings at Stardock in a still pool. Pug turned and grabbed for her, but she danced quickly backwards, avoiding him. Pug's laughter joined hers as she turned and started running down the beach back toward the waves. Pug felt his breath tighten for an instant at sight of a slim but muscular body glistening with water as she raced ahead of him. Almost a year of living on this island had browned both of them deeply. She was a far better swimmer than Pug, but he was faster afoot. He tackled her just as she reached the water's edge, and they both went down in a heap. Her shrieks of mock outrage joined with his laughter. You monster, she shouted as he rolled her over and playfully bit her on the neck near her shoulder. You're the one who started it, he pointed out. Lying back as the soft waves came in to cover both of them, Miranda studied Pug's features. In the year they had been together, they had become lovers and confidants, but there were still secrets between them. Pug knew almost nothing of her past, for she was adept at avoiding direct answers to many of the questions he had asked. When it had become clear she didn't wish to speak of her life before meeting him, he ceased asking. Pug held part of himself back as well, so the relationship was equitable. What is it? he asked. You've got that look. What look? The trying to read my thoughts look? Never learned that trick, she said. You do, said Pug. Though Ganina always could. Read minds. Mine, anyway, he said, turning so he could lie back on his elbows next to her. It was something of a problem when she turned thirteen or so, and didn't go away until she was nearly twenty. He shook his head as he remembered his adopted daughter's childhood. She's a grandmother now, he said softly. I've got a grandson, Arutha, and great-grandsons, James and Dashell. He fell into a reflective silence. The sun beat down on their bodies while the waves rose higher with each turn of the tide, and they were content to be silent for a few moments. When the rising tide threatened finally to wash over them, Pug stood and Miranda followed. They strolled down the beach in silence for a while. Finally, Miranda said, You've been peeking in at Stardock more often lately. Pug let out a slow breath. Things are starting to get more serious. Miranda slipped her arm into his, and as he felt her skin touch his, Pug's chest tightened again. He had loved his wife as he had thought he could love no other, but this woman, despite her mysterious past, reached parts of him he had not thought anyone could reach. After a year together, she still excited and confused him as if he were a boy, not a man in his eighties. Where did we leave our clothing? she asked. Pug stood up and glanced around. Over there, I think. They had occupied the island in a rude hut Pug had fashioned out of palms and bamboo, and had traveled at will between it and his home at Sorcerer's Isle to restock their supplies of food. Most of their time together had been given over to play, love-making, and talking of many things. But Pug had always known that this was only a respite, a time to let troubles be forgotten while they rested and prepared to face dark horrors once more. Pug followed Miranda to where their clothing lay in a heap and watched with a moment of regret as she slipped her dress over her head. He donned his black robe and said, You're thinking. Always, she said with a wry smile. No, I mean something specific. And your expression is one I've not seen before. I don't know if I like it. Worry lines marred her usually smooth forehead. She came to him and put her arms around him. I'm leaving for a time. Where are you going? 
I think I must go find Carlos. It's been too long since I have seen him. I must see what more needs to be done with him. At the mention of the son of Pug's boyhood friend, Thomas, the magician said, You say this with more than one meaning. Miranda's green eyes locked with Pug's dark brown ones, and after a moment she nodded, once, quickly. Yes. She said nothing more. When will I see you again? asked Pug. She kissed his cheek. Not as soon as either of us would like, I fear. But I will be back. Pug sighed. Well, it was bound to come to an end. She hugged him. Not ended, just interrupted. Where will you go? My island first, to confer with Gathis. Then I will return to Stardock for a while. After that, I must begin my quest. Miranda knew he meant to search for Makros the Black. Do you think you can find the sorcerer? It's been, what, nearly fifty years? Pug nodded. Since the end of the great uprising, glancing toward the blue sky, he said, but he's out there somewhere. There are a few places I have yet to search, and there's always the hall. At mention of the hall, Miranda started to laugh. What is it? asked Pug. Bold our blood. I left the mercenary at Trabert's in Yaban. I told him to wait there until I sent for him. Corey, yeah? You're very distracting, she purred, nipping at his earlobe. Stop that unless you want to postpone your departure, she said. Well, an hour or two won't make much difference. As their garments fell to the sand again, Pug said, How are you going to play, Boldar? Hall mercenaries don't come cheaply. Grinning at Pug, she said, I have a lover who's a duke. Pug smiled ruefully and said, I'll see what I can do, as he gathered her into his arms. Nine. Growth. Rue smiled. Robert de Longville walked into the shop, which was filled by the sound of workmen hammering. The building had once been a prosperous establishment, a brokerage for traders that had fallen upon hard times. Rue liked it because there was a small kitchen in the rear, so that he, Duncan, and Louise could fix meals, since they used a corner of the large warehouse as sleeping quarters, saving him the expense of hiring guards and paying rent for quarters. Sergeant, said Rue, loud enough to carry over the sounds of the workmen. The long bill glanced around. Is your latest enterprise? Rue smiled. Yes, we're expanding, and there's no longer any room behind my partner's house for more than two wagons. How many do you have? asked Robbie. Six, answered Rue. I'm now supplementing our more exotic trade with other traffic. That's why I'm here, said the long bill. Rue's interest picked up at once, and he signaled for his guest to follow him to the rear of the office. Inside the large warehouse behind the office, the noise wasn't any less deafening, but they could find a relatively peaceful corner in which to converse. How may I be of service? asked Rue. De Longville said, We've had some trouble with our freight shipments into the palace. Rue's gaze narrowed. Trouble? Trouble, was all De Longville replied. Rue nodded. Agents of the Pantathians had long been a constant source of concern to the prince and duke, and while every step was taken to ensure that no one outside those most trusted had any sense of what was being planned by the prince, there were just too many people needed around the palace on any given day to guarantee privacy. The Longville and Callas had decided after the return from Novendus that it would be less risky to keep the garrison of Callas's new army at the palace and watch closely who had contact with those men. We need a new freight hauler to deliver key shipments to the palace. Rue hid his delight. He knew that he had no competition. There wouldn't be another freight hauler who could be trusted not to say anything about what he saw at the palace. Drivers, Rue said. The Longville nodded. It's a problem. Rue said, Maybe there are some men you're training who really aren't suited for whatever it is you're planning. He kept his voice low enough that no one would be able to overhear but who are trustworthy enough to run such shipments. You want us to give you a contract and then provide you with drivers? said De Longville. Rue grinned. Not quite, but if you've already had trouble with your present freight hauler, you know that I'm going to run the same risks with any new drivers I hire. Right now it's only myself, Luis, and Duncan with the valuable goods, and three fairly reliable lads I've employed for the other three wagons. 
but I'm not willing to vouch for them. Understood, said the Longville. Well, we've convinced James to open an inn, so why not provide you with some drivers? Why not just set up your own operation and staff it with soldiers? asked Rue. Because it's too obvious, said the Longville. The reason you're here is because we need an already established freight company to cover what you're doing. Grendel and Avery has been expanding for several months now, and you've made a name for yourself. We'll call for a new contract, keeping the news low-key, but not trying to hide anything. Rue nodded. So I'll bid and win. You're not as stupid as you look, Avery. Longville lowered his voice even more and put his hand on Rue's shoulder. Look, you know why we have to be careful, and you also know what's at risk. Rue nodded, though he tried to think little about what he had gone through across the sea when he was a soldier in Callus's company. Here's the deal. You make sure that whatever we need gets delivered in timely fashion, and I'll make sure you get paid in timely fashion. And don't go thinking you can charge us outrageous prices, else we'll try our hand at freight hauling. De Longville grinned, and it was an expression Rue knew all too well. What he was about to hear wasn't going to be funny. After the Duke and I contrive a way to either put you out of business or get you hung for some crime or another. Rue had no doubt at all that should conditions warrant it, in De Longville's judgment, he would happily hang Rue on a trumped-up charge. The man was single-minded in his desire to protect the kingdom to a point bordering on the fanatical. Rue said, just getting paid in a timely fashion would be novel. You can't believe what I have to go through collecting some of these bills. De Longville's grin broadened, and this time there was humor in it. Certainly I can. Just because a man has a title doesn't mean he has two coins to rub together. He inspected the yard and asked, How many wagons can you devote to your new service to the palace? How many deliveries a week do you need? asked Rue. De Longville reached into his tunic and pulled out a parchment, handing it to Rue. This ship's due in tomorrow from Illith. This is the cargo heading to the palace. We should be looking at similar deliveries two, three times a week from now on. Rue's eyes widened at the size of the cargo. Some army you're building, Sergeant. You've enough swords here to invade Kesh. If we need to. Can you do it? Rue nodded. I'm going to have to buy three, maybe four more wagons, and if you step up your demand for unloading... He studied the Longville's face. What about incoming caravans? The Longville said, We're unloading them at the city gate, and we'll need you to transport the freight through the city. Rue shook his head in wonder. I'd better get five wagons. He calculated in his head and realized he was short of gold. Without changing expression, he said, I'll need some gold to close the deal. The Longville said, How much? A hundred sovereigns. That'll get me the wagons and mules, and hire some drivers, but make sure you do get me paid quickly, because I don't have any reserves. Well, we'll make it a bit more, said the Longville. I can't have you going insolvent because you weren't ready for trouble. He drew a purse out of his tunic and handed it to Rupert. Then he put his hands on Rue's shoulders, leaning close. You're far more important to us than you think, Avery. Don't create any problems for yourself or for us. And down the road, you're going to be a very rich man. An army needs quartermasters and paymasters as much as it needs sergeants and generals. Don't make a mess of this understand? Rue nodded, not quite sure he did. Let me put it another way. If you cause me or the captain the slightest problem anywhere along the way, the trivial fact you are no longer a soldier in our command will spare you no pain whatsoever. I'll have your guts on a stick, as if you were just down from the gibbet that first day I took your life and made it mine. Now, do you understand? Rue's expression darkened. Yes, but I still don't care for threats, Sergeant. Oh, those aren't threats, my pretty. Those are merely the facts of life. Then he grinned. You can call me Barbie if you wish. Rue mumbled something and then said, Very well, Bobby. How's your love life? Any wedding plans soon? Rue shrugged. I asked her father, and he said he'd consider it. If he says yes, then I'll ask her. De Longville rubbed the stubble on his chin as he said, From what you said a few weeks ago, I thought it already agreed. Rue shrugged. Helmut has made me a partner, and I dine with him in Carly twice a week, and I escort her down to the town market or square on sixth day, but... He shrugged. Go on with it. 
instructed the Longbill. The girl doesn't like me. Doesn't like you or doesn't like the idea you're marrying her for her father's business? Rue shrugged. Louise says I need to win her, but... But what? I just don't find her very interesting, said Rue. The Longville was quiet a moment, then said, When you're ticking her about and trying to woo her, Avery, what do you talk about? Rue shrugged again. I try to make myself interesting to her, so I talk about what we're doing, her father and I, or what I did during the war. As the Longville's expression darkened, he added, Nothing that would displease the captain, certainly. I'm more discreet than that. The Longville said, Here's a suggestion. Ask her a question. What question? Any question. Ask her something about herself. Ask her opinion on some subject. The Longville grinned. You might discover that you are not as captivating a topic of conversation as you seem to think you are. Rue sighed. I'll try anything. As they walked toward the door to the office, he added, I'll have wagons at the docks at first light. You'd better have your five drivers here an hour before dawn. They'll be here, said the Longville, without looking back as he passed through the door into the front office. The door closed. Rue glanced at the bill of lading and began to calculate. An hour later, Helmut Grindel entered the workshop area and signaled to Avery, who was overseeing the installation of iron gates on the front of stalls where valuables would be warehoused before shipping. Rue crossed to stand before his partner and, he hoped, soon to be father-in-law, and said, Yes? Helmut Grindel said, I am taking the shipment of valuables to Ravensburg myself. Some of the more expensive items are to be shown to the Baron's mother, and given your past relationship, I thought it best if you didn't make this journey. Rue nodded. A good idea. Glancing around, he said, And there's still too much work to oversee here for me to leave. Are you stopping by for dinner? asked Grindel. Rue considered. I think I'll stay here and make sure we're well along on the work. Would you be so kind as to tell Carly I'll call on her tomorrow? Grindel's eyes narrowed and his expression became unreadable. After a moment, he said, Very well. Without further remark, he departed and Rue turned his attention back to the matters at hand. He had come to know his older partner well over the months they had been working together, but when it came to matters concerning Carly, Rue wasn't entirely sure what the old man thought. Several times in the course of the evening, he wondered what had been passing through his wily partner's mind at that minute. Rue sat quietly in the parlor. With a father taking a wagon of luxury goods to Darkmoor, Carly and Rue were alone in the house for the first time. Previously, either they had dined with her father, or Rue had escorted her out to one of the fairs in the city or to the market. Rue spent much of the early part of the evening alone, since Carly insisted on taking charge of the kitchen herself. As Rue had discovered, there was a cook as well as a maid living in the outwardly modest Grindle home, but Carly had never allowed anyone to care for her father but herself. Now that supper was over, they sat quietly in a room Helmut used to entertain business guests, one he called the sitting room. Still, Rue now admitted that the comfort and privacy of the room made it easy to relax. He sat on a small divan, and Carly sat on a chair next to it. Carly spoke softly, as she always did. Is there something wrong? Rue came out of his reverie. No, nothing really. I was just thinking about how odd it seems having an entire room of a house devoted to doing nothing but sitting and talking. Back in Ravensburg, the only time we got to talk was over meals at the inn where Eric's mother worked, or when we were out doing something. The girl nodded and kept her eyes down. Silence fell. After a moment, Rue said, When is your father expected back? Two weeks, if all goes as planned, she answered. Rue studied the plump girl. She kept her hands quietly in her lap, and her posture was upright, but not stiff or rigid. Her downcast eyes gave him a moment to study her face again. He had been looking for something in that face to arouse him since the day he had met her. He had a coldly calculated plan here to woo and win this girl and use her father's good offices to rise as a merchant, but each time he found himself with any opportunity to press his suit to her, he could think of nothing to say. He had at last come to the realization that he found nothing remotely attractive in her. He had coupled with whores far uglier than Carly, with a taste of sour wine and bad teeth on their breath. But that had been on the trail during war, and the prospect of looming death made each encounter urgent. This was different. This was a commitment of a lifetime, and carried with it great responsibilities. 
He was contemplating marriage and having children with this girl, yet he knew almost nothing about her. Luis had said, woo her, and Longville had said to stop talking about himself. Finally, Ruth said, Carly. Yes. She glanced up at him. Uh, he began, then in a rush, what do you think of this new contract for the palace? Rue cursed himself for an idiot before the words had finished echoing in the air. Here he was, trying to convince this girl he would be a fit lover and husband, and the first question he asked was about business. But instead of looking put out, she smiled slightly. You want to know what I think? She asked shyly. Well, you know your father, he quickly said. You've been around his work all your life, I guess. He found himself feeling more like an idiot each passing second. I mean, you must have come to a conclusion or two on your own. What do you think? I'm telling you, you'll pay you... The girl's smile broadened a little more. I think having a steady flow of income, even a modest one, is far less risky than continuing to depend on luxuries. Rue nodded. That's what I thought. He decided she didn't need to understand that he was the only freight hauler in the city the prince would trust to bring in those critical supplies. Father always talks of maximizing profits, but when he does, he also takes great risks. He's had setbacks that have made it very difficult at times. Her voice lowered as she realized she seemed to be criticizing her father. He tends to remember the good times and forget the bad. Rue shook his head. I'm the opposite, I think. If anything, I remember the bad all too easily. Then he realized something about himself. Truth to tell, there haven't been all that many good times. She was silent, and he shifted the topic of conversation. So, you think this contract for the palace a good one? Yes, she said, and then fell silent again. Trying to think of the best way to draw her out, Rue at last said, What about the contract is good? She smiled. For the first time since he had met her, Rue saw genuine amusement in her expression, and he was surprised to discover that she had dimples. For a brief instant, he discovered that when she smiled, she wasn't anything close to being as plain as he had thought. Suddenly, finding himself flushing, he said, Could I say something funny? Yes. She lowered her eyes again. You didn't tell me anything about the contract, so how would I know what about it could be good? Rue laughed. Obviously, she just knew the basics of the contract, and given how little he had been able to share with Helmut, he realized she knew even less. Well, it's like this, he began. They talked, and Rue was astonished to find that Carly knew a great deal more about her father's business than he ever would have suspected. More, she had a good mind for business. She asked questions at key moments and discovered weaknesses that Rue hadn't anticipated. Somewhere during the course of the night, Rue had opened a bottle of wine, and they sipped at it. He had never noticed Carly drinking before, and he recalled with some self-condemnation that he had never really paid attention to the girl. Over the weeks he had been coming to pay court to her, he had really been trying to impress her, not to get to know her. At one point he noticed she had risen to trim the wick in a lamp, then, before he realized it, he heard a cock crow. Glancing at the window, he saw the sky beginning to lighten and said, God, I've been talking to you all night. Carly laughed and blushed. I've enjoyed it. My son, Rue invoked the goddess of truth. So have I. It's been a long time since I've had anyone to talk to. He halted. She was now staring at him and smiling. On an impulse, he leaned over and kissed her. He had never tried before, and almost drew back, fearful that he had overstepped his bounds. She didn't resist, and it was a tender, soft kiss. Rue slowly pulled away, now completely confused. Uh, he said, I'll call for you tomorrow, tonight, if you don't mind. We can visit the evening market, if you like. The last came out in a rush. She lowered her eyes, again now embarrassed. I would like that. He moved toward the door, but kept facing her, as if he were fearful of turning his back. And we can talk, he said. Yes, she answered as she rose to follow him to the door. I would like that very much. Rue almost fled. He was so confused. Outside the door safely closed between them, he paused and wiped his forehead. He was perspiring and felt hot to his own touch. 
What is this? He wondered. He decided he needed to consider more fully the consequences of this campaign he had started of winning Helmut Grindel's daughter. As the city awoke around him, Rue returned to the office and the seemingly endless work ahead. Six wagons rolled to the gate, and a guard waved Rue to halt. The guard wore the usual tabard of the Prince of Crondor, the yellow outline of an eagle soaring above a peak contained in a circle of dark blue. The only change Rue noticed was that the gray tabard was now trimmed in royal purple with yellow. For the first time in memory, a crown prince, heir to the throne of the Kingdom of the Isles, now ruled the Western Realm. Rue struggled to remember what that meant. He was vaguely aware that tradition held that the prince should rule in Crondor until assuming the throne, but that recent history had placed Arutha, father to the king, on the throne of Crondor, but he wasn't heir to the crown. Rue thought he might ask someone about that if he remembered. The guard said, Your business? Delivery for Sergeant de Longville, was all Rue had been instructed to say. At mention of that name, Jado Shotty seemed to materialize out of nowhere, though he merely had been in the shadow of the guardhouse next to the gate. He wore the black tunic of Callus's special forces, with only the crimson eagle above his heart for marking. Let them in, he said in his deep voice. He grinned at Rue. They'll get used to your face, Avery. Rue smiled back. If he got used to yours, mine will be easy, Chato laughed. And you're such a handsome fellow after all. Then Rue noticed the sleeve on his old companion's tunic and said, You've got a third stripe. You're a sergeant? Jado's broad smile seemed to widen. That's the truth, man. Eric, too? What about the Longville? Asked Rue as the gate swung wide. He urged his team of mules forward. He's still our lord and master, said Jado. But he's now called the Major Sergeant, or Sergeant Major, I can never remember which. As the first wagon with Rue aboard passed, he said, Eric will tell you, he's going to oversee the unloading. Rue waved and steered his team into the yard. This was not his first delivery to the palace, but it was his biggest. A caravan of trade goods from Kesh and the Vale of Dreams had arrived from the south, and attached to it had been goods marked for the palace, specifically for Knight Marshal William. It was now a standing order that anything earmarked for Callus's special force was to be shipped to the night marshal. The palace brokers who controlled the flow of goods in and out of the harbor and the caravanseries outside the city were notified that all such cargo was to be shipped directly to the palace via wagons owned by Grindel and Avery. A newly erected warehouse stood alongside the outer wall of the palace, cutting the marshalling yard in half for its entire length. Rue had puzzled over its construction the last few times he had visited the palace, but had said nothing. He pulled his team up before the entrance, where three figures waited. Eric waved, as did Greylock, once swordmaster to the Baron of Darkmoor. Next to them stood the Knight Marshal himself, and behind him squatted his pet, the green-scaled flying lizard, as Rue thought of it. Gentlemen, said Rue, as he dismounted the wagon, where do you want this unloaded? Greylock said, I'm in with a load. It's going in here. He waved toward the newly finished warehouse. Eric signaled, and a full squad of soldiers in black tunics hurried and untied the lash down covering the wagon. They lowered the tailgate and began to unload cargo. Rue said, Chado said congratulations are in order. Eric shrugged. We've been promoted. Greylock put his hand on Rue's shoulder. They both need the rank. Our chain of command is beginning to emerge. The night marshal's pet hissed, and Lord William said, Hush, Fantas. Rupert has served with us before. Captain Greylock isn't spilling state secrets to the enemy. As if he understood, the creature, a fire drake, Rue now recalled, settled down at the night marshal's boots. He stretched forth his neck, and Lord William scratched him behind the eye ridges. Captain Greylock, said Rue, what is this? Greylock shrugged. It makes things easier in dealing with the normal army command. Our unit is unusual he said, glancing at Lord William to see if he was overstepping his authority by talking to Rue. When the night marshal ignored him, Greylock continued, I have a lot of things to do, and this way I never have to ask anyone's permission. Lord William smiled and said, Except mine, of course. And the captain's, said Eric. Which captain? asked Rue. Greylock smiled. I'm a captain, Rue. There is only one man who's the captain. 
callous. Of course, said Rue, as the second wagon was unloaded. He waved to the driver and shouted, Take it back to the warehouse. I'll be along shortly. The driver, one of the former soldiers of this very command, waved in reply and moved the mules ahead, turned them in a half circle, and headed back toward the gate. Where is thee, Captain? asked Rue. In the palace, talking with the prince, said Greylock. At that, Knight Marshal William glanced at Greylock and gave a slight shake of his head. Rue looked at Eric, who seemed to be intently watching the exchange. After a moment, Rue audibly sighed. Very well. I won't say anything. But when are you leaving? Knight Marshal William took one step and put himself right before Rue. What do you mean, leaving? Rue smiled. I may not be a student of the military like my good friend Eric here, my lord, but I was a soldier. He glanced at the mounting pile of goods in the warehouse. This isn't usual provisions for an extra garrison here in the palace. You're mounting an expedition. You're going down... He glanced from face to face. There, again. Knight Marshal William said, You'd be advised to keep your speculation to yourself, Rupert Avery. You're trusted, but only to a point. Rue shrugged. I'm saying nothing outside these walls, so don't worry. Then he considered something and added, But I'm not the only one who can figure this out, just watching what comes in and what doesn't go out. Knight Marshal William looked irritated at that observation. Turning to Greylock and Eric, he said, Take care of that. I think I need to speak with Duke James. He snapped his fingers and pointed skyward, and the fire drake sprang into the air, his wings beating down with furious power. William said to the startled Rue, I told him to go hunt. He's old and claims he can't see as well as he used to, but the truth is he's lazy. If I let the kitchen staff beat him scraps, he'd be as big as one of your mules and unable to get off the ground. The last was said with a rueful smile. The night marshal walked away, and Rue said, He claims he can't see as well as he used to? Eric laughed. Don't underestimate the night marshal. I've heard stories from the palace staff. Greylock laughed as well. They say he can speak to animals, and they can speak to him. Rue looked to see if he was being made fun of. Eric recognized his boyhood friend's expression and said, No, he's serious. I've seen him do it with the horses. Shaking his head emphatically, he said, Truth of the gods! Looking after the retreating back of the night marshal, he said, Think of what a horse heater he would have been. Greylock put his hand on Eric's shoulder. Eric's gifts in healing horses were what had brought him to Greylock's attention years before and had caused them to become friends. It takes more than knowing the animals in pain, Eric. What's a horse going to tell you about a bruised bone beneath a hoof or an abscess? It hurts is about as much as Lord William gets, from what I've heard. You still have to know what to do to find the problem and heal it. Maybe, said Eric. He turned to Rue. Do you have any suggestions about ways to mask what we're doing here? Off the top of my head, no. Maybe if you let me pick up a few other shipments... And if you route a few false ones with a notation about the night marshal on them, he pointed past his last wagon toward the gate into the palace, route them through that gate, send them somewhere else in the palace, but let them see this. He pointed to the front of the warehouse. Let them see it, said Greylock. Yes, said Rue. He smiled a smile familiar to Eric. Eric's own smile broadened until the two old friends stood grinning at each other. Let them see it. He turned to Greylock. Captain, let them see it. Yes, we'll let them see what's here, but it will be what we want them to see. Greylock rubbed his chin with one hand. Perhaps. What would we have them see? Who said, look, those lizard people know we're getting ready for them. He waved his hand around the facade of the building. Make this look like a new barracks. A place to house a large army inside the palace won't get their attention much. Greylock nodded. That might work. Eric shrugged. We know they've got agents in the city. We've always assumed they have, anyway. Just then a guard ran from the gate toward them. My lord, he called. Greylock smiled self-consciously. I'll never get used to that. My lord? Echoed Rue. Eric grinned. We've all got some sort of court rank or another to keep the minor officials out of our hair. Nobody is quite sure who is who, so we all tend to be addressed that way by those outside our command. What? shouted Greylock. A man without the gate, my lord, demanding to see the master of this freight company. Rue said, Who is it? He says he's your cousin. After a moment's hesitation, the soldier added, Sir? Rue didn't wait and started running toward the gate. 
He passed his own wagons heading out and ran to the outer gate. Just outside, he found Duncan sitting on his horse, looking fretful. What is it? demanded Rue. Duncan said, It's Helmet. He's been injured. Rue said, Where? He's back at the house. Carly sent me to fetch you. Rue said, Get down! Duncan complied and said, I'll ride back with the wagons. Rue nodded, set heels to the horse's flank, and was off at a gallop before the words were out of Duncan's mouth. Rue nearly ran down a half dozen people on his mad dash through the city to his partner's house. He found two of his workers outside the door and tossed the horse's reins to one of them, passing the other man as he made his way through the entrance. Luis was waiting for him and told him he was ambushed. How is he? asked Rue. Luis shook his head. Bad. Carly is upstairs with him. Rue hurried up the stairs and realized he had never been up to the second floor of the house before. He glanced into one door and saw a small room, furnished in a plain fashion, which he guessed was the maid's room. The next was decorated with silk draperies, colorful wall hangings, and warm woolen rugs. He guessed it was Carly's room. He heard her voice as he reached the end of the hall. The door was open, and as he entered the room, he saw his business partner lying on a bed, his daughter at his side. Carly was drawn and pale, but she wasn't crying. On the other side of the bed stood a priest of Killian, goddess of farmers, foresters, and sailors. As a deity of nature, her priests were reputed to be healers, though often as not the patient died. How is he? asked Rue. Carly only shook her head, while the priest said, He has lost a great deal of blood. Rue went to the side of the bed and glanced down at the older man. He looked positively frail, Rue thought with alarm. Where before he had seemed only an older man, now he appeared ancient. His head was bandaged, as was his chest. What happened? asked Rue. He was attacked last night, outside the city, said Carly, her voice sounding like a child's. Some farmers found him in a ditch and brought him in after you had already left for the palace this morning. I sent for the priest, and when he got here, sent Duncan to find you. Rue hesitated. Then, remembering the lessons taught him by Nacor while they served together, made a couple of signs in the air and placed his hand upon Helmut's chest. Instantly, he felt the connection as energy flowed from his hands. The priest looked at him, and his expression became one of suspicion. What are you doing? he asked. This is a healing I was taught, answered Rue. Who taught you? asked the priest. Rather than try to explain Nacor to anyone, Rue simply said, A monk of Dala taught me this. The priest nodded. I thought I recognized the Reiki. Shrugging it off, he said, It can't harm him. It will either help his healing or aid him in leaving this life. Turning to Carly, the priest directed, If he regains consciousness, have him drink the herbs in a warm cup of water. As soon as he can, get him to eat something, a little broth and bread. Carly's eyes were suddenly suffused with hope. Will he live? The priest's manner bordered on the brusque, but he kept his voice low as he replied, I said, if he regains consciousness. It's the goddess's will. Without another word, the priest departed, leaving Carly and Rue alone. Time passed. After nearly an hour of doing what he could for Helmut, Rue removed his hands, which still tingled from the energy he had given the stricken man. Leaning over, he whispered in Carly's ear, I'll be back. There are some things I need to see to. She nodded as he left the room and went downstairs to find Duncan and Louise waiting. How is he? asked Duncan. Not good, Rue answered. He shook his head, indicating the old man might not regain consciousness. Well, what now? asked Louise. Rue said, Get back to the office and make sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to be. Louise nodded and departed. To Duncan, Rue said, Head down to the inns near the gate. See if you can find anyone who knows anything about what happened. Especially see if you can find out who those farmers were that found Helmut. I want to talk to them. Duncan said, You don't think bandits? This close to the city, replied Rue. No, I think... I don't want to think. He took his cousin by the arm and moved him toward the door. I'm so tired I can't see, and this day is only half over, he sighed. Find out what you can. I'll be here. Duncan patted his cousin on the shoulder and departed. Rue found the maid standing near the kitchen, her distress clearly showing. Mary, said Rue, bring Carly some tea. As the girl hesitated, Rue said, thank you. The girl nodded and returned to the kitchen. Rue mounted the stairs and came to stand behind Carly. He hesitated, then put his hand on her shoulder. I asked Mary to bring you some tea. He said, Thank you, she answered, but never took her eyes from her father. The day passed slowly, and as the afternoon shadows lengthened into night, Duncan returned. 
He had found nothing useful from any of those claiming to know something about the injured man fetched into the city that morning. Rue told him to return to the inns near the gate and start looking for someone spending money freely or boasting about sudden wealth. Rue had no idea what helmet might have been carrying back from Darkmoor, but he knew exactly what the items he had taken were worth. Whoever had robbed Rue's partner had pillaged Grindle and Avery of more than two-thirds of their current net worth. More than a year's profits were gone. Night came. Mary brought supper, but neither of them ate. They watched the still form of Helmut as he fought for life. His breathing seemed easier, at least Ruth thought so, but through the early hours of night the man barely moved. Carly dozed, her head on the side of her father's bed, while Ruth slept in a chair he had fetched in from the sitting room. He stirred as he heard his name. Suddenly awake, he came to stand over Carly as Helmut's eyes flickered open. Then he realized it had been the old man speaking his name. Carly said, Father, and leaned over him. Rue said nothing as the girl embraced her father. The old man whispered, and his daughter moved away. He said your name. Rue leaned over. I'm here, Helmut. The old man reached out and whispered, Carly, care for her. Rue glanced back and saw the girl hadn't heard what her father had said. Rue whispered, I will, Helmut. You have my word on it. Then the old man whispered a word. Rue stood up, and he knew his face had become a mask of outrage, for the girl looked at him and said, What is it? Rue forced himself to calmness and replied, I'll tell you later. Glancing down at the old man, whose eyes were fluttering, he said, He needs you. Carly moved to stand next to her father and took his hand. I'm here, father, she whispered, but the old man had lapsed back into unconsciousness. Just before dawn, Helmut Grindel died. The ceremony was simple, as Rue knew the old man would have wanted. Carly wore the black veil of mourning and watched in silence as the priest of Lim's Kragma, goddess of death, pronounced the benediction and then lit the funeral pyre. The inner courtyard of the temple was busy that morning, for a half dozen funerals were underway. Each was contained in a marked-off area of the temple park, but above the shielding hedges, the smoke rising from other flaming beers could be seen. They waited in silence. Carly, Rue, Duncan, Luis, Mary, and two of the workmen who represented the employees of Grendel and Avery. Rue glanced around and thought to himself that this was a modest enough turnout for a man who had spent his life selling riches to the powerful and influential of the kingdom. A few notes of condolence from other businessmen had arrived over the last two days, but not one of those nobles who had been among Helmut's best customers had deemed it appropriate to send even a single line of comfort to the merchant's daughter. Rue vowed that when he finally died, the kingdom's rich and powerful would be in attendance. When at last the corpse was consumed by flame, Carly turned and said, Let's go. Rue gave her his arm and escorted the girl to a rented carriage. Once she and Mary were inside, he said, Tradition says I have to stand the employees to a farewell drink. We're doing it at the warehouse. Will you be all right? I'm fine, Carly said. Despite her pale appearance, her voice was calm and her eyes free of tears. She had finished crying the day before and showed a strength that Rue found surprising. I'll be along later, he said. Then he added, if you don't mind, that is. I'd like that, she said with a smile. Rue closed the carriage door and said, Driver, take her home. Duncan, Louise, and the workmen accompanied Rue in silence as they walked from Crondor's Temple Square. When they were free of the center part of the city and halfway back to the warehouse, Louise said, Gods, I hate funerals. Duncan said, I doubt even the priests of the death goddess are overly fond of them. Rue said, I'll stink of wood smoke for a week. One of the workers said, And death. Rue threw the man a glance, but nodded. One of the features of the Temple of the Death Goddess was the ever-present wood smoke that hung around the place. Herbs and other scented woods were placed in the fire, but there was always a hint of something else in the fumes, something that Rue would rather not think of. He had smelled enough of it during the sack of Moharta to recognize the stench of burning flesh. Reaching the warehouse, they entered and found the drivers and other workers standing around. Several bottles of strong ale were arrayed upon a bench and were quickly opened and passed around. When each man held one, Rue said, Helmut Grendel, hard but fair, a good partner, a loving father, and deserving of kindness. May Lim's Gragma be merciful, said Louise. They drank to Helmut's memory and talked of him. No one had worked for the man longer than Rue. 
As successful as Helmut had been, until he had joined forces with Rue, he had always operated alone. In less than a year, Rue had more than tripled Grendel's income. And now seven men, besides Duncan and Luis, worked full-time for Grendel and Avery. Given there was not much history among the men who now worked for Rue, the discussion quickly turned to wondering how the old man had died. Rue listened a while, then sent the workers home early. When the workers had gone, Rue held a quick conference with Luis and Duncan, sharing with them what Helmut had said. They discussed what they needed to do, and when at last plans had been made, Rue departed. He was so filled with anger and dark purpose that he nearly walked past Carly's house. He knocked upon the door, and when Mary opened the door, she instantly stepped aside so that Rue might enter. Carly had changed from the traditional black clothes of mourning to something that bordered on the festive, a bright blue gown with lace trim. Rue was amazed to find a full dinner waiting and suddenly discovered he was famished. They ate in near silence. Finally, Carly said, you seem so distant. Rue blushed and said, I'm so caught up in my own anger about your father, I haven't given any thought to what you must be going through. He reached across the corner of the table that separated them and took her hand. He gave it a gentle squeeze and said, I am sorry. She returned to the squeeze. No need. I understand. They finished eating and Mary cleared the table while they moved to the sitting room. Rue said nothing as she fetched him a brandy, far finer than anything her father had ever served. In a moment of surprisingly strong feeling, Rue said, Helmet. Held up the goblet a moment in salute, then drank the brandy quickly. Carly sat and said, I'm still unable to think that he will not walk through that door in a moment. Rue glanced toward the door and nodded. I understand. He felt the same way. Suddenly, Carly said, What am I going to do? What do you mean? asked Rue. With father gone? Suddenly she was in tears again, and Rue found himself with his arms around her shoulders while she sobbed against his chest. After a moment, he said, I promised your father I would take care of you. Carly said, I know you meant well, but you don't need to say something you'll be sorry for later. Rue said, I don't understand. Carly forced her voice to calmness. I know father intended us to marry, Rupert. You're the first of those who came to see him that he took a liking to. But I also know that he was getting on in years and worried about just this circumstance. He never talked to me, but it was clear that after a while he expected we would simply decide to wed. But the business is now yours. You needn't feel any obligation. Rue felt as if the room were turning on its side. He didn't know how much of that was the brandy, the long hours, the anger he felt, or his dealing with this strange, often unreadable girl. Connie, he said slowly, I know your father had plans for us. He lowered his eyes. And truth to tell, when I first came here, I was ready to court you to win his approval without thought for you or your feelings. He fell silent a moment, then said, I don't know if this is something I can explain, but I have come to value you. I find I enjoy the time we spend together. I do feel some obligation to your father, but my feelings toward you are more than that. She regarded him a moment, then said, Do not lie to me, Rupert. He kept his arms around her waist. I will not do that. I do care, Carly. Let me prove it to you. She was silent, studying his face. As seconds passed, she looked deep into his eyes, then at last took his hand in hers and said, Come with me. She led him up the stairs to her room and inside. Then she closed the door behind her. She put her hand upon his chest and pushed him to the foot of her bed until he sat down upon it. Quickly, she undid the fastenings of her gown and let it fall to the floor. Then she undid the shoulder ties of a short chemise and, with a single shake, caused it to fall atop the dress. Nude, she stood before him in the light of the single candle on the nightstand. Connie's breasts were young and firm, but her waist was thick, as were her hips and thighs. Her face still lacked any quality that any man would call pretty, save her eyes, which were shining in the light. This is what I am, she said, her voice full of emotion. I'm plain and fat, and I don't have a rich father anymore. Can you love this? 
Drew found his own eyes filling as he rose and took her into his arms. Swallowing hard, he willed his voice to calmness as he said, No one has accused me of being any lady's fancy. A single tear fell down his cheek as he said, I used to be called Ratface, and worse. Looks on everything. She put her head on his chest and said, Stay. Later, Rue lay staring upward in the dark while Carly slept in his arms. They had made love, awkwardly and with a frantic edge, that was more a demand for acceptance than anything freely given. Carly had shown no skills, and Rue had forced himself to be more attentive than he had wished. At some point he had promised to marry her, and he was vaguely aware that he was now engaged to be married after the mourning period was over. But in the darkness his mind turned once more to his anger and the plans he, Duncan, and Louise had made. For the one thing he had not told Carly was what her father had whispered to him before he died. It had been a name. Jacoby. Ten. Plans. Rue held up his hand. There are three things I need to discuss with you, he said. Carly had given him permission to use her dining room to hold a meeting with Louise and Duncan. She even managed not to look disappointed when he asked her to leave them alone. Louise glanced at Duncan, who shrugged, indicating he had no idea what was coming. We're here instead of at the warehouse because I wanted to be certain there was no chance of anyone overhearing us. You suspect one of our workmen of something? asked Louise. Rue shook his head. No, but the fewer of us who know what we plan, the less risk we have of our enemies finding out. Enemies, said Duncan. Who are we at war with now? Rue lowered his voice to just more than a whisper. There's a piece of walking scum named Tim Jacoby who had Helmut killed. Louis said, Jacoby? Duncan nodded. Son of a traitor named Frederick Jacoby. Jacoby and sons. Louis shook his head. I've not heard of them. Rue said, Spend a few more months working in Crondor in the freight-hauling trade and you will. They are not our biggest rivals, but they are important. Rue leaned back, an obvious frustration showed on his face. Helmut told me it was the Jacobis who robbed his wagon. Can we go to the city watch? said Luis. With what? said Duncan. We have no proof. We have a dying man's declaration, said Luis. Duncan shook his head. That might do if Rue here was a noble or some such, but without someone important having heard it, a priest or city watchman at the least, it's Rue's word against this Jacoby. And his father is very well connected, said Rue. They are working with some of the bigger trading concerns in the Western realm, and if I said anything to anyone, they'd claim it false and say I was just trying to hurt their business. Louise shrugged. It is always this way with the powerful. They can do what the rest of us cannot. Rue said, I've half a mind to go pay Tim Jacoby a visit this night. Louise shrugged. You can always do that, young Rue. He leaned forward, his deformed hand lying on the table before him, as he pointed with his left forefinger at Rue. But ask yourself, what good would it do, save to get you back to the gallows? I've got to do something. Louise nodded. Time will bring an opportunity for revenge, he considered. You said Jacoby and sons, Duncan. Is there a brother? Duncan said, yes, Tim's the elder. Randolph, the other, is a decent enough man from what people say, but he's fiercely loyal to his family. Louis said, In Rhodes, when a man wrongs another man, we fight a duel. But when a family wrongs another family, we wage war. It may be a quiet war, one that lasts for generations, but ultimately one family is destroyed. Rue said, I'm going to have to struggle to keep this business alive, Louis. Waging war is costly. Louise shrugged. The war has begun. It may not be stopped until you either win or are defeated. But no one says the next battle must be tonight. Bide your time. Build your strength. Reduce your enemy's position. When you finally have the opportunity, then seize the moment. He made a crushing gesture with his good hand. Often you'll hear it said that revenge is a dish best served cold. This is a mistake. You must never lose the heat of rage that drives you to revenge. He studied Rue's face. Forgiveness is a virtue in some temples, but if you are not virtuous, 
act and study your enemy. He tapped his head. Think. Think about what drives him and what his strengths and weaknesses are. Keep the fires within banked and plot coolly. But when everything is in place, unleash the fire and enjoy the hot flush of revenge. Rue blew air out of his mouth slowly, as if letting his anger escape. Very well. We wait. But make it known to our men that any rumors concerning Jacobian sons should be shared with us. What's the next thing? Asked Duncan. I've got a lady to visit, he grinned. Rue smiled. Helmut kept our books and records. I have some sense of it, but I'm no expert. Can either of you keep books? Louis shook his head, and Duncan laughed. I've never been one for sums, you know that. Then we need to hire someone. Who? asked Duncan. Rue said, I don't know. Maybe Jason over at Barrett's. He was good with figures when we worked together. McKellar had him doing inventories more often than anyone else. He could remember things, costs and numbers of sacks of coffee and details that I had no clear picture of. I'll ask him. He's ambitious. Maybe he'll work for us. Can we pay him? Duncan asked with a laugh. Rue said, we have the contract with the palace. I'll ask De Longville to make sure we get paid on time, and we'll get by. What's the third thing? asked Louise. Rue's face underwent a change of expression, from anger and worry to self-consciousness. I'm getting married. Louise said, Congratulations. He held out his hand, and Rue gripped it. Duncan said, Carly? Who else? said Rue. Duncan shrugged. When? Next sixth day. Can you join us? Certainly, said Duncan, standing up. If we're done, you can leave, said Rue, feeling disappointed at his cousin's lack of enthusiasm. After Duncan left, Louise said, This is a difficult responsibility to assume, Rue. What do you mean? Louise said, It is not my business. I am sorry I spoke. Rue asked, What's on your mind? Louise said nothing for a moment, then said, you seem to like the girl, but are you marrying her because you feel someone must take care of her and you're the only one? Rue started to deny it, then found he couldn't. I don't know. I like her, and a wife... Well, a wife is a wife, right? I need a wife and some children. Why? Rue looked completely confused. I... Well, I just do. I mean... I plan on being a man of some importance in the city, and I need a wife and children. Louise studied the young man a while. As you say, I will return to the office and mention to the men there will be a wedding on sixth day. Rue said, I'll tell Eric and Jado tomorrow. Maybe the captain will come if he's still in the city. Louise nodded. As he passed behind Rue's chair, he stopped and put his hand on the younger man's shoulder. I wish you happiness, my friend. I really do. Thank you, said Rue as Louise left. A moment later, Carly entered the room. I heard them leave. Rue nodded. I told them we were getting married on sixth day. Carly sat down in the chair Duncan had occupied. Are you certain? Rue forced a smile. Of course I am, he said, patting her hand. But inside he felt like nothing more than leaving this house and running for all he was worth. Of course I am, he repeated. He glanced out a curtained window, as if he could see through the fabric, and in his mind's eye he saw the pale face of Helmut as he lay on his deathbed. His skin was bone white, the same color as the large bolt of silk Rue had stolen. And in his heart Rue knew that there was a thread leading from that bolt to Helmut, and that Carly's father's death lay at his feet. Patting the girl's hand, Rue knew that even if he hated the girl, he would marry her to make up for the wrong he had caused. Callus pushed himself back from the table, stood up, and moved to a window. Staring out at the marshalling yard below, he said, I've got a bad feeling about all of this. Prince Nicholas sat back in his chair, glanced at his nephew, then to Knight Marshal William, who nodded agreement. It's a desperate gamble, said William. Patrick, who sat at the head of the council table, said, Uncle, you've seen this personally. You've traveled to that distant land more than once. He glanced around the room. I am prepared to admit that some of my reluctance comes from not having first-hand experience, I should say, with these Pantathians. Nicholas said, I've seen what they can do, Patrick, and I scarcely believe what we're told. 
He waved at a pile of papers on the table before them. Dispatches had arrived by fast courier as a relay of ships wended their way between Crondor, the far coast, the Sunset Islands, and the distant continent of Novendus. The reports that had arrived the morning before had been sent from Novendus less than a month after Greylock and Louise had departed, and the news was not good. Duke James, who sat beside Knight Marshal Williams, said, We know that our guesses were overly optimistic. Destroying the shipyards at Maharta and the city of the Serpent River didn't buy us as many years as we thought. Ten years, said Callus. I remember thinking it would take them ten years to rebuild and refit and launch a fleet big enough to carry that host across the ocean. Patrick said, What do you judge now, Captain? Callus sighed. The first outward display of emotion any in the room had seen from him since his return from Stardock. Four more, maybe five. Nicholas said, We well, didn't count on an enemy who was willing to turn every resource at hand to rebuilding those yards and starting that fleet. We didn't count on an enemy who doesn't care if a population dies to the last man, said William. He pushed himself away from the table and stood as if he too could no longer sit still. We're preparing to defend, and we're making it obvious enough that Pantathians may think we're done taking the fight across the ocean to them. He came to stand next to Callus. But we have one advantage they are unaware of. They don't know we know where their home is. Callus smiled a half-smile, lacking any humor. I don't think they care. He moved past William and stood opposite Nicholas, but addressed his remarks to Prince Patrick. Highness, I am not certain this mission will win us anything. Patrick asked, You think this wins us nothing? William said, Our presumption is they will not expect this, slipping in behind them and destroying their nest. Callus held up a finger like a schoolmaster. That's the word. Presumption. He turned to look at William. Everything we have ever seen from these creatures tells us they think like no others. They die as willingly as they kill. If we slaughter them to the last child when they're seizing the lifestone, they will not care. They believe they will return as demigods in the service of their lady, and death holds no fear for them. Turning back toward Patrick, he said, I will go, Patrick. I will go and kill for you, and if I must, die. But even if I get in and get back out, those left alive will come after us. I think we will never understand these creatures. Do you have a better idea? asked Nicholas. William put his hand on Callus's shoulder. Old friend, our only other choice is to wait. If they come anyway, what have we lost by undertaking this raid? Callus's voice was neutral. Just the lives of more good men, William said. It's what soldiers do, Captain. It doesn't mean I have to like it, he answered. <laughs>